Make Your Auntie Great Again is a title that came into my mind. I don't know where that came from. Maybe it was a play on something or other. All the money goes to charities that make humanity great, because they do wonderful things out there. I'm going to kick, kick it off right now and, uh, and let's get this going and get the first marathon in London going. Cheers, Good see luck, ya. Boys. <laughs> I have just finished in Portugal. There you can see the Portugal flag. Got the train, night train from Lisbon to Spain to Madrid. So I'm going to start running right from the station. Italy now, yeah. So there we go. Italy. Running through the streets. In Malta, in Valletta. Is it the sixth marathon? Nicosia in Cyprus, which has had its own problems of separation division. Oh. In Greece, in Athens. Uh, uh, Sofia, Bulgaria. Day eight. And here in Bucharest, in Romania, running in the snow. Uh, this is Hungary. Hungary is in Budapest. The February 11th and 11th marathon, you see it all ties up. And this is Slovakia, Bratislava in Slovakia. Off to Vienna. Each one I get up and I'm thinking. Zagreb, Croatia. Here we are. Slovenia, Ljubljana. Um, is this marathon 14? I think this is. When I've done this, it'll be the halfway point. Thank you for supporting. So, I'm in Prague, Czech Republic. Yes, I think it's the 16th of February. In Warsaw, Warsaw. So I'm in Vilnius, uh, which is in uh, Lithuania. In Latvia, we got about 10k to go, running. And Tallinn and Estonia. And I'm not running as you can see. I'm staggering. Finland, Helsinki. Uh, almost finished Marathon 20, thank you. I'm just finishing in Stockholm in Sweden. Here in Copenhagen, there we go, the UNICEF. This is the biggest, biggest warehouse, humanitarian warehouse in, in the world. Berlin. Germany, capital city, in Brussels, Belgium, Luxembourg, Marathon 25, yeah, 25th Marathon, it's 25 days, sounds insane, February 26, Marathon 26, out of 28, Netherlands, Amsterdam, there's canals, there's canals everywhere, canals, canals, so, this is it, 27th, 28th is tomorrow, and we've been running through Ireland to Dublin. So I'm in, I'm in France, I'm in Paris, let's, let's get the French flag in there, there we go. And uh, uh, 28th marathon, 28 days, I said I'd do it, and I have, it looks like I'm going to do it. Um, so that's nice, it's nice to stick to your guns. I'm almost at the end, Marathon 28. Yeah, I'm gonna do a gig now, do a stand-up gig. And look at this. Da da da. say, oh, you must love the running. I love the stopping. It's not a body thing, it's a mind thing. It's so good to be here. <laughs> Make 
Humanity Great Again is a title that came into my mind. I don't know where that came from. Maybe it was a play on something or other. All the money goes to charities that make humanity great because they do wonderful things out there. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are. 
We are on the 7th of January. I'm running my 7th marathon. Today we are celebrating Athens in Greece, as you can see behind. If you have any photographs of Athens in Greece, just self photographs, videos, selfies, do put them online and we can search for them. Hashtag is make humanity great again. And, uh, and also say that it's Athens, Athens, so that we know, because tomorrow we will be in, Sarah. Tomorrow we are in Sofia, Bulgaria. And then we're in Bucharest, Romania, and then Budapest, Hungary. So that's how it goes. So put your photos online, say which city it is out of those. And uh, can we put online where we're going to be going for the, the next? that would be good <laughs> so yes so there's a whole list we'll be putting up so we just need the name of the city with your photographs and then make humanity great again and we can find them and they can they can help me get through Athens I do remember being in Athens going up we ran up to the Parthenon you're not allowed to run in the Parthenon no. they were made, there are people with whistles it's interesting because they blow whistles and they don't particularly say anything so you're just running along and someone's just blowing a whistle all the time. And then you say, oh, don't like to run. So I, so I walked instead. And that was up there. Uh, and then came down again. So it's just gone 12 in London time. Uh, going to be talking to people today. Nick Catliff. Um, Nick runs Lion TV. And... Uh, he was the producer on getting uh, the, uh, the South African run videos all up and making that back in 2016 when I ran the 27 marathons in 27 days for Nelson Mandela. So we'll have a good chat that he joined us also back in February in Paris. Uh, one o'clock, no, uh, so yes, one o'clock London time. Uh, in an hour's time, we talked to Mick Perrin. Mick is my tour promoter. Uh, Mick Perrin Worldwide is his company, so co promotes in numbers of countries around the world. Uh, and so, Britain, Europe, and, and uh, yeah, all over, all over. So, we can talk about things about touring. Questions from Facebook, 1 30. Doing questions from Facebook. So, if you've got any questions, 1.30, go on Facebook, and we'll talk it. And I m must also say, there will be questions from YouTube at 4.30. You go and you have to search and get on my, t on my thing, don't you, Sarah? For YouTube. Yes, yes, I think the easiest way is on YouTube, search your name and then go to your channel. Yeah. That should be the easiest and, way. And then there's a, the button to make questions, yeah? Yeah, in the chat section on the side. The you chat can, uh, section. Do questions. So, as usual, I'm running on Zwift as well. Uh, we're running on John's route. John was the guy who came up with Zwift in the first place. Uh, so, we're doing that route. Another marathon, seven today. And I will be doing my seventh show, our show tonight at 7 p.m. London time. You can buy tickets for that. Everything on eddieizzard.com. You could donate there. Uh, and that's wonderful in, uh, in pounds or euros. Or American dollars. We've got up to three currencies now, and yeah, so we'll be chatting to people. So yes, Mick Perrin at one o'clock London time, two o'clock London time. Will Greenwood, two thirty. Helen, uh, Will Greenwood, a rugby ex rugby union player. Um, two th I'm reading off a list here. That's why I'm peering. Helen uh, Pankhurst, uh, Care International UK ambassador. 3 p.m. Alison Beaumont uh, is a fan who's calling in from Canada. Nice to chat to her in Canada. 3 p.m. Uh, that was at uh, 3 p.m. London time, 3.30. Uh, Hugh Brash, event director of, Lo of the London Marathon. There we go, we did a virtual marathon this year, or last year. And uh, 4 p.m. George uh, Zakharopoulos. Zakharopoulos, Greek comedian. George, sorry I destroyed your, your last name, but Zakharopoulos. One that's me reading to me and my dyslexia. 
and then more as I send questions from YouTube at 4.30 London time, 5 p.m. It's the Tim Cruz Drew Hour, uh, who's my, um, my physio. And we'll be talking with Tim to Claire Hudson Cooper, who's a triathlete and nurse coordinator at, at Julia's House of Charity. So there we go, lots of people to talk to today. And as I talk, um, uh, as I talk to people, it takes my mind out, out into the world, and back into Athens. Athens, do you remember Athens well, Sarah? Yeah, I remember, yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah. And, uh, oh, drop the phone, hang on. Things. But it was quite a thing. You, um, you came up onto the Acropolis. Didn't I you? did, yeah. And I do remember the lady with the whistle. She was very angry at yes. everyone. I think. At everyone. Lots of people. I think eating food wasn't allowed. Yeah. I mean, you can food, understand it because the Acropolis has been treated badly over the years. But uh, it was the first time I'd experienced the whistle control. So, you know, it's not. I understand why they were doing it. I just didn't know I wasn't allowed to run. And I was doing a good thing, trying to raise money to help make humanity great again. Um, I think kind of the key thing was is nobody knew what the whistle meant. Yeah, that was that, sort of the problem. It was like, like someone had done a foul on a pitch somewhere, but um, um, I suppose all the people who were there would be Greek speakers, maybe they speak a bit of English, but they wouldn't know if you were English or not. But uh, yeah, I think, I think she needed a, like a little sign with like someone running with a line through or something just to hold up, you know, because yes. I think that it, was, it wasn't that anyone was disregarding it, everyone was just a bit confused. I yeah. Think, so. And uh, anyway. But yeah, I remember it was beautiful Athens we went to the, um, it's like the Olympic Stadium. It's incredible. Olympic Stadium as well. Yeah, it was uh, yes. kind of amazing. I think there's some pictures of it uh, behind you that come up in a minute. But yeah, yes. beautiful. And there's a... Uh, there is a, a yeah, amphitheatre below the Parthenon that I want to play. Yes. Could you look that up That's at some on the point? List. Yeah. Could you look up the Parthenon on oh, Google I'll, Maps? I'll find the name. Shall I find you, the name of it? Yeah, if you, if you, if you Google okay. Maps uh, or search online on a map, on my online maps for the Parthenon, and then if you just look track below it, you'll see the name of it come up. Have a look. <sighs> Look on my phone. Clive Fenimore is with me again. Oh, can I get my? Actually, no, don't. Wait. The iPad. No, I'm gonna try it on this for a bit. Okay. Usually can't read things, but I'll try it. Oh, thanks to everyone on Zwift running with me today. Um, some people have run chunky things. I think Clive Fenimore ran three entire marathons. Oh, I can do a wave. Can I do a wave? No. A thumbs up. It's Kevin, that's nice. I'm going to try a thumbs up. That's not really happening. Well, I've just looked up. I think it's the Theatre of Dionysus. I think is the uh, amphitheatre near the um, Arsenal. Is it? It should be just below, just south of it. Yeah, it says the Ancient Tiered Performance Area. I think that is it. And it's called the Theatre of Dionysus? Yes, yes, yeah. I've got a yeah, picture here, yep. Theatre of Dionysus. Oh, crazy. Well, that is where I would like to play. Uh, Yeah, and because I've just start, started running, I want to go to the loo immediately. That's what happens. It tends to happen all the time. So, we can go nuts. So there's 60, wow, 60 Swifters nearby. Thank you for coming out. 
Uh, and we're running today. Oh, and I'm being sponsored, I should say, by Swift, and they've helped us with running machines, linking up with the app so that people can join. If you want to run with me on Swift, you have to you have to have a treadmill at the moment. You could, you might be able to do it with a foot pod, which is a stride. It measures your stride, so it might be able to work outdoors. I haven't checked on this. Sarah, could you check today? Yeah, I will. If it's possible, talk to Jim. Leech is wet. I don't know if anyone's tried it, maybe someone should try it because it could it could be working. And also we're down here at the Riverside Studios and people could donate. Uh, here, hi. Thanks, have you donated at the little button? You see there's a You've already done it, okay, thank you. Sorry, I'm being pushy on donations. But you have to be. You have to be, yes, thank you. There's a visitor. We have our windows open, but we have a barrier there, so no one can come in. We stay so COVID safe, me and Sarah are in the same support bubble, so that we don't do un, un COVID safe things. And, uh, yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Another donation goes in. Uh, so. So I'm running along, and uh, yes. So Clive Fillmore, Clive did three marathons in three days with me, and then he had to go back to work. But uh, Sarah's gonna do a shout out of, well if I come off the app, you can do a shout out of names and countries. Yes, I'll go into, uh, yeah. go in and do a you're, shout out. You're free to go in when you want. Uh, if you have been watching, uh, yeah, I've got the show this evening at 7 p.m. You can buy tickets, eddieizzard.com. You can donate at eddieizzard.com, please do. And uh, the charities, well, there's five charities we're championing, and, and there will be more charities as well, depending on how much money is donated in the 31 days of January. And uh, 31 days, 31 gigs, 31 marathons. And, they are walking with the wounded Care International, Fair Share, Covenant House, and Unite to Combat Neglected Tropical Diseases. A lot of tropical diseases neglected down the years, uh, including leprosy and elephantitis. Still out there. You just wouldn't. Be, I thought we were beyond that, but of course, they're difficult to get rid of. The only one we've successfully ever got rid of is smallpox. Uh, hi there. So, um, yeah, so that's that. And fair share uh, against pushing against food wastage. I managed to link up with, um, uh, particularly, I've been told farmers have to work, you know, obviously, work very hard and they make their food, but they can't exactly tell how much is going to be needed. So, what fair share, particularly, what are doing and want to do is to get in there at the point where uh, any farmers, uh, I think this is particularly in the UK, have excess uh, um, farm goods, uh, vegetables, they've made things, they've grown, and get them so they can get some money for that, otherwise it would go uh, back into, uh, it, just, it just disappears, it goes back into, um, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Compost is the word I'm looking for. Or I think there's a few other things that can happen. But uh, it's, good. it's good and decent food, but sometimes you have to make, you will, as a farmer, make more than is needed at that time. So that's what Fair Share does in getting food out. Young people, hi there, I'm just waving. Uh, someone has not seen me. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Marcus Rashford, doing great for getting food to young people from low-income families who need food. That's something that we desperately need at this time of COVID. Um, and, uh, well, i got to say, if, if government's not going to do it, then Fair Share and Marcus Rashford will do it. So, I don't know why that's so difficult for them, but I need to say that 
because it's also a day where I should just make sure the Covenant House helping young people where they have no place to stay in six countries around the world based in New York. So it's great to be partnership with them. We gave to them before back in February. Care International around the world also working in, Ye working in Yemen, the country of my birth, a West Asian country. I was born in the city of Aden, which the British refer to as Aden. But in fact, guys, it's Aden, it's their city. So we should just call it that. Just, it's a slight difference, but I don't know why. It's always been a problem. Uh, and uh, I'm sponsored by Mizuno as well, with all the running gear. Very helpfully, Graham was helping me. Uh, I was trying to get the right top so I could be warm because we have to have the windows open. It's obviously chilly, sunny, but chilly. And I'm trying to, if you're running and there's sort of natural wind air pressure in your face, and that's uh, anyway, that's that's good for making things go around. Anyway, I think I've mentioned all the charities there. Anyway, we'll talk about them again. So I'm going to talk to Nick Catmuff. Dave, David, tell me things. Ian, what's going on? Uh, we don't have Nick on Zoom yet. Uh, we're just getting him. We're linking him. All right. Can I do a little uh, Swift shout out? Yeah. Uh, so, I'll do a little name, name check uh, first. So we have, at the moment, Raul uh, Balmo. Oh, oh, hang on. Oh, I'm wait. running and it stopped. I'm running and it stopped. Okay. Uh, we have a technical hitch. I'll just come early up for a minute. I am running, but the but the Zwift has not got me running. Um, I need a control thing for yep, that, please. Now, okay. So, because this is tough, I'm going to. Hi, Eddie. It's Ian here. Because I was trying to move that from down here for you. Sorry. I was like, trying to remote control that from down here for you to see. Oh right. Well, you. I need to check. The, uh, hmm. Okay, what we're gonna do uh, is, I think I've got the distance here. I'm gonna run on to, we'll get to 3K, and then we're gonna stop and see if we can repair. It's obviously lost its pairing with, this hasn't happened before. It's saying I'm not moving at all. Um, so if you can get ready with the yep. run, measuring app just in case yep, remember that's the, around uh, there the little, uh, yeah um, anyone on Zwift uh, like for some reason my app is not reading the machine so I'm gonna run on till I hit three uh, kilometers and at that right nice round number I'm gonna stop and see if we can get it going again quickly because I don't like stopping um, but if you're getting Nick on the line, just tell Nick to, uh, okay, just... Ian's going to stop controlling the screen, okay? Just be aware. Okay. Ian, do you know what you can do on this? Because... I, I, you, I think we have to go... Ah. Okay. Do a search. We have to, so it's not that one. They can't see anything at the moment. Okay, hang on. Let's see if they all load up again. Okay, we're doing searching. It's finding certain things. It needs to find the woodway. Where have you gone? The woodway. Hmm. It's not seeing it. Thank you. Okay. Mm. Ian, you there? Talk to me, Ian. Hi, um, Wait, it's not, it's not coming up, is it? Uh, no, not yet. Uh, so I'll just chat to Sarah on comms about getting the sensor in the right place, and then we'll pair that up. What we could do is get to 3K. We could actually do it at 2.5. Well, is a bit messy. Uh, I do it at 2.5. Let's do it at 2.5. Okay. So I'm about to hit 2.5k. 
Okay. Okay, Richard, um, Richard, Richard, hi, no, we, we, we're doing searches, but it's not saying, it. I think we should switch, Sarah, before we do this, can you switch the whole thing off, just underneath there, you'll find the main switch. Uh, no, the, where the white thing is. Yeah. Yeah. Under there, keep going. With the you have to get your head down low to see it. It's not coming up as a oh, option. Is it? I'm turning on off. Okay. Okay, turning, turning off yeah. now. I'm not seeing it at the moment. Just yeah, I'm, for 10 yeah, seconds, I'm seeing okay. the others. I know. Yeah. Switch it back on, please. Turning, I'm just giving it a couple more seconds. Okay. Whoa. Okay. Switch back on. Okay. Okay, that is back on. Um, I'm going to do another search. Okay. Ah, it's back. Yeah, we sw switch it off, s switch it off, and switch it on again. That is the way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you ever see that happening, because I might be running and not know that it's unpaired, but um, okay. If I go back, what have I done? I've done 1.9. Okay. Um, what am I? I'm about, I went up to 2.5, only about 0.5k out. Okay, let's start this again. Um, so, could you in my handbag? There's um, the the uh, AirPods. Can you get the, the thing? <laughs> okay, I'm back running and I'm moving. Okay, it's a rough game. All right, thank you. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, uh, bye. Yeah. Okay, so we have lost. Um, I've done 0.5 k extra. I don't like the look of them, so I might have to just run an extra 0.5k, but if, if I feel horrible later on, then I'll not do it, but... What a sense. Well, I could actually change... Uh, that would look messy, too. Anyway, we'll see what we're like when we get... <laughs> so we're back in the... I don't know why that happened. Um, sent a message out. Are you in the... You can do a show. Let's talk to Nick. Is Nick there? Ian or David? Uh, we're getting them online now. Okay. No problem. I'm out of the app, Eddie. Okay. Sorry, everyone. Full stop. I became untethered to my Zwift app. We'll stop. Back running now. Eddie. Hi Eddie, put me through to Nick. Oh, I'm too. Okay. Hi Nick. <laughs> Hi. How are you? Hey Eddie. I'm back. Can you. you can see me. You were talking very slowly, and that sounded oh. very weird. We thought. There you are. Oh yeah, we're there. We are connected. Very good. Can, we're there. Yeah. Can you, you hear me? You're going on my pace. How fast are you going? Uh, seven point yeah, five. Yeah, yeah. Bit, bit hit and miss, but I can basically. Yeah, basically, I'm doing seven point five kilometers of hour per hour kph, which, if you remember, that was the speed that I ran the double marathon yeah. on the last day. That was what I was always aiming for but I started at that speed on yeah. this one. Good. And you remember the first one I did, I did say to everyone, Nick Catliff, um, co-founder of Lion TV and producer of the documentary um, when we did it in 2016, 
and 2012. And because the beautiful thing was failing in 2012 and coming back and succeeding in 2016. I don't know if you have you thought about that, but I found that a wonderful test of our resilience to get back there and get it done. Yeah, I, absolutely. To be honest, Eddie, your resilience, not mine, because I, I, 2012 was so tough, wasn't it? I mean, so tough for you yeah. because you got so ill. And when you very boldly, you did, you boldly stood by the statue and said, I will be back. And I thought, well, I hope you will, but I'm not sure it's a good idea. But um, you were, and it was a good idea. It was fun. I mean, you just made, it made 2016 just so much better, didn't it? Because as you say, you, you, you'd failed once and then you came back and you succeeded. Uh, yes, we did, and we had a slightly different crew, or, or quite, a, quite a lot of a different crew. Um, yeah. But because that just happened, you know, you had to hire. We had hired different people, a lot of South African locals, which was great. But I do remember we met up with one of our camera operators uh, in Cape Town. I don't know if you remember. Do you remember that, Sarah? Uh, one of the co camera operators from the first time who'd been with yes, us. Yes, that's right. Yes, yes. Do you remember his name? Is it Chris or Christoph or? Oh, I'm um, Christoph. Yeah. And it's something. Yeah. Anyway, a nice guy, but I think he filmed that final speech where we stood by the car. I yeah. seem to remember standing by a car and saying, "This is it. We can't do it." And basically, uh, if people listening around the world, I got rhabdomyolysis. I was taking just a drug from from my uh, GP for cholesterol, not a performance enhancing, just a cholesterol, and uh, and. So uh, I was taking this, but the side effect was you get rhabdomyolysis where the, uh, I think the muscles go into the bloodstream and it clogs up the kidneys, and then you get kidney failure, and then you die. So, so that was 2016, but we did a pretty good documentary off it, didn't we? We talked to some interesting people in 2012. Nick? Yeah. Yeah. I think what was the, what, the 2012 one was extraordinary because you got so ill. But then what was amazing is, if you remember, in 2016, you, you seemed to get ill again in about the same place, didn't yes. you? About not very many days in. Do you remember? How, so, and I remember that awful night. And you, we carted, you were really grumpy about it, if I may remember. Yes. Uh, and you didn't want to go. And, uh, and the medical guys said, no, you've got to go to the hospital. And we carted you off to the hospital in Port Elizabeth, I think it was, wasn't it? It was, uh, it was uh, it, L L East London. East London. East London. Yeah. Right, it's East London. That, Which was a big and I must, yeah. But what was amazing is I remember we took you there and you were not happy. And, uh, and they <laughs> pumped you full of, of just liquid, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, you were so dehydrated. Yes, I, but, I have a natural affinity to be underhydrated. I just talked to Dr. Gary, you know Dr. Gary, our friend, sports doctor. And uh, he's just told me I'm somewhat underhydrated at the moment. So there you go, wherever I am, I'm underhydrated. God, but do you remember what happened? It was the next day that was amazing, because I can remember thinking, oh, this is, this is just not, you, this, you, you're gonna get ill and you're gonna die. And then the next day, we were staying at that weird hobbity place, weren't we, up in the mountains? Oh, uh, Hogsback, Hogsback. Hogsback, that's a Hogsback. Yeah. And I remember you came back and you were under strict orders that you couldn't carry on, but only if you walked. Yes. And it was just hilarious. Yeah. Well, I, I, I've run through this in my mind a few times, so I'm going to tell you the exact way it went. I did four, just like in the first one. In 2012, I did four and stopped in, in Queenstown. I, and in 2016, I did four and stopped in Queenstown. Uh, and in 2012, it was just that game over. And we had to fly to Cape Town to talk to specialist sports doctors. In 2016, day five was off. Then we talked to... Dr. Gary on the phone and he said you could walk the next day. That was day six and, and two-thirds of the way through day six I was carted off to East London. So that was in the middle of the on the sixth day in the middle of the fifth marathon And then by the time I got to Hogsback, I was saying I can't go around saying I've done Five and two-thirds marathons. I can't punch the sky. So I got obsessed with the numbers and I said in Hogsback, let's get up at dawn and if you look at the video, you've got me going, I'm going, I'm going now, is everyone ready? Because I'm off. And I just ran off into the, with a little sliver of light and we got it done. That's the very slow motion finish of me going through at, at lunchtime. We had a lunch and then we went to Somerset East. Do you remember that? Somerset East and we did that running up in, the, in the, a trail up on the hills. And it was beautiful. We did the Invictus, the Invictus poem. And that bit, Steve did that. It's just... 
If you go to eddieizzard.com and uh, go into the marathon sections, you can see the South African marathons there. And uh, yeah, it was, that was an interesting time, wasn't it? Nick. It was, and it was so interesting. Being, being in those towns, Somerset East, I think, I mean, it's a lovely little town, but until the end of apartheid, that had been a, a sunset town, hadn't it? There was a cur curfew. And if, you, and if you were black or mixed race, you couldn't go out at night. And it's just an extraordinary transformation of that country, wasn't it? Yes. Yes, and we, and we hope we put together Team 27. In the end, we called ourselves Team 27. And hopefully Nelson Mandela would have liked what we did. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think so. Yeah. And also, just the sheer beauty of that, when we were in the Eastern Cape, those just gorgeous little towns. And I, I, I think you're right. I remember when you did the extra half marathon, um, you, we did the, we, we, you know, we edited, well, you, you said we edited it to the Invictus poem. Yep, yep. And it was, it was just so beautiful, wasn't it? Running along that track in the sunset. Yep. And, uh, and I must admit, the first time I thought that we were back on track and you were going to be okay. Because I mean, you know, in retrospect, it all worked out fine, but it was, it was really scary. And, uh, and you're so pig headed. We were all quite worried that you'd insist on keeping <laughs> going until, until you keeled over. Well, um, there is an interesting thing that I, uh, the thing I was doing on day six when I was staggering around and Tim, yeah. and what was the name, uh, Tim McPhysio, yeah, what's the name of our, our, our uh, medic who was with us? Oh, Tony. Tony, yes, yeah, Tony. Tony, Tim and Sarah said, off you go, referee blew the whistle, but I was staggering and I have seen myself do that in other marathons. And I think that's me hitting the psychological thing, which some people call the wall, but I think it's my, my brain going, I don't want to play this game anymore. But my, somewhere inside me, I'm saying, screw that, I'm carrying on. And so I just look like this, because I did, I'll tell you why, because I was running seven marathons in seven days for seven brothers in a, on the South Downs Way in Eng England. And I was going along, getting a bit tired, my marathon three, marathon four, and I ran past some people and then I was walking and they caught me up and they said, we saw you kind of staggering back there. I said, yeah, I'm just not really into it at the moment. And then we were going up a slight hill and me and one other guy, if he's ever listening to this, you'll know who he was. He, I, I just turned to him like, like a kid, like a five-year-old. He was about in his 60s, eh? late 50s, early 60s, just a little bit older than me perhaps. And I said, I'll race you to the top. So, Having been staggering about, you know, 20 minutes before, 30 minutes doing kind of this thing, we sprinted up the hill. And I thought, well, where did that come from? And it's motivation. My brain had no motivation and, uh, and did not want to play the game anymore. I was bored of the game. And then the guy was there like, okay, I'm going to run like a kid. So I think that's what was happening. I could be wrong. And it, I'm fine. They took me out. And uh, do you remember the doctor in the... East London, very cool black doctor, South African doctor, and he had a sports Range Rover, and he said I was going to go home, but I'm going to stick around and see how this works. Do you remember him? Yeah, they, and they were just great, weren't they? The way that they kind of all rallied around to get you, to get you, to get you through it, I suppose. Um, yeah, that was a long night in East London. Now I tell you, you know, because we were all sitting there thinking the doctor was going to come out and say, "Stop, you all got to go home." Yeah. Were you in the room with us then, with the matron? I, 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 I went into the room and then I left you to it. When you got, when right. you got onto the drip, I left you to it. Because yeah. we, we had a fun yeah. matron there who, who was very much kind of like Hattie Jakes. In, and, and she's very Afrikaans. Come on, sit up, sit up, put this on, take this off. So they've already done my thing. Oh, all right, forget it. And, then, and she just threw a towel in my face at one point, but not in a negative way, but in kind of, all right, we don't need to do that. But she was great and he was great. And it was nice to see a, a young, he was a nephrologist, he was an expert in kidneys. I didn't even know the word existed. And I was texting to Dr. Gary, who I've known since I was 13, and he was sending me texts. He says, look, these are the details about and one of my kidneys had a cyst on it, which I thought was bad, but apparently isn't bad. It isn't as bad, it, you know, it's not a big problem. He, he went, the doctor went, oh no, that's not a problem. And uh, well, we got it done in the end, we got it done. Yeah. yeah, and we were sending you. We were sending bloods, the blood results back to Gary, weren't we, overnight and things yes. like that. For, yeah. Bloods yeah. and pee tests and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And then it calmed down, didn't it? And uh, yeah. we had some weird. 
and then to Mikey's Fontaine. Do you remember Mikey's Fontaine? Very old worldy South African. Oh yeah. 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 It's called Mikey's Fontaine, yeah. and it had the blue train to it. I think it was a blue train. One of these. It's a sightseeing train from old people who've got a bit of money. A bit like the Orient Express of South Africa that turned up. That was there when we were there. And uh, and then Cape Town was. By the time we got to Cape Town, we we're in a pretty good shape, weren't we? We were. And do you remember? Do you remember who phoned you from Cape Town? Yes. You, you did a Skype. Tim Peake, wasn't it? That was surreal. That was very odd. Tim Peake. Yeah, because he, he was up. He was up on the um, International Space Station. What yeah. was he called? Um, in, International Space Station. International Space Station. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and suddenly we had. That. Yeah, we had a yeah. conversation, yeah. and he called Sarah. That Sarah's number was the link. I think Sarah was in the loo and she realised she had a, mi a missed call from out of space. <laughs> yes, he, he very kindly called back, which uh, was very nice of him. We should bring, <laughs> we should bring Sarah up. Um, so Dave, up on the sky, can we get uh, Sarah into the screen? Oh, there we go. There's Sarah. Sarah, good to see you. Hey Nick, how are you doing? Yes. I'm reminiscing, fine. reminiscing. Last time I saw you, Sarah, was, I think was staggering back in Paris, wasn't it? But Yes, it was, yeah, the 28th of uh, February. February. Yeah, last yeah. year, there we go. And that was yeah. a good day, wasn't it? That wasn't too yeah. bad, wasn't too cold. And you were there, yeah. and Kevin yeah. Carhill, right. who's, our, who's our, our head person on our campaign, uh, probably our campaign manager, I should say. And I think Chris Wilson was there. There's a number of people joined, and, and then there was the gig at the end of the day and the meal afterwards. Oh, it was fantastic, that. It was just such a treat. I remember when I heard you were doing it, I thought I had to, do, I had to come and do one of them. And obviously, yeah. if you have a trip anywhere in Europe, you're probably going to go for Paris, aren't you? It's um, just, I do love Paris. And uh, and did you like that boat? It's called La Nouvelle Seine. Oh, beautiful. Just yeah. such lovely, it was, the whole evening was just great. It was yeah. great. Yeah, it was indeed. a wonderful thing. And, and you, if people see the, the, the video that introduces what I'm doing, it's a sort of two minute video. And at the end, it shows me running up. And I didn't know the audience were there. They gave me a round of applause. They just sort of got into a big of a pile. Yeah. And then I went backstage and I was on stage within about half an hour. And yeah. just like I'm doing now, it was a test. And then afterwards, you have to have a meal. Go to La Nouvelle Seine, do look it up. People from around the world, when you get to Paris, it's on the River Seine, right by Notre Dame. And it's got a theater downstairs, but a restaurant upstairs. And did you like that restaurant? It's a great restaurant. It's fantastic. The whole evening was such, it was such a blast. It really was. And I think, you know, go to, as you say, doing the run and then you get there and there was that enthusiastic crowd of people. And uh, I, I mean, those gigs, I mean, I don't know, you must miss that so much because, you know, you, you get that instant feedback from an audience. It is so important, important to what you do, isn't it? It is true, but I'm getting used to doing it with, without an audience. Yeah. I'm not sure yeah. if I'm doing it right, but as you'll probably know, I'm doing a gig to a virtual gig at 7 yeah. p.m. every evening and it's just it just goes out there so I have to I've done so many gigs that hopefully my brain can tabulate if that's a good bit or not a good bit it, nice improvisation nice bit you know, so they're not they, they haven't been brilliant yet uh, my fifth gig was pretty good we think the yeah. best one so far so I'm just going to yeah. improve <sighs> Well, Eddie, I, 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 I'm going to go to a few of the gigs and I can give you some feedback on them. Okay. Do you get little feedback at all? You don't get any audience response at all. You're totally on your own. Is that right? Sometimes I make Sarah laugh, who's off stage to my left, on our side of the barrier. And then there is Zach and Chris, and sometimes yeah. Ian, they're in their own COVID safe bubble. And I sometimes make them laugh. Last night, I didn't hardly make anyone laugh. And I, oh God. I thought something was wrong. I think Ian's a big laugh. Ian, are you a big laugh? So anyway, sometimes I get... I, I, I do enjoy a good chuckle. Yeah, I do get a... Uh, I hear a noise, and if I do that, I immediately hone in. Ah, yes, we're working. But if I get silence, I just have to go back into my own brain and go, OK, I think this is good, not so good. And, I, and sometimes I'm almost falling asleep. It's really tricky because I'm so tired. Oh. And how are, you, how are you feeling? Why, why do you not get injured, Eddie? I just, you, know, you, you just don't, do you? I mean, well, I've done so many... I've filmed you marathons I've run with you a lot I get aches and pains but you just don't seem to do that well or you would just be very brave no Nick this is my thing um, I do have an orthotic in my right shoe from right. Paul Haradine Portsmouth podiatrist um, anyone go and see him because he's very good and he makes them there on, on the in his 
office his back office and my right foot pronates out and that can cause problems but he put something in behind the heel that makes it better so orthotics and i've had them before they help um also i'm not going that fast people who go very fast they really uh yeah. they sort of destroy or they or they wear down their body much easier so my my speed which is endless but not that fast uh is better for the body and it seems that the body also builds up resilience because as you all know we were hunter gatherers before these bodies are designed to hunt and gather and we don't do that so i have a theory that like a car if you if you don't use a car it seizes up and stops working if you don't live in a house it will get wet rot dry rot and start falling in if you don't use these bodies like we did when we were kids or to the equivalent of that um, then i think the bodies start to break down i find the more i use the body the less illnesses i get that's what i find yeah. the more you push it the more you get back and if you and if you try to get back into it in your 30s 40s 50s you will go oh aches and pains and then you immediately back off and you've got to go through those aches and pains because on the other side there are less aches and pains that's the weird thing that all, that all makes sense but oh my god the, the number of steps you're taking is extraordinary i know <laughs> yes we should measure the number of steps because that would scare me but, I'm uh, sure so. Actually, and so what are, you, what are you seeing on your Zwift right now? You, which city are you seeing? Um, well, it's, I'm in Watopia, which is a virtual oh, city. Because okay. eventually in the future, I'm sure Zwift is a young company. They will, Zwift, they will, they will, they've got a, um, uh, uh, there's, a there's a Paris, there's a New York. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, but the, the choice is, because I think there's so much bandwidth that goes into set them up you only have three choices a day with Tokyo yeah. and two other virtual towns or cities so that's what I see I can see the people around me who are from all over the world I can see the, their flags of choice they can choose flags of their birth or flags of the country they're in or whatever they want or no flag and I know I'm in Athens so I'm mentally back in Greece in Athens because I got photos of Athens happening behind me here and uh, we've got the Marathon 7 written up there. So, uh, but on my image screen, I don't know, you can't see it, and it's, it sometimes comes up. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's, I've got a mountain ahead of me. Ian, can we flip the Swift image on so that, so that yeah. they can see it? Yeah. Oh, can you see that? Yeah. So that's, yeah. What I'm, that's what I'm running into. And I've got the blue top and the pink shorts and the ponytail. She's my avatar. And, uh, okay. and then people come up and I, it's a little difficult to, to work out exactly who people are sometimes, but down the right hand side, you've got their names and there's a companion app, a, a different app and you can, you can look it up. How, how many people are near me at the moment, Sarah? Are you, or are you in the thing? Am I in the thing? Sarah? Oh, are you, sorry. Are you on a just, just checking in with you, yes. Can we bring... Can we bring Sarah back on the screen? Thank you. If you go in the if you go in the app, you can see how many. Well, shall I do it? Maybe. I'll just see how many people this is. It looks like at least ten, but sometimes it's it's twenty or thirty. Uh, okay. Hang on. So I'm being a bit boring here because it's like a television show. In a television show, you shouldn't get your camera out and look things up. But, uh, oh, it's not coming up. Why is that? Come on, you think. Oh, well, there's a bunch of people, but I can send messages to them. And, and, oh, yeah, and, I, I, I do it a lot. I use the bike app a lot, the, the, um, the, the Zwift bike app. Oh, right, well, you know uh, the principle, yeah. I mean, just literally last night, I was, I was thinking of you, because I was cycling around Paris with a bunch of Italians, very oh. odd. But, but it, was, it just reminded me so much of the marathon we did last year. Um, yes, indeed. Because they do this weird thing, don't they? That it's Paris, but it's not quite right. Yeah. They change the round, but it's still yeah. So, I mean, I, I do that classic middle-aged man thing of you know when the weather's not nice, I go to my garage and cycle around Paris or France or New York. Yes, exactly. Kind of it works. Yeah, it's good, and, and it's probably going to get better and better. And also, if you go to the Watopia site, you could sometimes run through the insides of a volcano. 
which, which, is, which is crazy, or under a, a tunnel under the water in which they put it, made it out of glass so you can see all the fish swimming around, which is, which is fun. And does, uh, does, your, does your app give you, in, does, it, does, does your treadmill go up and down or is it just flat? Uh, it can go up and down. That, yeah. that, I don't know if that registers on here, but it, yeah. it, that's just making it hard for myself in a way. But I, but I, have, been, I have been told by Physio Tim, you remember Tim, our physio, Tim Cruz Drew. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah. Yes, I do. And if I take it up to 0.5 of an incline, it starts to work slightly different muscles. So your muscle get a slight rest. I've also found yeah. if I speed up, I get the muscles, it changes which muscles it's using. So you get a slight rest. So that's an unusual thing. We've got 62 Zwifters running nearby. So that's good. And some of them have done, ooh, some of them have done way more than me. Some have done less, but yeah, that's nice. And, then, and what's weird is, I mean, I, I, on the bike thing, I'll do, I'll do somewhere, I'll join a ride, which is into all Germans, you know, and yeah. there'll be 200 of them. It's just, it's a sort of weird sort of, I mean, it is, it's a, it is a virtual world, isn't it? All these little avatars peddling around um, virtual planes as it's part their garages. Yes, yes, indeed. Garages and wherever. And uh, we're here at Riverside Studios. Where are we? And people can come to the window and they can wave through the window and they can donate a little box outside, which is nice. But, uh, Thank you. Oh, well, I'm in Hammersmith next week. I'll, I'll, I'll pop by and wave through the window. Yeah, if you just go to the riverside, it's between. Yeah. Riverside Studios and the river, and you'll see a window that's open, and we can, we got, we can even talk to you through, it, or shout at you through. It. So that's that's kind of fun. But the talking, I find the talking, which I might have said, you know, because we were in Paris last year, last yeah. February, uh, I could chat to all you guys, and that just really helped me. And then yeah. in the last hour, I had a lot of friends turn up from Paris. And run with me. I don't know if you were there at that point or when. Oh, right. That was great. Yeah. I mean, that was hilarious. But also, the last hour, and they were all fresh, and they were all runners, weren't they? Yeah. But they hadn't been running, and so it was kind of agony uh, because we all suddenly started going a lot faster. I don't know if you noticed, but it, we upped the pace quite a lot. Well, I think no, I think they let me control. It. I might have changed it because I might have been going a bit slow. That would have come from me because like, they wouldn't have pushed me, or I wouldn't have let them. But uh, yeah. it was. I think I felt like maybe I had a, a bit more energy because there were a lot of fr French friends around. And, uh, and we went to that park to run in. And the guy yeah, said, was, no, oh, so they filmed me. So they filmed me. I said, please. So we ran around just, the park. There was just a lot more energy. As soon as you got, you're right, as soon as you get new people coming in, they were all excited and it was, yeah. it was great. It was, it was a lovely way to end it. Well, I found this thing, which I say to anyone watching us, um, if you are running or cycling, particularly, if you have an earphone, even if you've got no one with you, you can actually call a friend and have a chat with a friend, and that, that chat will take you out of the tiredness of your legs if you're doing a long run or a long ride, bike ride. So that's, that's the technique. That's why having your good cell phone and everyone I talk to today, that helps me get, you know, because we've, oh, we've, we've been talking about half an hour, over half an hour now, so, wow, we've done a whole load of kilometers. And that's, that's my trick, my technique. <sighs> and I think I remember, Nick, do you remember the last day in Pretoria when we were yeah. looping before we uh, headed to the, uh, the finish line? And I think there was, was it BBC News that, uh, that came in? And I think that you ended up having to put the earpiece in yourself and have the uh, microphone, the boom mic, and you were like relaying questions to Eddie to relay questions back. I, I, I distinctly remember that at the I, end of that. I think Nick was actually interviewing yeah. me. He was doing yeah. He was doing yeah. I, I, I was. Uh, things were getting. It was at that point. I think you were. It was. It was getting pretty tough. But we were. We were. We were broadcasting, weren't we? I think Chris yeah. was doing the running it. We were broadcasting live to Sport Relief. Yeah. And uh, it was great. I mean, it worked. You, you were, I think, by that stage in quite a lot of pain. You were yeah. been going a very long time. Well, we should, yeah. I'm just going to hold you there. I want you to carry I mean, on. I think that's the... Nick, yeah. before you say anything, I just want to tell everyone who's listening what hap had happened. If you'd yeah. heard us talking about the South African marathons yeah. back in 2016 before, I got up to, I was supposed to do 27 and 27 days, and I had dropped a marathon. So I decided 
rather forcefully. I think I should do a double marathon on the last day. I felt it could encourage people to give more, and it was a bit crazy, but it was a calculated risk. I just thought that's a better way of doing it rather than cut it up into little bits. So we went for it, and that was running for 84 kilometers. Is uh, around 84 is about the the uh, two marathons, uh, about 56 miles, something like that, and. Um, it had been 11 hours we'd run it. So after 10 hours, we got to Pretoria and we had to speed up. That was the weird thing, speeding up. So I was moaning a lot, if you remember. I do. And I asked you if we could extend the time. You remember? The cutoff was quarter past three South African time. And I said, can we extend? Surely we can. And you said, no. Was, was that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And uh, things were getting a little tense, to be honest, weren't they? Yeah. Um, uh, to say the least. But yeah, we had to hit that, we had a hard out. Yeah. We had to hit the broadcast. And um, it was it was extraordinary that I think, you know, you, you'd always quite fancy doing a double marathon at the end, to be honest, I think, uh, because it was epic. And uh, and as events transpired, that's what you had to do. Yeah. And so you knew the clock was genuinely ticking because the beauty of the, a lot of the marathons is you'd set off, um, what you know, as you always said, you know, if it took you half an hour longer, so what? But suddenly you were under this real pressure. So it was tense, it was difficult, and we were just trying to time it. And you were trying to speed up. And by that stage, that was really difficult, wasn't it? And we were running through the back streets of Pretoria, and I was looking at my watch, and everyone was looking at their watch, and you were pounding along. It was, it was getting quite tense. We, we had this fun little thing that we, because we were supposed to meet up, as you remember, with the security team who were going to get us through a very difficult carjacking hotspot outside Pretoria and uh, Rick Matthews our, our field producer he said they're not here and I was like well, what do we do can we just run it and he said no that's too dangerous and so we had to stop the clock get in the van and go to Pretoria and restart it which might seem like a, a nice thing to do but once you've run for 10 hours stopping the clock is murder to restart your body it's just not it's not good and then we just ran around up at the Union buildings, trying to find a place, and then we found a park, which we did circuits on a park. And, yeah. and that was the thing. And somebody measured the distance from the edge of the park to the Union buildings and to the thing. Once we had that, I knew how far I had to run before I did the end bit. Yeah, we, we scouted ahead. I think we, yeah, we put the trip on the van and figured it out and then calculated it back. But at the point where we had to say, okay, go. And that was the end. Route yeah. to the to the statue, yeah. Mandela. Yeah. Yeah. So. But then, but then, do you remember what happened? We were running down that street, and we had to go across the park. Yeah. And do you remember the one flaw in the plan was that the park keeper had closed and shut the gates. Well, it had. Well, it, it wasn't even quite that. It's that they had a fence. If you come into the Union Buildings in Pretoria, and you can go onto Google Maps and look it up, and you come in from the bottom, and it is a park, but they have a fence that has no gate. The, uh, once you've got in there, it goes all the way along. The gate is on the left is, rather than on right. the center. That was what it was. I don't think they locked it. They just hadn't put it in the center. So we go, where's the bloody gate? And you had to quite, quite a long up. I kept saying to you, I remember, is this, do I go in here? And you go, no, a bit long. Do I go in here? I was kind of pleading, <laughs> moaning, and crying, and all this kind of stuff. Let it stop, let it stop. And then we got in, had to go around. Then I fell over. Then I got right. up. Oh, and then I got it done. Oh, God. But, then what was, but what was amazing, and from a TV producer's point of view, I mean, it was luck, but God, it looked good, didn't it? That, you know, 27 marathons in, you ended up at, at, at the Mandela statue, exactly the moment we needed you to be there. So well, it, wasn't like, it, wasn't it was not luck. It wasn't luck. It wasn't luck. luck. That, that was... Thought we had the end, didn't we? Sorry? Well, I thought we went live right at the end of the news. No, well, what they had was they had a two-hour window. You see, I've committed all this uh, to memory. So they had from 1.15 South Africa time to 3.15, and we had to get on somewhere in that time. Yeah, and in yeah. the end, we were going to go... I was trying to do a Comrades marathon, but I thought if I do the two marathons, then I'll do my extra 6K later. That's fine. And I had to get there before quarter past three South Africa time, and we got there yeah. at... Not 3.15, but 3.13. I think it was two minutes before. Either 3.12 or 3.13. That was how close it was. Yeah. And we got there. And that was, that was, 
That was grit. That was grinding it out. I had to grind it out because I had to speed up in the last hour, and that was just miserable. But I had five minutes of elation. We had about 30k to go. I went 30k to go. I think I'm going to do this. And I went, oh god, this goes on. This goes on, and I lost it again. So, but it was beautiful afterwards, wasn't it? We got that, had a bottle of champagne, which went all yeah. over my face. Talked to endless amounts of of news programs. I had obviously no one to talk to on a Sunday back in the UK. And they kept asking me more and more questions. And I had to say, I'm not, I'm not gonna answer any more questions. And then we had to do the extra 6K. Do you remember we did that? You I, yeah, I asked that was, that was a killer. Because I, I, I was rather hoping you'd forgotten about that, to be honest, because we were all shattered. And you went, no, no, no. I mean, you are, let's face it, you are big headed. He said, no, I'm doing this 6K, so I'm going to do it. And uh, if you remember, we said, okay, let's do it, but we're not taking a crew. We're just going to do it because we're going to do it. Yeah. And we ran around, we ran around, ran out of park in the dark. Yeah. Um, which actually was wonderful. It was wonderful because it was a, there was a small group. Who was that wonderful guy we had on production? The young guy who really could run. Uh, who? Oh, uh, Neville? Yeah, it was Neville. 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 Yeah. No, it was him and you and a few other people. And then the security guards had finally caught up with this by then so we all felt quite safe well it was it was Pete, peter and his guys and peter yeah. had all these guys um with the special cars with the light the white lights on who stopped all the, as we ran towards the union buildings they turned up and stopped all traffic yeah. and let me just career down the road and then yeah. they came out at night they were on every corner doing protection so that was very nice of them and felt very safe uh i, I you know i know security is necessary but I, I, I did find it wonderful running in Eastern Cape and saying Molo to all the people yeah. that we ran with. And uh, so it was such a joke because we ran from where Nelson Mandela was born up to where he was made president and trying to make the marathons. And Robin Island, we ran on Robin Island, didn't we? Oh, that was, Robin Island was just amazing, wasn't it? Because <laughs> we were going over there and it was, it's such a sort of emotionally loaded place. Yeah. And do you remember there was that sea mist blowing in? Yes. And you, round and round oh what extraordinary place extraordinary it was amazing they allowed me to go into his cell and they closed yeah. the door they locked the door i wanted it locked i wanted to feel in a ridiculously small amount of time he was 18 years in that cell uh, only allowed out to break rocks or later on i think they were they were slightly easier on him but yeah that was that was a thing and then we had this, this wonder, wonderful video, you might remember this video with me and Dr. Gary and Tim, Physio Tim, discussing whether a, two, a double marathon was a good idea or not. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, I thought I could do it, but I really didn't know if I could do it. But I, I did think it would make people give. And I think landing, I don't know what you think on this, but I think I was finishing a double marathon on screen for people in the UK to see who were the main people who were donating. I think that probably made an extra half a million go in, I think. It certainly drove it, didn't it? Because it, it gave it that added story. And I think with a big, long, I mean, that's basically doing 27 marathons is an extraordinary thing to do. But ending like that with that big challenge, yeah, it gave it a real cliffhanger, didn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah, it, was, it was different. Yeah. But I think across the whole thing, as you, right, there was such variety, because as you say, when you started off in was Makekeswady, right in the Eastern Cape, you know, that was one thing, and you went to all these different landscapes. And I've got some wonderful photographs of just massive desert landscapes with mountains behind, and it's a little tiny eddy running along, running along. <laughs> I think that variety was about as well. It was you, beautiful. You know. Mountain Zebra National Park, that was beautiful, wasn't yeah. it? That was yeah. a crazy day. And uh, That and, was a great, yeah. Yeah, that was yeah. a beautiful we, day. We were working. Didn't we? Yes. Oh, that was the day that was incredible downpour. You were running along, and suddenly there was this. Wasn't there Hailton's? It was a real downpour in the middle of this arid desert. It, it was. was a, I think it was a thunder and lightning storm. I think. And it was. Uh, it was. And we had one trans guy from South Africa had driven around for hours to try and find me and say hello, and shake hands. Yeah. In the middle of the thing, that was kind of beautiful. And. Uh, and wait. Emerged out of the bush, didn't he? It? it was like, yeah. where the hell did he come from? Yeah. yeah. Great big guy. Yeah. Driving around the park, and uh, that was beautiful. And Hogsback was beautiful. And uh, yeah. so many things. I'm not sure if it was Polesmore 
the name of the prison that Nelson Mandela was released from, if you remember that one, I did yeah. a sprint finish, yeah. and that felt very good yeah. about Marathon 23, and then they took us to the, where Nelson Mandela was under house arrest, but not quite in prison, and, and the, I think, final couple of years of his imprisonment, uh, they took us to that place where it used to be a farm, and then we saw the house, and I sat in the chair, uh, you know, just one of the chairs in the, in the, in the lounge. That was interesting to see that place, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was. And well, then we go, did we, we never went up Table Mountain, did we? We wrecked it, but I think it was too foggy, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, so the plan was I was going to do one circuit of Robin Island, get in the boat, come back, stop the clock, and then run up the top of Table Mountain. It would have been beautiful. That would be, that'd be one hell of a, yeah. a marathon to do. But it wasn't, uh, it was too foggy, too dangerous, and you wouldn't see anything. Yeah. So. I did an urban marathon, uh, an urban half marathon, through oh, okay. Cape Town with cameras strapped to me to see what that looked like, uh, holding cameras. So that was, that's what we did that day. Uh, well, yeah, look, that, that Nick, great. I'm going to have to uh, love you and leave you because I'm moving. I'm going to talk to uh, someone else right now, okay. talk to Mick Perrin. But um, one thing I'll leave it, do you remember the last meal we had on the last day, on the 28th day? We sat down, we had a big yeah. meal for everyone, lunchtime. A big meal. That was wonderful, yeah. wasn't it? That was that was the last time we saw... It was, it was, that whole group together, and it was a fantastic diverse group, wasn't it? Because yeah. you're absolutely right, as you're saying, uh, we had, you know, we had, every, it's a rainbow nation, and we had them all there on, on that production. It we just, did. That, that was just absolutely lovely, wasn't it? It right. was a beautiful thing. Oh, is there a picture? There's a picture of me behind me coming up, which is a... It's me at the yeah. statue of Nelson Mandela. You might not be able to see it, but I think that just jumped in there. But uh, yeah, that was one of that last meal because, as you know, each day we ran, but we could never really celebrate. Wow, we've done a marathon. Wow, we've done five marathons because we were on to the next one. But that last day, we could celebrate it all. And everyone had signed, signed a flag that said Team 27. And, uh, and then we all went our separate ways. So just such a wonderful... That's TV. You all get together, and then boom, you've all separated. Yeah, yeah. it's extraordinary, isn't it? That is TV and that's film. Both of those yeah. do that. Very tight, very working together. We just get to know each other well, and boom. But Yvonne, remember Yvonne yeah. who, who drove the van? She now lives in Ireland, I think. She phoned me from an island number. So, really? Oh, yeah. That's great. Yeah, she's just, just moved over. Yeah. yeah. Probably we, like the last, yeah, very recently. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for coming okay. on. Great. Look, it's a pleasure. I think, I think I'm joining you next week with Tim at some point as well. I had a chat with him yesterday, so I'll, yeah. I'll pop by sometime during the week. Yeah, too. that's Tim's hour. Tim, the last hour is Tim's hour. He's the host of the show. And, uh, like Parkinson. Yeah, well. Like Parkinson, yeah. Great. I'll see it's you then. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Love you, Eddie. Bye. Bye, Bye Good to see you, Sarah. You too, Bye. take care. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Now we're going to talk to me. I don't know if he's there waiting and I need to go to Lou Yes, break. I would say let's take a break because you need uh, a little refueling as well. Yes. And just to remember to keep drinking. Okay. I'm stopping now for a Lou break. Is anyone watching on the line going to have a five minute Lou break? Oh, I need to pee. Penny Ella Arabiata. Yeah, well, uh, you want to try. Do you know who I am? All the money goes to charities that make humanity great because they do wonderful things out there. Humanity Great Again is a title that came into my mind. I don't know where that came from. Maybe it was a play on something or other. All the money goes to charities that make humanity great, because they do wonderful things out there.
Hello, boy. I'm back. I'm marching. Now. You know, Dave, he's Mecca in a ready position. Hello, yes, Eddie. Uh, we're going to pass you over to Mecca now. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Ed. Hi, Mick. How are you doing? I'm oh, good, thank you. I, I thought that I'd get on my bike, so to speak. Oh, yeah. So I've found you on my bike. So is that a, have you got one of those ones where the, uh, is it the back wheels off the ground? Is that how it works? Or, um, or is yeah, it... I mean, it's, this isn't a bike I could take out on the road. It is literally a, a static bike that oh, you can wind up. I got you it. can wind up the resistance on and set your modes and your timing and all that. But um, I probably shouldn't have started about 45 minutes ago on it, and now I'm knackered. But anyway, you're knackered. I'm yeah. knackered, so let's just keep going. That's, that's good. So I should explain <laughs> to everyone listening around the world, this is Mick Perrin from, and Mick Perrin has a company called Mick Perrin Worldwide. And, Your uh, idea. and I've been, my idea, yes, yeah, because you have been co-promoting, uh, promoting by yourself uh, with me and lots of other acts in the UK, but all around the world now, you do, yes? yes. And it's like, yeah. is it, how, um, you, well, have you counted up how many countries you're co-promoting in? Or? Um, well, I think we've we played around 26 countries, something like that, mm. um, and, um, you know, Eddie, we've been, you and I have been together for 24 years or so now. Wow. Yeah, I know. Frightening, isn't it? I'm only 25, um, then. <laughs> well, the first one was the one where the intro tour, of course. Ah, oh, right, yes, yes, of course it was. With the lovely what? Suki and Nia. Nia, and... Uh, um, it was, um, so... Steve. So, yeah, um, I've been travelling the world with, with you, and then obviously before that with, you know, Yes, the People's Stomp. Um, you know, various other acts and comics, and uh, like you, I, you know, I became a very proud European and a, a proud member of the of the world society, I suppose. Yeah. And you know, all these fantastic people around the world. Once I became a promoter, uh, which we can talk about if you like, because yeah. that's quite an interesting one. No, it, it's great and because. Then, I think, like me, you're proud to be British, proud to be European, and proud Absolutely. to be and proud to be a world citizen. And we are, we are, you can you can be all of these. And I know, if you're listening around, what well, some people feel it's a time of separation. We should retreat, and we should go into isolationism. But I think that's old-style thinking from the 1930s. That's very right-wing thinking. And I think the only way for humanity to survive, in fact, and to move forward, is if we learn to live together, work together in some shape or form. And that's why um, I am not positive on separating out. I'm positive on making even stronger connections than before. And I think hopefully you'd be up for that idea. Yeah, I mean, you know, especially in the world that we are in, with the comedy world, um, you know, we all, we all observe. We all want to talk about it. We all want to feel um, a connection and the connection is comedy, and the connection that obviously is the, is the world around us, whether that be, you know, politics or humanity itself. And, um, you know, because I've been around the world with you, and we've met people from different places, different languages, um, I, I thought it would be wonderful, especially those that, who were trying to do comedy in a second language, um, you know, for them to be able to find a way to come into the UK um, and maybe um, you know, perform here, get an audience here, and obviously before the before the book of the the whole idea was to have a, a whole European base, a bunch of European comics who go in and out of each other's country without without the need for visa, um, and that's all changed. But the idea is still there, and I now have I think 15 comics which I manage, um, international comics. Um, from from Russia to Australia to South Africa, Iceland, you know, and 
most of them are doing this in the second language, which is fantastic to see. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And that, so, and that never existed before, did it? The, the whole yeah. idea of doing comedy in a second language. People had done it. Some people had moved to countries and they were using their second language. But the idea of touring around and adding on, particularly other countries using English as a bridging language, I think that's the, been the great difference in the last 10 years. You think so? Yes. And, you know, it's just wonderful to hear their perspective as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so, sorry, Greg, go on. No, so I think we can all learn from each other because some of the comedy scenes in the countries in, say, Europe or in Asia, anywhere around the world, who are coming in, their comedy scenes might have started after ours in Britain Absolutely. or in America, but they'll catch up and then they'll come up with great comedy or they're already coming up with great comedy and then we go, wow, that Indian guy, that Irish guy, that, that guy from France, Italy, who we've already talked to for, uh, Francesco to Carlo when we were yeah. playing in Rome. I'm, I'm sure I talked to Yassine Bell, who's of course, you know, uh, yeah. when we played Paris. And uh, yeah, we're linking up. I just think it is the positive way. Make, make connections, don't break connections. Also, Eddie, what's fascinating about it is, is that, you know, places like Estonia, for instance, somewhere like Estonia, where maybe we went there before there was a kind of comedy scene as such, but obviously, you know, the likes of you went and had people knew your reputation, um, up and coming comics were there watching. Um, now they've got their own scene, a huge scene yep. going on there. In fact, it's actually hard to get in there now, which is fantastic. Because they've got their own guys. Yep. Um, so, so in a way, you know, you and I have been around a long enough to uh, to sort of be part of the creation of that, if you like, to some extent, to some small extent. But to be able to watch it over 25 years is fantastic, and that's only going to build. Yeah. And of course, comedy, as long as you can perform it without fear, um, is a fantastic way of of talking to your fellow citizens. Yeah, and uh, you were a tour manager, and then you <laughs> I, I forcefully encouraged you to become my promoter <laughs> due to a certain change in situ situation on Dzinski. My promoter yeah. was changing his job. And uh, how have you, can you describe the differences between the two? How's it been oh. since, uh, how long ago was that when that happened? That was, uh, that was 20, that was 20, uh, 2001, I think. So, yeah, 20 years ago. About 20 years ago. Um, basically, um, I don't know if you remember how it happened. Yeah, tell the we story. Were, we were on a flight to uh, uh, Melbourne, I think it was, Melbourne or Sydney, and um, you were reading an email and, and you went, oh, and you, you, I said, what's that? And you handed me your laptop and you said, read that, and it was from, the late great Andre Brzezinski, and um, it said, Dear Eddie, uh, just to tell you, I can what you've been first to know, I've loved working with you, but um, I'm basically taking on another job. I think it was. He was going to work for Andrew Lloyd Webber. He was running Andrew Lloyd Webber's organization. been offered to him, and he said it was just a job, fantastic opportunity, and you know, sorry, he can't be your pleasure anymore. And I went, Oh, shit. What are you going to do? And you said something to me like, well, it's not rocket science, is it? <laughs> As you do. And I said, oh, oh, no, it's probably not. And he said, would you want to do it? And I said, yeah, of course I do. And then about five seconds later, you said, you know, I want to do an arena tour my next tour. And it was quiet. I know for the next few hours on the plane, because I was contemplating that, thinking, well, that hadn't been done before, an arena tour of a comic. Um, in the UK, and um, I just agreed to take that on. <laughs> yeah. And I had no company, and no money, and no staff, and no office, it was just me, um, and my wife Lizzie. And um, so I got home from Australia, and I told her what was going on, and I formed a company, or I registered a company, and then I set about trying to, to borrow about three quarters of a million pounds. Wow. I didn't realize well, you had to borrow that much. I know. Well, we should say that Badil and Newman in the UK, in America, uh, arenas had been done. Steve Martin was doing huge rooms before. And so, but it was, 
it was thought of, I think Steve thought of it as not a good gig because no one could really see what was going on. But now we had screen technology and Badil and Newman had played Wembley Arena in the round. Um, and I, after that, played Wembley Arena a long ways on. And then I thought, let's, let's go for a tour because I just wondered why, if rock and roll are doing it, then we're going to do it too. So that's when the arena tour started. And some people, it's not their cup of tea. And now uh, people, I'm playing theatres, but I still love playing arenas. Hollywood Bowl, Madison Square Garden, I do love them. The O2. Um, but yeah, so you did the first, it was, how many, oh. how many, was it 27 well, arenas or something? That well, we I don't know if you remember any, but when we put the first ones up for sale, Probably only about eight or nine of them. Right. I mean, obviously, they're 10,000 seater pluses. But before even a week had gone by, the venues were ringing up asking for more dates. So we ended up doing three or four in some places. Yes. Um, and, um, and, you know, we were learning too. Um, we did something you know, like 20. You didn't have the sort of lightweight strings and yeah. even PA systems. So we had a huge um, like career of gear. I think even in that first one, we had like two or three trucks, didn't we? Yeah. Um, and I like, and, to, um, I like to get the number of trucks in. And the first one was obviously very stressful because Mick yeah. had been a tour manager, and tour manager is a very complicated gig. But here, he, you were actually tour manager and promoter, yeah. weren't you? At the yeah. same time. I remember being in America with you as a tour manager trying to organize <laughs> the UK stuff. And obviously, I was very anxious. Um, I mean, there's a lot riding on it. I mean, I always thought, well, I've got no money anyway, so if I go, if I go bankrupt, what the hell? You know, it doesn't really matter. I didn't think I would. <clears throat> but um, it was really interesting that, um, that you know, um, once we went on sale and the sales figures came through, it was instantly going to be a huge success. And I don't know if you remember, Eddie, but obviously my anxiety caught up with me yes, indeed. on the first day of the gig in Nottingham. Go on, you say what happened. Well, you had you got labyrinthine disease, didn't you? Which I, 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 I have had a couple of times since then, so I know what it's like. Basically, yeah. everything's spinning, and you you want to throw up, and it's kind of like yeah. motion sickness while not doing anything. Couldn't even stand up, couldn't walk, couldn't stand up. And I remember meeting you at, uh, at Wembley Arena, and you were, you were having great difficulty staying vertical. This is in a corridor, yeah. and you said, I'm in a bad way, and I said, just go home will do it because this is the one thing I always wanted to be in special forces when I was a kid I've mentioned this before I'm sure I annoy special forces people say well you're not but I did want to and they obviously in a very dangerous situation but I take a lot of things out of that and that one of them is in any of the special forces teams they should all be able to cover each other so if one gets wounded the others can back them up and they all got expertise in different areas but they can all do many things so I thought You've, it's okay if you go to bed, get well. We'll yeah. make we'll make things happen, and and there's enough knowledge and expertise in in there in the uh, arena that we were about to go on, and we'll yeah. be. Uh, yeah. So that's what I. I thought. mean, I remember getting a phone call from John Farquhar Smith about I don't know, 20 minutes in, and I'm lying in bed and the phone goes, and of course I didn't know if it was going to be thumbs up or thumbs down. And he just left, he just held the phone, and I could hear the audience is whooping and clapping and hollering, and, and that's what we needed to do, really. Yeah. John Farkas Smith was uh, a production manager. Yes, that, he was. So I thought with John, he could take it, and, you know, you make you got everything there, so we just had to, you could go home and, and sleep. How, how many days did it take to get out of that? Uh, 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 two, three, I think, actually. Um, yeah. I mean, the doctor came to the hotel and started putting on, on tablets. Um, I think I think we did Nottingham. Maybe there was a, a day off afterwards anyway, or maybe there was another gig at Nottingham. I can't remember now. But um, I was certainly there for the for the next gig. Um, but um, yeah, it's an experience. I, I, I'm, you know, whether or not anxiety. I mean, it's quite possible that that brings that on. But no one's ever been able to tell me because. I mean, I know George, George, you know George Glossop, obviously you know George. Yeah, I know George. He suffers from it really badly. And we should say George yeah. Glossop is a sound uh, designer and expert. And he, yeah. I think Sarah, actually bring Sarah into this. Guys, can we get Sarah onto the screen as well? 
Vic. Do, uh, doing yeah. good on the bike. Well, you know, I thought I'd try and keep in step a little bit. Okay. So really, you know, the last time I was performing uh, physical with Eddie was up Arthur's seat after my all night Edinburgh party. Oh, oh yeah. Lord, yes, it was. I, I don't know how you. I don't know how you did that. I don't know how I did that. I was. I was doing tequila slammers at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I was running up the bloody mountain at yeah. 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock in the morning. That was 2009. Yeah. I'd already run 23 marathons or so. And we yeah. took a day off in in Edinburgh because we'd had to fly from Belfast back into Edinburgh. Uh, was it? No. No, we just, we just took a day off. Dairy, I think. Yeah. Oh, was it? I'm not yeah. sure. But anyway, we came in because we ran from Glasgow in the end. But I think we might have taken a day off in Eastbourne and then gone over to Glasgow and run back. But. Uh, uh, yeah, so that was my day off. I decided to run up, not take a day off, and run up Arthur's Seat. If you go to Edinburgh, it is actually the volcanic plug of the super volcano. There you go, for uh, geologist fans. Really? And the volcano you... is massive. It's not a, it's, it's, it's the plug, it's the last bit, but it goes quite, some of it goes just shooting up. And you c came up having, every night at the Edinburgh Festival is quite a, 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 a boozy affair, isn't it? Well, yeah, four o'clock to bed is kind of early, really. Um, I think this was six o'clock to bed and eight o'clock up and running with you. But the thing is, is that you came to my party. You were there. Yeah. After all of that, which I was amazed to see. And so was everybody else, really. Well, running up Arthur's seat is a tough, but I sort of run, walked, staggered up it because some of it's just too much. But it was a total of about, I don't know, two hours, two and a half, three maybe at yeah. most. Whereas each day I was running for about six to eight hours. So it was a kind of a day off for me or, a, or an easy day for me in a I way. I think someone's got some pictures of that somewhere. I remember seeing one with you with the, the Scottish flag. With the salt um, type, yes. That's, yeah, Amanda. Yeah, yeah. that's Amanda, Amanda Searle, who does Amanda, right, most it. of my photos. And uh, she has that. But we were talking about George Glossop, I should say, yes. Um, yes. sound designer. And I believe he invented for Kate Bush when she first toured with no microphone in her hand. She was wearing a head microphone. I think he invented that. Do you know that, Sarah or Mick? I'm not sure. Yeah, I think that he, he, I think he, Mick, you'll know this better than me, but I think George did the first sort of modern day design in-ear monitors as well, I think. I, I don't know about that. I think, I think the thing Eddie's referring to is that I've always, um, I mean, you know, we've known George for, over 20 years, and as far as I know, he was the first person to put a radio uh, mic system, like a, a cordless headphone tech system on a performer, and that was Kate Bush. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, well, I, I, I didn't know that, actually. Yeah, that was, I remember that tour. She, Kate Bush, there was a guy called Tim Ashley. Tim might be watching, he's on a WhatsApp group of us, um, on an email group from my old school. And he came in and he was singing, or he was playing, or he was just putting the record on. He bought Wuthering Heights by Kate Bush and saying, This. Listen to this. And then that's when she, and she took off, and she was age 16, I think, at that time. And she toured. And when she toured, she wanted to do all the dance and movement that she was good at. So she needed a head microphone. I think she was one in this country. I'm not sure in America or elsewhere. But George designed that. And anyway, so I've so gone right around the circle. So George has suffered from a labyrinth as well. Yeah, I mean, yes, he is. Sadly, I don't know if he still is, but. I mean, that was just, just going back to us giving that arena tour. It was because we knew people like George and John, the experienced people that we could trust that we could get this thing done. And when I was ill and I wasn't there, everything was set up, set up and ready to go. And you knew, as well as I knew, that we had a fantastic crew who could just do it. You know, we always have backup, if you like. Yeah. Um, and um, that, that and that's is why the thing. it worked. That's the thing, it's backup. And me and Sarah talk about this. We have a backup for this system in case either of us get symptoms of COVID or feel like yeah. you know, something's registering, even if we're not bad. We have to we'll pull back to my house and we've got one set up here and so we can do it, what we call the nuclear option. <laughs> so we're backed up and backed up and backed up and uh, double masks and stuff. And yeah. That's the way it gets gets it done. Yeah, I think I had a good teacher. Who was that? <laughs> oh, well, is it? Very well, kind of you, but that I comes, learned well. I learned well. Well, that comes from two things. Special forces, the top of the top, the best of the best, going in and getting people 
and uh, situations, making situations, uh, pulling people out of dangerous situations, pulling other soldiers, for other members of the forces out of dangerous situations. Um, but you also push people. You also push people to do things that they wouldn't, they wouldn't normally do. I, you know, I mean, there's technology, latest technology gadgets or whatever it is. You know, you actually, you not just, you don't just push them, but you actually give people an opportunity. I do. To do it themselves. I do encourage um, people. Which is something I've taken on, and I, I've always been like that in my business, probably because of our experience that you've got to let people take things on. And yeah. Run with it. Once you've you know, once you believe in them, you've got them on board, let them run with it. Encourage people forward. My dad, he was, ended up being an executive at, at, at BP, British Petroleum. And I know if you're listening in America, Gulf of Mexico, but this was before all of that. So it was just a doc. dad worked his way up from the bottom, but his, when he became uh, inter group internal auditor for BP Worldwide, he, uh, when, with his people, he would say, and I think he ran that for about five years before he retired, that group. And he said, uh, your failure, if there's a failure in a group, it's my failure. If it's a success, it's your success. He was very good with that. This, is, this, this was told me by someone else after he passed away, so. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's nice. Yeah, it's I nice think there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of dad that I seem to have picked up. I also like to do things, use common sense. This is a weird thing. Like I started performing in French and then German Spanish, encouraging other comedians, particularly to do it in English because it's a business advantage for comedians from around the world. There's a whole English tour. You can tour in English all around the world. I'm not trying to encourage people to, to love a certain country. It's just English is just like, it's, it's not owned by anyone. It's not owned by the British, not owned by the Americans, the Australians. New Zealanders or the English-speaking Canadians. It's just out there for everyone to use, make your own slang up, and it's a well, function. It's the international language. language, isn't it, really? It does seem to be, along with Spanish, I should say, because I think the Spanish speakers and the English speakers have a similar thing. If you're one or the other, you won't learn, you're very slow to learn other languages uh, because English is spoken in a lot of places and if you look at it from the Spanish perspective that is spoken in many many countries there's many films many yes. TV series you can watch and and if you're not if you don't line up a motivation you just won't bother learning another one so I find a lot of Spanish because haven't got English a lot of English because haven't got anything uh, and uh, anything else if but you I'm haven't done already um, Eddie you should, you should give a chat with uh, Michael Pittemeyer absolutely no, we're hopefully going to talk to him when I'm in uh, playing Berlin for Germany, or it could be Vienna. We we'll talked to him twice. But yes, all of our the people we know, we will talk to. Oh. I, think, I think you've got something now, haven't you? At one thirty. Yes, got something one thirty. So I will say thank you to you, Mick. Well, talk to, probably talk to you down the line, but thanks for popping by. Again. Yeah. Um, great to see you, Eddie. Proud great as you. always. Love you Cheers. lots. You take care. Bye now. Bye, Rick. Thanks. So anyone like to donate to what we're doing? Uh, try to make humanity great again at a time when some people are not trying to make humanity great. They're doing something else. Um, you can donate at eddieisot.com. That's a great place. If you see the screen and you're in the UK, you can use that service zero eight one zero. Um, from the UK. Uh, Ian or David? Or Dave? Hello, you've got both of us. You've got both of you. Um, could, you know, you got from anywhere in the world, uh, eddieinsel.com. Could you change the other one to say from the UK text to the little, little M so that people know it's the UK phones and yeah. they don't? That'd be good to hand that to that. And also, who am I talking to? Ah, it's questions from Facebook. Now, yeah, it's questions from Facebook. And, up. and Dave, and then it'd be good to see if we've got someone up and I'm talking to, I need to see what the next thing is, because otherwise I'm going, I don't know when it stops, in five minutes or in half an hour. Uh, because it was the, um, the questions from Facebook next. Right. We, uh, we, we better carry on for a little bit longer, but I can... I no, can but I, no, but I need to see it, you see. I need to see it in front of me on the screen. It wasn't on the screen, so I didn't know when I was supposed to finish. It's in the end. Mick said, you've got something at 1.30. I can't remember things. You see what I mean? I need to see... 
who yeah. I'm talking to and what the next thing is coming up. So. What I do like, though, is that's clearly once a tour manager, always a tour manager. I like that Mick, Mick, Mick wrapped yeah. Mick's self up. <laughs> yes, it is. I think you also want to get off the bike. Yeah, I don't know how many kilometres Mick had done. OK, so do go to Facebook now. Now is the time. Facebook questions are coming. So you'll see on the screen. We'll read them out. Yes, so I am on Facebook now. Uh, so yes. Next uh, half an hour. I'll just tell you, say, next half an hour will be questions from Facebook. So dive on, tell your friends questions. I'll try and answer them to the best of my ability. Okay. So yes, uh, it's on the live stream on Facebook. So if you're on the live stream on Facebook, uh, then in the comments section you can put your questions. Put questions in the comments section. Very good. So I am going to scroll down now. Questions. Some lovely uh, general comments as well from everybody, which is very lovely. Uh, now, I saw one a minute ago. I'm just going to try and pull oh, yeah. back up. Try to say the questions. We get the questions about everything in the world as opposed to anything that starts me thinking about me running and how my legs run that stuff. Not so great for me because it takes me into my body. Um, apologies for this. But if you could ask questions about comedy, drama, films, uh, life, uh, what's going on in America at the moment. Um, well, fun funnily you should say that because um, uh, Daithi Okoya, I I've said your name right, um, has asked, what, what do you think of what happened in Washington yesterday? Well, it was disgraceful. Donald Trump is trying to steal an election. He's still trying to do it. He's inciting people to riot. And the rioters got in and he caused the deaths of four people. That's in his... That's... <laughs> If you behave like a child again and again and again, and then at the end of it, he said, now go home as if they've done a good thing. They did a bad thing, they broke the laws. If, if you cannot have trusted democracy and have elections like this, if you're constantly saying this, all the, all the lies he came up, he lied from the moment before he got in to the moment he was in all the way through. He was a fake president and it is a very sad time in America. And President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris will hopefully help make humanity great again because nationalism does not work. And it is not a good thing and it makes people, it just separates everyone else and humanity won't make it. If you want your kids, your grandkids to have a decent life, then Nationalism are heading back to the 1930s where if lies, I've said this before, if lies are allowed to be a tool of politics, absolute bold, out and out lies, fundamental lies, and they just go on and on like, like the, him trying to steal back the election by lying and lying and lying and pressurizing and bullying. Almost everything he does is a bad example. Almost everything. It is unbelievable. And anyone who's an ally of his, Anyone who's backed him up, you're on the wrong side of history, you're on the wrong side of humanity. That's what I feel. And uh, I'll go on to the next question. Actually, my uh, Facebook's just slightly crashed, but I, I remember it. I'll, I'll name check the person in, in a sec when it reloads. But um, uh, a lady was just uh, mentioning a recent uh, photos, I think in the Telegraph, I think it was, referencing Amanda, photographer Amanda Sill's photos and asked um, whether you have, uh, whether you chose uh, your outfits for uh, photo shoot. well, I think generally for photo shoots. Yeah, the dresses I was wearing, uh, yes, it's, it's either, sometimes I have done photo shoots where there has been a, a stylist and they said, do you want to try this, do you want to try that? Um, usually they interact with you and in the end, you would, uh, you know, the individual or myself in that case would be said, yeah, I think I like this one, I think this one works on me. Uh, this dress or this look, skirt, whatever it is. Um, but the one that's most recently happened, I was sitting in, it's a Bieber dress, if it's in the blue dress with long hair flowing, uh, the hair looking pretty good because just had it, uh, just had it done uh, by a very experienced hairdresser. And 
because you know, if, if you do that and you ever come out and it looks great and then a couple of days later you can't quite get it back into that shape. But uh, oh, that's a beaver, a blue dress, blue and gold. And I was actually out running. I was out running somewhere in a city, town or city in the UK, and I saw it in the window. And I went in, in the middle of the run, I thought, I think that can work. And then went home, got changed, and a shower came back and tried it on, and it did work. So, so I bought it, and uh, yeah, it just works. Some things just work. And for trying on dresses or skirts, it, there's a lot more options and maybe a bit more, yeah, maybe a lot more stress. Uh, but sometimes it just works. So that one, there's, there's a photo shoot that were two particular dresses. The other one I got from Debenhams. Uh, sort of hound's tooth, black and white one, which I looked at, but I think that works. So my eye is in now, trying to get dresses that work with me. I think I got a better sense of what works because uh, I've been out for 35 years so yes I choose them I either someone helps me or, or I'm choosing them or I'll work with someone I'm very happy to work with other people if they've got ideas but I'm looking for classic looks as opposed to out there looks that's what works with me and uh, yeah that was from uh, Karen Lindale that was that question uh, here's a Thank question you. from uh, Mimi Brasser, who asks, Hi, do you prefer performing at a small venue like La Nouvelle Seine in Paris, or something bigger? Um, do I prefer performing at small venues or large venues? I actually prefer both. I, I, I like them all. And I want to... I think you get used to playing one, and then if you change, it's a little bit clunky on the first couple of gigs, and then you get used to that one. But I want to be able to play everything from a 50-seater to a 50,000-seater. I just want to have that in my skill set, so that's what I push for. Um, I think the most I've played to is about 15,000 uh, people. Well, that's the Square Garden and Hollywood Bowl up around there. So, but uh, I, I, I would have thought they were very different to play, but in fact, I don't think they are now because the technology, there is very good sound technology for the big arenas and stadiums and they do delays in the, in the vocals. If anyone's old enough, they remember going to a football stadium and hearing an announcement that kept echoing around and repeating around. But it doesn't happen now because they put delays in and speakers in a clever place so that it goes with the sound wave. So. That's how that works. And, uh, and the vision, there can be a delay if you've got a lot of cabling, but I push very hard to have almost no delay between what I'm performing at an arena and what's on the screen. I put the screen right behind me and just have a small version of me and a large version of me. And that's how I do it. And so there should be, you should be able to be quite nuanced in an arena, doing stand-up in that way. We have two cameras, they're both doing the same shot. One is really a backup, one is a backup, just in case one goes down, they're cabled separately. And that's how I do it. I do use regression of technology. Instead of having, in rock and roll, they have a cut to this, cut to that big thing, explosions, this, lights, elephants. It's where stand-up is a mind game, and we're trying to talk out ideas, especially, I'm, also playing characters and stuff, so I need you to see what's happening here in this window of myself. So, uh, I just need not, not to have editing. I, I, I've chosen not to have cameras cutting left, right and centre, and just have the main shot so that, so that wherever you are in an arena, you're seeing the same show. That was what I pushed strongly to have. I think that links into what Haley was saying yesterday, Haley Featherstone, our lighting director, she was yep. saying about how when she changes the lighting state during a show, she waits until there's a laugh so that it doesn't disrupt the focus from you on stage. It's quite a nuanced thing, I guess. Mm -hmm. And actually, just a little follow-on from that, how, is, how are you finding the shows that we're doing 
every night the 7 p.m. shows here because we're doing it. These are our stream shows with no live audience. How's how, is how is that different? Um, I'm finding the shows here. I'm. I'm sort of getting used to them but I've got a few things going on one I'm extremely tired so I feel like I want to sit down if I do sit down I find I almost fall asleep easier because I'm seated it's slightly more comfortable so there's at times I have to get up to stop actually falling asleep I'm that tired so that I think I probably need to stay up but oh it's so good to sit down um, the no audience is tricky I've done a lot of gigs though, so hopefully my brain can tabulate when uh, when I think something's working, when it's a good idea. I basically try and use myself as the audience. And if I go, oh, that's a good idea, that's nice, that's fun, then that should be working. But if it's an older piece of material, and I've already heard it many times, and it's difficult for me to refine the edge of comedy on it. So, um, yeah, that's just tricky. So these are harder if you tune in in the later weeks that I should have got to a place where, you see, if I was doing, interesting, if I was doing my most recent show, it would actually be easier because I could, I could sort of roll through it and, uh, and I would know when, which bit is which and which bit is not which. I wouldn't get the laughter, but I would, I would sense this is right in the zone, but I'm sort of recrafting as I perform at the moment, so it's tough. Oh. <sighs> yeah. Okay, and actually, yes, we should reiterate, yes, every night, 7 p.m. live stream show, uh, yeah, which is, uh, yes. you know, a marathon. Tickets are available at ediazot.com, and you can donate, or if you buy a ticket, you are actually donating. Um, because that money, I believe, is, that, is all that money? I or think all, all profits are going to the All fund. profits. All profits from the live gigs are going through to the charity. Um, we do have some costs to pay to set the thing up, but uh, all profits go through. So, or you can do a pure donate button and pay in, in pounds, euros, or US dollars, waving to people there. Oh, I've suddenly hit a wave of tiredness. I'll go with uh, the next question, which is, a, which is an interesting question. Um, interesting as to the, uh, well, you'll, you'll hear. So this is Kate uh, Fiskus says, what was your favorite subject in school? My two cyber students are impressed by your ploys even while running for hours. Uh, one thinks it must have been uh, speech and debate. The other thinks you would have liked art classes. Kate what? Fiskus. So speech and debate and art classes, these are the... Uh, yes, yeah, so, so her two cyber students were thinking, what must, have your, what must your favorite subjects have been? And they, they're, they're thinking it was probably speech and debate or uh, art classes, but essentially, what was your favorite subject in school? Um, debate, no, don't like it, still don't like it. It's a very formal thing. Um, if you notice how I do my debates, I'm debating with the world how to get humanity forwards, and it's an endless debate. And uh, that's what Churchill did too. It's, uh, it's not a sort of half an hour, and can you score a point? And it depends who's in the audience. They might all be very right-wing people. And so, you know, does that, doesn't. I, I couldn't do that at school. I, couldn't, I don't want to do that now. Uh, I'd rather talk to entire countries, entire continents and worlds because no one really, that, you know, you, it's very different to go around fighting for that group. So I, it's an endless debate that is going on. So I'm always trying to articulate more and more clearly on that, which would look like I love doing those it's a 30 minute debate on cheese and its place in the world. No, I couldn't, if it's, if it's something I'm not interested in, I won't debate it, you know, that wouldn't be, I'm not going to put my time into that. And that's what debating skills is really about. You should be able to debate anything. And from either side, which is not my way. Um, what was the debate and what was the other one? Uh, art classes, no, I think but, it was... Um, but there, was a, there was a double thing with debate and... It was... Public speaking? 
Communications. Ah, there you go. Communications. Was it communications? No, I thought it was something else. Uh, oh, speech and debate. Speech and debate. Yeah. Yeah, well, I wanted to act, but I wasn't really given any good roles. And uh, when I got into comedy, particularly when my comedy took off um, in early stand-up, I spoke very fast and very in a very in a rather gabbled way. I'd sometimes miss words out and... I was so, there was an idea, if you were fast enough, you could beat someone who might heckle you and you could get to another laugh line, another punch line. So, so that's what I, that's what I did. Um, hopefully people can see me. Um, so, uh, so yes, yeah, so my speech has got better because I've been doing drama now dramatic films, television, and plays for about 25 years now, I believe, and being an activist to articulate more clearly, slow enough so people can grab hold of it, that is something that I've got better at. But I didn't do it really at school. I didn't get the chance to, or just didn't do it. And the other one was art. Um, I got, me and my brother got the art prize. He's two years older than me, my brother Mark. And we jointly got the art prize when I was seven, I think he was nine. Well, if I was seven, he was nine. I think that was the time we got it. And, uh, uh, I was doing perspective paintings. That's what I was doing. So there was something, there was a, there was a bit like a turn, crossroad. And I could have gone on to say, right, let's really concentrate on art. But I wanted to do performance, even at that age. I had seen a play and I wanted to do plays. And so I kind of let art fall by the wayside and I was always intimidated by fine art. How do you get from this little thing and I've done here to a great artwork just seen miles away. So uh, I let it drop, but having, a, I've had to develop a strong visual sense, to be able to take photographs I sometimes put on Twitter which are usually just the places I'm running, but hopefully they're fairly well put together and cropped. Uh, um, being able to see good shots and films, both nicely framed ones. Uh, I want to direct my, the films that I'm going to make, so uh, I am trying to actively develop my, my visual sense. Um, so that links up with art. But in art, I was a bit sporadic at school, even though I want this. I think my brother's better than I am, naturally, in that. Now, we've got a guest at 2 o'clock, haven't we? Uh, yes, I think we do. Yeah, so, um, let's do one more question, then I'm going to break at 5-2, and then uh, we can save up questions, and I might be able to answer some later on if I break. Okay, do one more question. Yes, please. Okay, so this is Melissa uh, Schickel. He says, if you could, have, if you could have dinner with anyone in history, dead or alive, who would it be? Uh, dinner with yes. Well, Nelson Mandela. I did meet him. It'd be lovely to sit down and chat with him, uh, but that that wasn't allowed. No, there wasn't there wasn't time to be meeting guests one after the other. Neil Armstrong was astronaut. Neil Armstrong, first man to step on the moon was walking out the door as I walked in to see Nelson Mandela. That, that was the queue I was in, so you're not going to say, Nelson, just leave it. Let's go and have a song on me, shall we? So that wasn't any options. But uh, yeah, it would be nice to chat to him. Uh, who else? Probably lots of people. Uh, U.S. Grant. Actually, he, he probably wouldn't be very forthcoming, but General U.S. Grant, I would, I would have been interested to be with him. At Vicksburg. Uh, yeah, I'd like to have seen him in the field because uh, he was he was unflappable, unshakable. So that was good. Um, there should be more, but I never quite think of it in that way. But uh, yeah, thanks for the question. We'll do one other. If there's yeah, sure. Uh, let's find another question. What should we do? Um, Emily uh, 
Vicky Bridge says, uh, what is your favourite book and why? Well, I'm very unread because of my dyslexia. I'm a very slow reader. I listen to a lot of audiobooks. But if I go back to it, I did like the Narnia books, even though there's a lot of religious overtones, which I didn't really realise at the time. And religion has its place, but I just don't believe in a mystical God. So I like the spirituality between people. I can link up with uh, any religious person they're trying to help people on earth in practical ways with a good heart i just differ on the i don't think there's someone up there because they would have if there was a god they would have helped in world war ii and 60 million died and nothing happened or well, they'd be here now to help with covid and the idea that they don't help that just means well what's the point so i just if they're not there it makes sense the world makes sense if there is a god it doesn't make sense so why am i where was I going with that? What was the... Uh, Narnia, favourite book. Oh yes, Narnia. So, Lion, the Witch of Wardrobe I loved. And at Christmas, the, the winter, even though the winter was supposed to be a cold winter, I always liked the snow on the fir trees. I loved that. And that was scary. And then it got nice and then spring came and the winter went away. But I loved that kind of winter imagery. But uh, the magician's nephew, if you go, if you download my autobiography, believe me, it's, uh, you can see how dyslexic I was, I, I sort of did a pricey on, on that book, but I do remember reading it, I remember, it's actually a prequel to Lion, Witch and the Wardrobe, written afterwards, but I think it was Uncle, was it Uncle, uh, yeah, there was a Diggory, Diggory and a little girl, the Kathy, and Uncle, Edmund or something like that. <coughs> I can't remember that exactly. But he's bad, bad man. But they lived in houses and it was all set in the Victorian times. And it, it they brought a, a piece of a tree back from Narnia, which was planted in Diggory's garden. And then when he became a professor, and he's the professor in the Light of Witch in the Wardrobe, and that tree was turned into a wardrobe. And that was the wardrobe they went through. I loved that. And he, he linked that on in a prequel way. So, yeah. Um, but also, uh, the first book I bought from Camilla's Bookstop, Bookshop in uh, Eastbourne, uh, fire damaged at the beginning of the COVID times and now been rebuilt with helpful people and uh, got a new front door and everything's back and up, even though we're probably in lockdown in Eastbourne. Uh, on the south coast, one of my twin home cities. And I bought from that shop um, Alice with the Looking Glass and uh, Alice in Wonderland. But uh, back to back book, you turn the book upside down, and there was the other book. It was put together. So those two I really liked. Ah, so now I'm going to have a break. Ah, have a quick break. Ah. Bear with me. Having a quick break, full stop. Eddie.
I'm back. It seemed I didn't quite switch the thing off, but I'm already have run an extra half a kilometer on this that hasn't registered on Swift, so um, I still don't think because I'm still probably going to go to 42.2, so I'm going to have to run an extra half k anyway. So the machine was doing it, and I wasn't doing it, but I'll watch for that next time. And I think this was the right day to have that happen. Oh. Hey, Jack answers it as well. Okay. Well, hi. Hi, Eddie. How are you doing? I'm great. I sort of felt slightly bad. I thought, should I sit by my fire in my comfy chair with a cup of coffee yeah. and, watch you, and watch you run, or should I be sort of semi-naked, sweating, and joining in? No, so I. I want the former. Yeah, I think it's better for me to have people not uh, on. If they're on treadmills, fine. But uh, I'm, if I'm talking to yourself and you're relaxed, I kind of go to your. I, I kind of sit with you in your room, yeah. so so I forget about the legs, so I can have a conversation with whoever I'm talking to. I'm kind of in their room because I'm looking at you, and that helps me get out of body from the, the tiredness of the legs. Now so I'm going to help you sort of physically, therefore, by you yeah. can come to join my level of karma. Yeah. Look, I'm doing some research for your next guest who's on after me, a relation of Emmeline Pankhurst. Wow, yeah, I thought you know, she was a Pankhurst. But we should, before you tell that, explain, tell people about yourself, tell the world, oh. Will Greenwood, about yourself. Oh, oh. You want my stump speech? That's yeah. the I'm a Lancastrian kid brought up by two school teachers who got a sports scholarship to a nice rugby school. I ended up at Durham University. I got a degree in economics and business. I joined the city. Uh, London, uh, HSBC, then overnight a bloke called Jonah Lohman took the rugby world by surprise in the 1995 World Cup, bang, rugby turned pro, I gave it a shot, thought I'm a skinny beanpole who looks like Rodney Trotter, but I quite like it, seven years later I win a World Cup, then my body falls apart, then I transition into the media, I do 15 years in the media and now I've flipped again, I'm now in the business world, I'm chief customer officer for an amazing artificial intelligence company called Affinity, in the meantime, I support charities like Born, Tommy's, and the Child Bereavement Charity because we lost our first child uh, on the September the 19th, 2002. Uh, Freddie will always be our first. We now have three further children, but I've always been inspired to help support and fund research into preterm premature births so that more babies are born when they should be born. Finish. Wow, that is an amazing thing. I'm so sorry about your your son, Frederick, it's a, it's a good name because uh, my great-grandfather, and I think my great-great-grandfather were Fredericks. So, yeah, we, Freddie, we, Frederick Christen, Frederick George Alexander Greenwood, uh, and he's had such an impact uh, on our life. And at the time, you, the world, you want it to end. I mean, uh, you're much more literary, literate than I am. I think WH Jordan is it silenced the dogs and the pianos and. I literally wanted the world to open up, but through time and, and sticking in there, we've met an amazing uh, man called Mark Johnson, who's behind the Born Charity, who helps um, mums who go into preterm labour. And it's given us, uh, it's, it, it allows us to feel as though Freddie, however short he was with us, has a legacy. And his brothers and sisters know about him, and he's, he's part of the fabric of our family. So, like you are inspired to help Fair Share and uh, some of the other charities that are involved today that mean a lot to you. That's the one that uh, I have a bat signal with my the doctor. And when he needs funds, I've been up Kilimanjaro with 15 midwives. I've taken 12 people to the North Pole. And as and when I am required to rattle the bucket, I rattle the bucket. You are very good. You are an energizer bunny who goes oh. and gets things done. That's great. I, you're after, after my own heart, I love, I love that, the, the proactive nature of what you did, and also the twists and turns in your life into the city, because I did accounting and financial, financial management with mathematics at Sheffield, so I could yes. have been at HSBC or something like that, could have been, you know, there was a thought in my head, but I wanted to go and do this stuff, 
But, which uh, is your the take your mind of running? Which which if I had to give you a GCSE question now, which particular branch of mathematics would you just go? Please let it be calculus or Pythagoras or what, what, where are we going? It, all of them were good until I got to additional maths, the, the sort of one between A level and GCSE O level. That I, I got the differentiation slowed me down. Whoops, Sarah. Uh, and uh, but I liked I liked doing angles, geometry. I yeah. liked calculus. Is it calculus? Um, yeah. The uh, the one with you know if x is right and y is that. What's that one called? Is that? Uh, my dad hated that one, I think, but I like that one, and he, he liked maths, but is that called formulas? What is that one called? Whatever that yeah, one is. What, what I love about it is as you're running to Greece, you're running to the home of some of the great mathematicians. Yes, and the great thing is they invented democracy. But yeah. It is a thing. I was, coming, I was trying to think. I've been, to, I've been to two Greek islands, one with one of my early holidays with my wife. We went to Santorini. Oh, uh, excellent. And, uh, the other one I went with my, you used to get the what, student loans, and I took a student loan out in order to go to Zanti and uh, did bad things as a sort of 18, 19 year old does on a Greek island in the early 90s. Yeah, Santorini is what I've been there. It's a wonderful place, isn't it? Amazing. <laughs> yeah, you probably went to very different places. Yeah, I probably party. did. I was with my partner. Her and I, we went. We went to, you know, the caldera, that central bit where the volcano yeah. blew up thousands of years ago. And you could sit there watching the sunset go down. If you remember that, maybe you weren't doing that kind of stuff. But they would have a sunset and they'd have all these bars and you could sit there having a drink and watch it. But it went down because it's so much closer to the equator. It went down like that. It was about yeah. half an hour, half an hour and was it had gone. And so we kept saying, let's go and do the sunset. Oh, it's gone. And we could never get there in time until we finally did. But yes, that's. Thank you. Thank you. So can you hear my dogs in the background, or is it not too loud? No, I can hear dogs, but they're nice. They sound okay. And I had just people shouting through encouragement through our windows. We have windows open to make sure there's. No. But, you know, I was then doing a bit more research on sort of Greece and understanding that Alexander the Great, cult, you know, Napoleon had his Praetorian Guard, uh, sorry, Caesar's had his Praetorian Guard, Napoleon had his old guard, Alexander had his companions, yes. like Ptolemy and these sorts of guys. Who, who's your companions? Who are your old guard that for things like this get you through it, pick you up, keep you going again, strap you up, grease you up, get you on it, go, go, go? The, the grease you up sounds a bit weird, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's the, well, see, Sarah Johnson, who is actually here, you might have seen before, she's, uh, yeah. she, we're in the same support bubble, so she's tour manager, road manager, or event manager, and uh, so She's probably the closest link, but anyone I work around and I have a number of people in here, in this country and in America, and they, all of them, I'm kind of a self-starter, so I never have to be, I never have to be pumped up and dragged up off the floor. I always do that myself, but uh, they're the ones I go to and I say, we're going to do this next, and they say, no, and I, oh, well, are you sure about that? And I say, I think I'd really, like, I remember phoning Sarah, saying I'd like to uh, we're going to go to South Africa and run 27 marathons in 27 days for Nelson Mandela. That's the next thing to do after I'd run around the UK. Yeah. And, and do you remember that, Sarah? Oh, yes, it's very just, well. Is this, sorry, very Sarah's well. here as well. Can we put Hi, Sarah, Sarah on the screen? Hello. Hi. Dave? Just, it's, it's, it is it truly incredible what you do. I, I watched the ex interview you did with Lorraine and you just go, it's just a passion that you have. And, very close friends with Kevin Sinfield, who did seven in seven out on the road in and around Leeds for his friend Rob Burrow, who has a motor neuro disease. Uh, yes. And he said he got to the end of it, and you know, the next day he went for a run because just that's what he does. Is running just what you do? Is it just your passion? Well, it's elemental, it is elemental. If you, if you imagine a bike, if I was doing lots of bike riding, uh, the uh. People would say, well, the uphills, yes, I'll donate when you do the uphills, but when you're riding along, because it's not the Tour of France, you, you could just coast along on the road, and the downhills are easy peasy. So, uh, and 
But if you're running or if you're swimming, you just have to do it. It's the only thing. Uh, normally, I'm dragging my body along at the moment. This belt on the treadmill is pushing me, so I have to keep going. But it's uh, that's the thing, and it helps raise the money. But it also yeah. gives me a fitness back, and I can do it whenever I want. Uh, I can just choose a place. I can make. I can say. I can go onto the online map apps and go measure half a marathon, run it, and run back. And I've done it. So that's what it is. It's so grabbable. Uh, yeah. Easy to use. My weapon of torture is either a watt bike or a rowing machine. I've got four of my nearest and dearest from my university days in Durham. And every Tuesday and every Friday, so tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., we meet on a Zoom call and we row together for 45 minutes. Wow. Someone picks a session each week. We do different. It's never 45 minutes in one go, it's two minutes on, one minute off. But I. I think sport, I think exercise for me is the greatest, no other way of putting it, the greatest antidepressant on the planet. It's yeah. the greatest motivator, it's the greatest energizer, it's counterintuitive, you, you think it should tire you out. Actually, it, it, it drives me, it fuels my day by, by getting up and doing some exercise. Yes, I totally agree. It is, uh, if, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it, and all wild animals are fit, every single one, be they a hunter or I'll be they being hunted if it's a giraffe or if it's a lion they are fully fully fit and that's what we used to be in the old days and I think yeah. the more you push the body the more health it gives you back the less aches and pains you get it's very it is counterintuitive uh, you think it would fall apart but it it gets stronger well I know uh, many of your guests will probably do the same as me and I, I like to be quite boring in that sense I just want to doff my cap what you're doing. I think I was telling your researchers that I've done some training in my time. I've met some pretty incredible people. But when I've watched your 27 and 27 comment relief, and when I heard again about what you're doing, um, it is absolutely extraordinary what you are doing. And uh, me and my wife are huge admirers of everything you do. So know that when you are going through your darkest hour and the feet are wanting to drop off and you don't want to go again, you have a huge number of lovers and followers who just wish you the bloody best in this insane challenge. Well, thank you. Well, that, that, is, that is wonderful to have us. <coughs> you have, I, I'm gonna, I need to talk to you more about what you've done. I, I, what I'm fascinated about with yourself is your left hand at the traffic lights from <coughs> working in a bank to becoming a rugby professional and winning the World Cup. So before we do that, Dave, up in the, the ceilings, Dave and Ian, can Hello. I talk to you? Um, you remember I was saying I, I, it's great to have things that ahead of me on the, on the screen so I can read things, but also what's coming up is also wonderful because Ms. Pankhurst is coming up. I just don't, I can't see anything about the next thing because I never know how at, long. At, at 10 minutes to the end of the interview is where we put the next guest No, up. No, I know what I need to do is have it on this screen so I can, I can, so that I can see I'm talking to Will and I can see the next thing that's coming up. Just a title, just a time and a title. And that would be great. Does that make sense? We can do. Thank you very much. Now, well, so you're going to talk about uh, Ms. Pankhurst. What's uh, the first name of my next guest? You were about to read out a whole load of things. I need to hear this because that's, if you've got interesting things, Emily Pankhurst is just an amazing woman. Um, so hopefully, if she's a granddaughter or great granddaughter, <laughs> it's an interesting story. Tell us anything you found out. Yeah, uh, born 14th of July, 1858. Um, founded the Women's Franchise League in 1889 and later the Women's Social and Political Union. And her speech, I am here as a soldier, was given in the US and is marked and recognized as one of the speeches that changed the world. And this is Emily Pankhurst. And, and uh, if, do you know if my next, you may not know this, but my next guest, I'm not sure she's a great, granddaughter or great great but anyway we'll ask her we'll find that out but that I'm going to go back to that question that you just said where uh, where did I go from the city to playing rugby super quick because yeah. I think there's a really interesting anecdote there my dad was an England captain in the 60s um, and then fell out with the union went to Rome we lived in Italy for six years 
he'll pick a fight in a monastery, my old boy. Um, but the most passionate sportsman uh, who helped and supported me. And when rugby first turned pro in 1996, I loved the city. Loved working in the city. Um, great to have some money in my pocket, and I was an amateur rugby player. When it went professional overnight, I decided I was going to stay in the city and just go down the road to a sort of level two, level three club. And my old man, he basically had a bet with me. And he said, uh, you've got to go and try it, and you've got to see if you can play for England. And if you don't play for England within two years, then go back to the city. That's my bet. So I had a bet with him. So that's basically how I ended up playing rugby. I had a bet with my old man, because he said to me, don't be the bloke at the end of the bar uh, in 30 years' time saying you could have been, or if only. And I think he's a, my dad's a great remover of ifs, ifs buts, and maybes. Yes. Well, that sounds amazing. Um, and so you, you went in. What position were you, uh, was your place that you played? What well, was I was a centre. Uh, so what's your favourite sport? Give me a sport and I'll try and get an analogy. Well, football, but I did play rugby. I was a kind of wing three quarters. You were centre yeah. in, in the wing, and, yeah? Yeah, exactly. And football in terms, I was sort of a Gerard or a Lampard, just in behind the strike force, providing and doing a little bit of midfield skullduggery. Um, to keep the team compact in the middle. That's what I did. But I picked up a load of nicknames. Uh, Bob Dwyer, the great Australian coach, thought I was a sort of second row masquerading as a centre. I was Shaggy, the cartoon character. I was Rodney Trotter. Uh, the list goes on. My, my sort of bendy nose and long chin lends itself to a lot of nicknames. And then I got involved in that team that involved Martin Johnson, Lawrence Delalio, Johnny Wilkinson, Jason Robinson. And we set off and we lost a few and we won a few and then we started winning a few more than we lost. Before you know it, uh, we were the best team in the world and taking on the best team in the world and beating them. And it was, a, it was the most amazing time. I mean, the most wonderful memories of a, of a team that started out bang average, who believed in each other and ended up summiting their Everest. Yes, yes. Well, well all part of you because uh, I just love it. I kind of love people reinventing themselves as they go, constantly. You know, I'm, I've got plans for what I'm going to do in my 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, plan ahead, put things in there, because otherwise I think you die if you stop, if you just sit there, it's, got, it's going to be all over. Well, just out of interest, a quick question, if you, if you had an afternoon where you couldn't, where you were banned from planning for the, your 60s, 70s, 80s, banned from the next book, the next uh, comedy uh, tour, and you just had to sit still for three hours, right. what, would you, what would you do? Well, uh, sleeping would be the first one. If I'm yeah. not allowed to, I'd, I'd watch uh, anything streaming, all the, the Netflixes and the, the uh, things you can get online, down on BBC, ITV, whatever, films. Yeah. I love that. I film industry. I broke into pine wood when I was 15, and I uh, always wanted to make films and be in films, doing dramatic acting, not actually comedy. So I've done 25 years of that, and uh, now I'm on my last 10 years. I've been doing what I consider decent, good work, getting getting interesting, getting really quite interesting in my drama. My comedy's in a good place, but um, if I'm only allowed to sit. If I can watch that, I'll do that. If not, I just do breathing and fall asleep, because I do fall yeah. asleep at the drop of a hat. I so we'll, we'll offer each other suggestions then. We'll go like like a game of tennis. Uh, I want your net, your Netflix or Amazon series that I should watch, and I'll give you the one I sh you well, should watch. At the moment, it's uh, Queen's Gambit. Oh, it's I loved it. Seen it. Brilliant. Yeah. Now, so I'm going to come back at you and go Succession. Yes, I did watch it, but when it got to the Chabba Critic bit, I thought, I know where it's going. But Brian Cox is fantastic, and, uh, and all part of it. But when they got to the bed, I said, I can see this, is they're gonna do a, a chap acquitted thing. And, yeah. uh, and I thought, I can see the story ahead. And I pulled out, because I just didn't want to walk down, I don't know, something. But Brian Cox is, is fantastic, great Which actor. Book? Say again? Which book would you recommend? I don't read books, because I'm dyslexic. I listen to audio books. Okay. Um, well, Sapiens. Sapiens will oh, give you yeah. the whole thing. I've got Sapiens in French, German, and English, so I can try and improve my French by listening to it in French and my German, which is a little bit scrappy. 
better. I would go, in which case, get it on audio books, I'm sure it will, it's been translated to a million languages, I'm sure you will I'll go with The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho. Okay, I will look out for The Alchemist. Um, I, got, yeah. I, to, I was talking about languages, I want to talk Johnny Wilkinson, um, and it's amazing, because he's played, he played for too long for many years, I yeah. believe, and he spoke fantastic French. Um, I don't know if he was speaking it when you knew him, but they already had it, or that just wasn't on his horizon, and he picked it up when he went to Toulon. Exactly that. To answer that, when he goes anywhere, he wants to immerse himself in the community. So most people go to France and pick up a load of Euros and get paid to play rugby. He wanted to go and be French, so he learned French. So he did his first press conference when he joined from Toulon in French. So immediately, he's the world's best player, He's the most one of the most handsome human beings ever, and then he's already speaking their language. No. Uh, so they loved him. And then there's this famous YouTube clip where in a final, he is going because some of the team were South African and some of the team were French. He's dropping in and out of French and English. Blackie, 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 which means tackle, tackle, tackle. And it is it is any given Sunday, but real. Yeah, it's. It's beautiful. I was doing a uh, Sports Personality of the Year uh, uh, award ceremony. I was doing helping with the volunteers and giving an award for the volunteers. And he was there, so I said this, and I've actually never said this, or well, rarely said this, and said, I need to meet Johnny Wilkinson. And, we, and they couldn't find him, you know, a huge amount of people there. There was an after party, and suddenly we were there, and we were chatting away in French, and that was beautiful. And I've listened to him talking. And it's great because he pushed himself in. What he did is what everyone thinks you can't do. Certain age, you can't learn another language. You can. He got a very good spoken French. He got a good vocabulary. His accent is very English, but it's cute. People don't realize that. Quote Basque, il parle français comme ça, avec un accent très anglais, mais on peut comprendre tous les mots parce que les mots sont français. So all the words are French. But the accent is just like a French guy, like Canton, I'm going, well, you know, I'm here, and I was doing this, try that. They actually find it cute. It's anyone, yeah. anyone speaking with a heavy accent, as long as it's understandable, it's, uh, it shows the energy you've put into it. Uh, well, I grew up in Rome for the first few years, so they know me as, uh, this isn't in rude anyway, they know me as Piccolino Willino. And uh, mio padre giocare rugby a Algida per sei anni, no, 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 yeah. I would become a little bit more, he's definitely from Blackburn, but trying to speak French. And with your, have you managed to use the Italian you picked up when you were first six years in your life, in your career? Has it come in at points handy or has it not really been? Um, it has been something that's when on holiday there or playing against the Italians has made me friends immediately that even if I can't master the, gr the grammar, I can, I'm prepared to give it a go. I'm prepared to, to try the accent. Yeah. To prepared to immerse myself and get it wrong. And so I've spent my life trying and failing, and languages is a, it's one of those ones where I've dabbled at when, when possible. Yes, it's good. Well, I salute to you because it's a, a lot, you know, a lot of English speakers, we're very on the back foot, and we don't, don't even, some English speakers don't even try, which yeah. is. What I learned from Wilkinson, weird enough, actually, because I know you've got your next guest coming on, so I'll sort yeah. of finish with the great man. He, he, he gave me a real strength uh, about four or five years ago when I was doing a training session with a lot of kids, and he just talked to me about what his philosophy was now, and he goes, I just try to live independently of other people's thoughts. And a lot of us spend so much time worried about uh, being something that we, we assume others want us to be, as opposed to just flourishing and enjoying who we actually are without the possible ramifications of what others might think and whenever I'm having a tough time at work or find myself a little bit anxious I just try and remember what Wilco told me which was just live independently of others thoughts it's a, it's a dangerous place trying to be someone else 
Yeah, well, that is a very good thought to think of. You've got to be have a confidence within yourself. And obviously, <laughs> I'm running along here uh, as a trans woman. And, uh, you know, coming out back in 85, that was a tough old gig. But it's, yeah. you get to a better place if you can say, OK, I think this is positive. And, and I think you've just lived a, a, an amazing life. So keep living that, Well, Keep doing that. And that is a joy. I know I'm going to dive off now before your team throw me off. You are a complete hero. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing for the five charities. I know that you've got a massive amount of supporters and the Greenwood household uh, loves Eddie Izzo. Thank you, Will Greenwood, thank you. And uh, do you take care. Go well, my friend. Will do. OK. So if anyone would like to donate, go to eddieizzo.com. You could already be streaming on it, but there's a donate button. And you can pay in in pounds, in euros, in US dollars. Uh, that is good. And guys, um, to Dave and Ian, uh, up with the thing, we're going to put a little title on the on the text that says to donate from the UK to make sure that people know the phone thing is to donate from the UK. We're going to do that, aren't we? That's coming. That's a work in progress. That's a work in progress. Thank you. Uh, so, if Helen Pankhurst is ready, that would be a wonderful thing. I could talk to her uh, and her suffragette lineage. We're just talking about uh, her relations. I don't know if grandmother, great grandmother, uh, and her, uh, Emily Pankhurst. But yes, whenever she's ready, we're going to talk to her. Uh, and she's a woman, and Helen is a woman. So uh, women's rights activist and senior gender advisor at CARE, uh, CARE International, one of the main charities that we're promoting. We're encouraging you to give and we'll give onto them as they help around the world, including in Yemen, country of my birth, Asian country, West Asian country, uh, which I like to mention because they have such a hellish tough time. Uh, generally and now and COVID and a proxy civil war, it's all too tough for them. Uh, and she's also big, works against, we're trying to get to a better place on climate change. This gender justice is, is part of climate justice. Okay, that's good. Let's talk about that. So she'll be on in just a second. So. Doing things. Give me a number of minutes guesstimate, guys, for Helen coming up. Uh, about 10 seconds, that way. Great. So you can do the Helen, <laughs> Hi there, Helen. Hi, Eddie. How are you? Good. How are you? How are you faring? Well, it's, I'm on my seventh marathon, so it's tough. I struggle to speak, but that's been like, been like that every day. But bizarrely, I'm going faster than I normally go. And just whenever I feel a little bit okay, I try and put my speed up a little bit, because every time I take a loo break, I lose yeah. tons of time. And then it means the gap between me finishing it at 6 p.m. or trying to finish at 6 p.m. and doing a show at 7 p.m. London time. Uh, that concertina's, and I just need a bit of a break to get my head together. But yeah. tell me about yourself. So oh, sorry. Sorry, yes. Just amazing. Thank you very much for saying that. Um, but is your, your lineage is from Emily Pankhurst, yes? That's right. So uh, Emily had three daughters. Right. Uh, and two sons. The sons die, so they're not in the story very much. But the three daughters, the middle one was Sylvia, and she was my grandmother. And she was right. So, um, em is it Emily or Emmeline? Emmeline. Emmeline. I'm sorry, I've been getting her name wrong. So, yeah, Emmeline okay. was your great grandmother. Is that right? That's right. Yep. Very good. Very good. Well, is, is that. And you must have grown up knowing about her from an early age, yes? So, I grew up in Ethiopia. Um, right. And uh, Sylvia had a son, my father, so 
you know, what I heard more about was Sylvia and her activism, not just in terms of the suffragettes, but also in terms of Ethiopia's independence, right. where she campaigned against uh, Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia. So as a young child living in Ethiopia, it was more the other parts of my family history, and in particular that um, action against fascism that I heard a lot about. Yes. But then we come to the UK during the holidays, and there the surname was picked up by adults for other reasons, linked to the suffragette um, story, and then it would be Emmeline that people would talk about. Um, and gradually I learned more and more about the wonders and amazing aspect of that history. And thereafter, for me, it's been about trying to talk about all of this. So to talk about, yes, Emmeline and the suffragette movement, but also some of the schisms, some of the difficulties within that movement, which included um, differences of opinion within the family, and then the link to global issues and development issues through Sylvia's, um, well, where Sylvia went on to live in. Right. It's, uh, do you find your family history at all a pressure that you need to live up to, or is it, is it just a great thing to have with you? No, it's a great thing to have. I mean, you know, it, it's helped me think about so many things. It's introduced me to amazing people. You know, people are curious about me because of that uh, lineage, but also because I kept the name. And, you know, a woman keeping her the same surname as her great-grandmother is a relatively unusual story still, and that's something that we need to change. Um, so it, it connects me to people who are interested in that history. It's helped me to think. It's given me a, a voice, which has been important. Um, and I think also maybe I was slightly protected from it in that childhood in Ethiopia. So it wasn't something I was hearing about every day. It wasn't somebody always saying to me, or oh, are you related? Right. Um, I was hearing a bit less of it. So I think I grew up with a little bit sheltered from that. And as a young adult, um, it then became really interesting. And then it's, it's been with me um, over my lifetime. I think it's become more and more relevant, actually, more and more interesting, um, partly because the world hasn't just gone off in a direction um, of improvement. There's so many ways in which things have gone backwards, and we can see that through the rise of um, you know, global fascism, strong armed um, political views uh, in many, many countries around the world. Uh, COVID also. Are you having to stop, Eddie? No, no, I'm going to walk by my, my uh, there's a uh, connection or a muscle or something in the back of my left leg and it's talking to me. And when that does, you just, this is what anyone who's running, if listening around the world, just slow down, walk it out, test it out a bit, do something different and it'll probably click back in a pace. So we can carry on talking. I just, I'm just slowing down a bit. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, so that's... It. And COVID, I mean, COVID has also brought to stark relief how much gender and other forms of inequality exist in our society. And so I think the fact that there's still so much to be done has meant that that surname and its resonances in certain terms of resistance to um, the status quo right. has been really important. Now, um, I want to go on and talk about one, Care International, which is one of the, the, uh, the charities that we're championing, and you're a UK ambassador, I, I do believe, I get that right. Um, and uh, also talking about climate change and, and gender justice, part of climate justice, I really want to talk about that. Um, but first of all, on your name, how did, you, how did you fight to keep the name in this crazy world that's so male? still male uh, leaning so that you know the man has the name I mean I know Hillary, Hillary Rodham Clinton that's an example in America they uh, uh, if a woman gets married she can keep her name and they can put the man's name on the other side but how did you do your what's your story of how it worked so um, Sylvia Emmeline's middle daughter kept her surname right. for a number of reasons and that itself is quite interesting so she kept it partly as a feminist um, story, but she also didn't believe in marriage because she felt that marriage at the time was majorly problematic from a women's rights point of view. Yep. But also, her partner was an Italian um, anarchist, and anarchists didn't believe in don't believe in marriage. And last last reason is that he was a refugee from uh, uh, Italy and. Therefore, was she? She would have lost her rights to be 
a British citizen and to vote if she had married him because a woman at the time would have taken on the nationality of her husband. Yeah. So for all those combined reasons, well, one of them w which would have been enough, Sylvia kept her surname and then um, she had a son, my father, who had the surname. So then I had the choice on marriage, whether to keep it or not, I decided to keep it. And then I have two children, a boy and a girl. And I, um, instead of double barreling, which would have felt awkward, we've got one surname for one, for my daughter has got one surname, and then my son's got the other surname, and Pankhurst as a middle name. Right. Yeah. The next generation will have it as well. Very good. It is, tr it is tricky, isn't it? That even if you, because if you made it say that the, the name always went down the women's side, that would, wouldn't quite work for the for any boys. So to actually try to work out how to, unless you add the names on, and then that becomes too long. If you put a barrel, if you double barrel on it, it looks like you're from landed gentry. Uh, tricky old yeah, thing. It, it's really tricky. And that point that you just raised also about, you know, equality. We're not saying that it has to be the woman's line that um, continues. What, what, what I'm saying, and I think a lot of uh, people who are challenging the status quo are saying is it shouldn't always be one way. There has to be some negotiation about yes. um, what feels right. And sometimes I know families invent a new surname that's a combination of the two, but that also means that you're losing that link to the past. So it, it is tricky. Middle names work to some extent. Yes, and I realize in America that a number of middle names are actually family names that have been brought in. Why? Because a number of names in America can seem quite bonkers but they're actually last names that have moved into the middle um, so yes anyway so that's great so uh, good for you keeping that because I, I want that Pankhurst name to stay around I just I think well this is what I've said you might you might have heard me say this before but I just keep saying it on this but, uh, there was I, if you read the Sapiens book if we take the Sapiens book it's getting in the right direction and the cognitive revolution happened around 70,000 years ago and that's when we must have worked out that it was brain power and not muscle power that was doing it. Um, therefore, it should have been equal rights and pay and status for men and women from 70,000 years ago. So women are owned uh, 70,000 years of back pay and back rights. That's how I work it out. Yeah. I don't know if you think that's correct, but that's what I say. It's just ridiculous that it's still dragging on, the idea that there should be a different pay level or anything. I just think... Why? Doesn't yeah. make any sense. So it's so slow for things to change. I mean, I, I think that you know so many inequalities persist century after century. When you we just just kind of just baffles the mind to know why that continues. I um I know one imagery I, I use a lot when I'm thinking about this was uh, given to me by a woman that I interviewed uh, when I was writing a book um, on uh, on this issue on how much change there has or hasn't been. Uh, in terms of women's rights um, and she suggested this elastic band imagery which is that if you're trying to change norms and you're you're stretching that elastic band um, and that's what we're doing we're changing these conventional views and you you stretch and you stretch and you think you can continue stretching but actually you can't and sometimes if you let go what happens is ping things ping back and they ping back with violence and they ping back and go back further so it's just a a statement around you have to continue to campaign for these issues around social equality and justice and all the changes that we want in terms of a progressive world because if you just assume it's going to happen and just let go you can worse things can happen and again we've seen quite a lot of that happen i think yes um yeah you know, what's happening in america this crazy exactly. situation i find that if you're a moderate person if you're reasonable if you live and let live and you can see both sides you won't be a, a, a shouter, you won't be breaking into, into the, the Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. You won't be doing that, you won't be shouting, you won't be using that aggression. And so the extremists who have a more aggressive approach can make a, some of us in the more moderate area back down. And, that's, and our arguments are usually more complex. This is what people talk about the populist po politicians. I encourage all journalists to revisit that word. It is not a good word, it implies popular. And I say they are the simplistic politicians. Donald Trump is a simplistic politician who is using lying as a tool of politics, and it gets us nowhere. And this simple idea that you can just do a couple of things and everything will be fine, it never works. And this is the trouble it links into trying to make everything move forward 
um, in a progressive way. It is as complicated as it looks. Uh, if people think it's complicated, it is. And we can't really get around that. That's the truth of life. And we just have to try. I don't know if you heard about this today. There's a, I was on the rain this morning in the UK. I'm not sure if you if you live in the UK, if you're based there. Lorraine, the Lorraine the Kelly has a program and we talked about pronouns and my pronouns and I know it's an issue. And anyway, it's a, I just told people, it, I never demand things, but it's become a thing. And anyway, it's, I'm trying, I, you know, I've been out for 35 years, so I'm, I'm trying to just exist and be positive. And I know it gets into a tricky situation, but anyway. Uh, but you know, actually, your voice as that kind of moderate voice that's making the point, but making it um, so, so positively and without a lot of the anger, etc., on either side. I mean, I think that's so important. I guess what I'm trying to say is we're, we're being polarized so quickly and so awfully that it's really, really important to hear people who can manage those conversations without allowing the polarization. So I just think you're doing a fabulous, fabulous work from that point of view. Thank you, Helen. I didn't want to assume where you were on the, on the equation, but I... I uh... Yeah, I am a radical and a moderate. I do radical things with a moderate message. That I is, love that combination. That is, that is my way. So if the extremists come at me, I will push right back, as I have been doing for many decades now. And a lot of people have been doing it. And your great-grandmother was a, a tower of strength. It's just so, it's just so impressive. Um, you know, let's come back to that, because uh, people could be thinking about a bit of a contradiction because you know here we are saying um, it's important to n not to polarize and to be um, considerate etc so and there is a bit of a contradiction between that and the image that we have of the suffragettes as w willing to wanting to break the rules and being willing to go to extreme measures however absolutely critical is the point that they were forced into that by an intransigent so-called liberal government that it refused to give them a voice. Yeah. So what we have is a ratcheting up as a government of violence and uh, resistors of inequality saying, I'm not going to be silenced and gradually uh, ending up being militant. But that wasn't what they wanted to do it was what they were forced into. And I'm always saying that in the context of when people say, you know, but they were militant. We have to say that the government was even more militant. It was the liberal government that was force feeding women for wanting to have a say, for wanting to have a vote. Absolutely. And as I say, there were 70,000 years of back pay and back rights that they were owed. This is after decades and centuries and millennia of of uh, oppression against women and holding women back, women being written out of history, written out of the Bible. You know, it's just enough was enough and that's what your great grandmother said and then yeah. you have to do it. And if they want to have another example, a good example of that, well, you've got Nelson Mandela and he had to and go. By the way, was influenced. I mean, you know, there's a lot of link between a lot of the um, global stories of resistance to oppression from um, Gandhi to um, Martin Luther King, and a lot of those social movements influenced each other in terms yes. of method. Yes, yes, indeed. And um, and uh, also, we uh, with uh, with African Americans and, and their rights in America, having been brought over as slaves and for 400 years as slaves, um, it's interesting that I know a lot about the American Civil War. It was won in 1865, but LBJ's Civil Rights Act had to come in in 1964, 99 years later, until it wasn't until then that black people could really get to vote. They just couldn't get it on because a number of southern states had rearranged things so that black people could not register. And now we've just seen in Georgia, uh, they voted for a Democratic president and two Democratic senators. And that is amazing. And that is Georgia, where Sherman went into in, uh, in 1864. So that's, you know, it is a progress. It, we, we, yeah. I think we go forward. I hope we go forward two steps forward, one step back, sometimes three steps forward, one step back. But uh, you're talking about the elastic band. I look at Hitler and, and the Nazis and the, that evil regime 
But in 1945, I, I hope that, I believe that human rights and, and most rights in Germany slipped, uh, snapped back to where they were before, as opposed to having to come through in stages and levels. But you know, sometimes things to go, to go backwards. Donald Trump has passed things against trans people and forces, taking things backwards. But then uh, President Biden will hopefully bring them back online and then we move forward. So I'm an optimist, I'm a relentless optimist. I have a glass is two thirds full person. A glass is two good. thirds full. Um, now, so Care International, t I've been talking about that on the first day, but t tell everyone what Care International does, if you can. And, it, and it's spread. So, yeah, so it's an international charity that works in more countries. I mean, many countries. I don't know what the latest figure is, but many countries um, uh, with a combination of the humanitarian emergency work, uh, which it has to do, but its main kind of ethos is also the development work. It was started um, actually linked to the Second World War, and it was packages from uh, people in the States to Europe, including to the UK, um, because of the, the poverty and the, the difficulties after the Second World War. And then the idea of supporting other countries now is such that um, in the UK, for example, CARE supports countries in developing countries. Um, and the, the work varies in terms of all sorts of um, needs from you know, environmental food, food um, support type issues through to water and sanitation um, work, which I could speak to because it's the area that I work with care on, um, through to sexual reproductive rights issues, so many different themes picked up, and a strong focus on the understanding of women's vulnerability, um, not just economically, but also socially, so working on that as well. Great, so um, if anyone is out there wanting to donate to us, go to adsr.com and you can, you can press the donate button and you can donate and help us. And in Britain, there's a there's a text number you can text in on, and and some of that money will go to Care International, doing great work, including in Yemen, the country of my birth. And oh wow! So we're neighbours. I was born in Ethiopia. You were born just on the other side in yes. Yemen. Yes. Yes, indeed. So is Ethiopia next to Djibouti? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yes, and I've because there was a time, well, the civil war. I went there with UNICEF, and I was in Djibouti. Uh, and we, were, we went to a refugee camp up there. The people were coming out of uh, Yemen and, and getting to across Babel, Mandeb, and the Red Sea. So yeah, that's my birth uh, mm -hmm. place. And yours is just across the pond, just across the yeah. river, the Red River. Yes, indeed. And now I have to, I have another guest at three o'clock, but I want to talk about um, gender justice part, is part of climate justice. Can you uh, expand more on that? Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, one of the campaigns that we feel very strongly about is that if you look at any environmental crisis, um, it often affects women more. So from the issues of women having to be uh, supporting family members, both the young and the elderly, uh, they are often, uh, when there's an environmental crisis, they are not just looking after themselves, they're also looking at family members. Um, and there are many other reasons why uh, this, th th there is an importance to looking at climate issues through a gender lens. It's not just a question of vulnerability, it's also the question of who's making the decisions, who's making the policies, and are, do they have a gender lens to the policies that they're making? Are they aware, for example, of specific constraints that women might be um, uh, facing, or have they got this kind of gender neutral approach? So for many reasons, both to do with vulnerability, but also to do with voice, um, we're saying that that issue of gender justice and climate justice need to be looked at together. And if you look at things like uh, the COP uh, um, uh, meeting that's happening in uh, the UK this year, that was delayed from last year, the Global Environmental uh, Conference, and if you look at representation of who's at that table, you'll know that um, often it's not, it's not a gender um, equal situation. So in the UK, the initial uh, leaders that were put forward to attend that meeting to represent the UK were all men, every single one of them. Right. It checked and there's now one woman. It's just a simple example of why we need to look at that gender justice, um, climate justice uh, issue. But there's so many others that also, if you kind of look back to the issue of um, 
that, that importance of looking at the world, the environment, in a more holistic, sustainable way. There's a lot of work that women campaigners have been doing um, that looks at those issues, you know, from current uh, leaders, from Greta uh, Thunberg, for example, to um, many, uh, uh, Wangari Mathai in Kenya, and many others. You can go back in history, and there have been women that have been campaigning for this in the past, and it's still as relevant today as ever in the past. Yes, I, see, I hear what you're saying. Yes, yes, that does make sense. Huh. Well, I do believe there is more goodwill than ill will in the world. And so we'll fight for that. And uh, hopefully you like our slogan, make humanity great again. Um, yeah, absolutely. Do you have, do I have a few more minutes? There's one story I'd like to entertain you no, with. If you go for it, go for it. Yeah. So um, I mentioned that in Ethiopia with care, there's a number of different uh, hats that I have on and um, I could also talk about the marches I do in the UK, March for Women. It's a really important time around International Women's Day, and it's worth mentioning that. But going back to Ethiopia for a moment, uh, one of the projects I've been involved in is in the West Country, and it's working with 10 to 14-year-old girls, um, because it's a critical age. If you support this age group, they uh, can continue at school, they can make their own decisions about marriage, later marriage, later pregnancy, etc. Or you don't support this group, and traditions um, take over early marriage, uh, early pregnancy, poverty, etc. So we've been working with this uh, 10 to 14 year old group. And um, there's one girl's story I'd like to share, um, because what she did was she, so the story is that um, Care was supporting um, these young girls through groups of the girls coming together and learning um, to have a voice, learning to uh, be able to express themselves. There's some financial support as well so that they um, save and then with the money they can then have a bit of money at the beginning of term to buy pencils and things like that. So there's a savings element but a lot of it is also information um, provision. Either way, this girl um, go, comes back home one day and uh, finds that her parents are, in particular her father, is preparing a marriage for her. She's 13. Uh, so she goes to her mother and says quietly to her mother in this hut. So imagine the hut, imagine uh, this uh, girl talking to her father. I'm um, sorry, it's the father's talking to elders, planning this uh, marriage. And so she goes to her mother quietly and says, look, I don't want to get married. I'd like to continue with the group. I want to stay at school. And the mother says, no, you've got to, um, you've got to listen to what your father says. To cut quite a long story short, the marriage is arranged. And in terms of uh, the way this happens is that she's taken to her elderly to be husband, 45 years old, she's 13, and um, he tries to force himself on her. She resists on that first day and then wonders what to do. And so what she does is she says to this guy, 45 year old, brought, brought up with traditional values that he should be able to exert himself and therefore have this um, young girl as his wife. She, she says to him, look, this is not what I want, this is not a good idea, um, I will help you during the day, and there's work that you need in the house, but I don't want to get married, I want to continue at school, it makes her point. Um, and then um, the guy just lets her work during the day with the idea that he's going to try and force himself on her again the next night. Instead of that, she goes to the compound that she's in and looks around and finds a tree and decides to stay up on that tree to stop this dangerous point, which is at night. And she stays up there and she says quite loudly to the guy and his neighbors that she doesn't want to get married to him and she's going to stay up that tree on that night. Some neighbors give her a rope so that she doesn't fall off because it's not a massive tree and they're worried that she's going to fall off. Uh, she, doesn't, she uses this rope for exactly that reason, manages to stay up on that tree that night, comes back down the next day and explains again that she doesn't want this marriage. I tell you this story because this youngster does it for 12 further nights. For 12 further nights, she goes up on the tree and stays on that tree overnight, the whole night, comes down in the day and helps him in the, in the, for the, whatever needs to be done in the house. At the end of the 13 days, the guy takes him back to uh, his fam her family and says, look, I really like her, she's a lovely woman, but she's not going to legitimate this marriage, so you have to talk to her. The family, the guy goes away, the family then talks to elders, try and convince her. She says, no, I want to continue at school, I'm not going to do this. 
after another 14 days, the father calls the, old, the, the man who was supposed to be her husband and says, okay, um, listen to what my daughter's saying. I'm listening to it. Um, she's right. I'm not going to offer her in marriage. She has to make that decision. I'm not going to let her, I'm not going to force any marriage on her. Um, it's important that I've heard what she's saying. And so this is just, a, a, for me, a, sorry, it took quite a long time, but I think it's a lovely story of the agency of these young girls who, given half a chance, will fight for their rights for a much, much brighter future. And it, for me, it just says so much. That is, that is a beautiful story. You don't remember her name, do you? Or we don't have your name. I do. It's Fakia Wusa. I know her name. Yeah. Fakia Wusa. Wusa. How do you pronounce the last name again? M U S A. Musa. Fakir yeah. Musa. Well, Fakir Musa, that is strength. That is. That, that is resilience. That yes. is strength. That is also that combination of tenacity and gentleness. Something that you know we talked on at the beginning. That's something about really holding on to what you believe. Um, and, and it's so tough. I mean, what you're doing right now is so tough. It's so difficult. Um, but there's something also just amazing about the resilience of people. Yeah, it, it's beautiful. I think your great grandmother would have uh, liked to have talked to Fakir because, uh, yeah, she would understand that. I mean, it's but also the beautiful thing that she was being helpful in the day. She wasn't saying just back off and that's it and goodbye you. She was, yeah, that was uh, yeah. that's a, a clever one. Her ambitions are to become a health uh, visitor, a, a health agent in the future. So uh, she was kind of driven to do something for her community down the line. Are well. you going to follow her story along? I'd love to. Yeah, I'd really love to. I think I did this when I was with UNICEF. I saw a little kid who was just about standing, just about surviving. And I said, that's what people want to know if they're giving. They want to hear about her story, hear that story, and then keep following that story. And if she can get to a good place, People would like to see that because then they'll say, well, we are doing, when we donate, we are doing something good and we can see that it's changing because there's an example. So. Yeah, yeah. All right, brilliant. Thank you, Helen. Real uh, pleasure. Take care. Nice to talk to you. Take care. I'm going to start Thank running you. again and, and I'm going to talk to Alison. All right. Cheers. Great. Thanks for talking. Bye. Bye. All righty. Oh. Eddie, do you want to do a quick, quick refuel? Uh, I'm okay, you can bring me the refuel. Let's, uh, let's uh, keep going, I'll, I'll, so I'm talking to Alison, and who's after Alison? Uh, I was just about to tell you, because um, there's quite a lot of information for this, but I'll let you read through it, and then I'll delete can, some bits. Can, you put, it, well, can you put it on Alison's line? 3 p.m. Alison, 3.30 p.m. whoever, yeah, 4 p.m. Do, do it up there. In two seconds. Um, and, uh, okay, and is it 3.30 or, or 4, just so I know, for the next one? Uh, one second. Do you have the list, sir? Uh, I'll pull it up. Yes. I just, just, I always know. Is it is the next one? Are they every half hour, every hour? Are you getting just checking in? Have you got a bit of leg pain? Uh, no. Three thirty no? is okay. after uh, three o'clock. And that is what. Uh, that is with Hugh Brazer, an event director of the London Marathon. Okay, very good. Um, okay. Uh, how should we do this? Okay, I'll ready. Is Alison ready to talk? Just getting her lined up. Okay. Okay. Hello. Hi there. Hi. Uh, how are you, Alison? Uh, I'm pretty good. Just waking up for the day. Oh yes. So which <laughs> which city are you in? Uh, the nearest city to me would be Kelowna, BC, which is in the interior of BC. But I live in a a small place called Oyama, um, just a a tiny little blip on the map. So you're. Your time zone is kind of Vancouver or Toronto or uh, Vancouver. We're Vancouver. in Vancouver. We're about four and a half hours from Vancouver, but oh, wow. um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, you're West Coast time. Gotcha. Yeah. Alrighty. Yeah. We're on West Coast time. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh -huh. 
I'm afraid I've got a lot of information about you, but I've been talking and, and I'm knackered. But can I, can I leave it to you? Your good okay. stuff. Yeah, but wait, tell us about I'll, yourself. Tell us about I'll fill you in. Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, a couple of years ago, I did a project about neighbours. Um, originally, I am from the UK and I, um, uh, I really appreciated my neighbours because, like, I don't have much family here and they would always help me out with, you know, runs to school, whatever you might need uh, to help. And so I did uh, a photography project where I interviewed my neighbours and, and asked them about what it, what it meant to be like a good community member and a good community support. And then uh, a year later, I really wanted to carry on that project. And then um, a year later, the pandemic hits and I'm like, you know what? This and, and no pun intended here at all. But um, I was, I was, uh, I was thinking. You know, this is going to be a marathon. It's not going to be a five k. Um, I think when we all went into it, we maybe thought that it was going to be like a, a two three month thing that was going to be happening. But I could see that it was it was going to be a long time, especially when we started saying that it was going to be eighteen months for a vaccine and and all of those types of things. So <clears throat> I came up with the idea of Voices of Hope. So kind of continuing on the idea from um, the Neighbours Project, but interviewing just ordinary folks and sharing their voices of hope and um, trying to make it relevant to the community as well. I, I think that folks like you and um, there's so many other inspirational people in the world that speak out, but I, I think it always is really great to hear from people that you know in the community or people who you can really relate to and, and have that relatability. So. Um, I did a ton of work on it, and then summer happened, didn't quite get around to, to finishing that off. Uh, but I, I, um, in November, I was like, you know, I think now is the time. I think, I think we need a little bit more hope in the world that things are gonna get better. So um, I launched um, the project live on my website and social media in November. Um, I've done seven voices so far, including my own. Um, I'm always on the lookout for more. Uh, but basically my process is that I, um, I'll i interview the person or they'll write a message of hope. I record that. Um, I was talking to one of your producers and they were kind of saying, uh, um, uh, I was talking about, you know, like why don't I video um, the people? But I find that as soon as you put people on video, as is happening to me now, uh, uh, that you kind of sometimes lose lose the words that you want to say. So I, I've found that just by recording the voices and taking the portraits, it's just been a little bit more authentic and they've been able to, to just really um, give it their all and really speak from the heart. Um, I found it a really, a really engaging experience and I'm so impressed by everybody that I meet and I'm just going to see where it goes and I try and do something scary each time that I'm not, I was kind of outside of my comfort zone, this is well outside of my comfort zone, but um, I feel like it's a good message to share and um, yeah, I just want to kind of keep going. So the project is called um, Voices of Hope yeah. um, and you can find it on Instagram on uh, voicesofhope.ca, um, but yeah, that's kind of the, that's the rundown. Yeah. It's, well, it's great because it's interesting. Uh, um, where, where in where in Britain were you from? Um, I was from Yorkshire. I grew up um, in and around the Bingley area. Right, because it's it's interesting when people say the word immigrant that's been very demonised by certain sections of uh, the, the political right. Basically, uh, you tend to think of a certain person, but you're an immigrant. You know, you're a British person who is an immigrant because you've gone to uh, to Canada, and and why was it that you went to Canada in the first place? What? Um, I, I would I'm gonna lay the uh, the blame squarely on my husband. He has um, some aunts and uncles that have lived in Canada since the '60s, so uh, we came out to visit. We we like the lifestyle where we like snowboarding, kayaking, being out being outdoors, and. Um, that was a process that took quite a long time. So we, we moved in 2008, but the process took about four four years, not four hours, four years. Um, but uh, we, yeah, we we wanted, yeah, we, we saw Canada as an opportunity to have more space. 
um, and uh, really just more of a rural feel, and uh, we definitely have that. So. And what year is it that you went out there? Two thousand and eight. Two thousand and eight, right? Yes, because yeah. I lived in Canada when, excuse me, for two months when I was a nine-year-old in nineteen seventy-one. I went to Lake Ontario, uh, Ontario State, just north of Belleville, which is to the east of Toronto. And we lived with a family. It was not long after my mum had died, so I had me and my brother had a great Canadian summer. And two months when you're nine is a long time, actually. So I can understand the things that attracted you to Canada. As we were fishing, we were swimming, playing around in, in, in big forests. Um, and they said there was skiing in the winter and all this kind of stuff. So, yeah. And it's, it's, yeah, it's a, it's, a be it's a beautiful country and, um, and so vast as well. Like it, it's, um, in some ways we've had uh, we do have that ability to kind of spread out a little bit more here and um, um, I can definitely relate with the swimming in the lake. Um, I've even been doing that in the winter as well. We've been doing some cold plunges uh, um, for uh, just in the, we've got lots of local lakes around where we live, so yeah. Well, it's great that you set this, uh, this up and, uh, and you're going to keep it going and you're going to be going into the future, yeah, I take it. It's a I, I, I think so. I, it's one of those things, like, I, I think um, definitely people, folks like you inspire me. Like, I, I was, again, I was telling the, uh, your producer about how um, I've listened to Believe Me quite a few times. Um, I really enjoy your footnotes on footnotes on footnotes. Yes. Uh, those were always really enjoyable. And um, I, uh, um, really inspiring me to just kind of always find that edge and always find the things that, pass that I'm passionate about and just see where it takes me. I hope that this does grow. I hope that I, you know, get to interact with people from around the globe and, and really start to elevate just um, regular people's voices. Like it doesn't have to be that it, it's, um, you know, Brene Brown or, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be someone who's uh, a large spokesperson to, to be able to provide hope. And, and I think we need to have more hope and less fear because we're we're always we're we're being constantly bombarded and um, you know it, it's not going to get any easier I don't think for the for the next little while so I love the work that you're doing the Run for Hope and all of the charities that you're um, you're supporting and and just even that essence of just thinking about how can we be more hopeful how can we be more um, positive. Uh, and, and thinking about the good things that are in the world and the good things that people are doing. Um, so I think the work that you're doing is amazing. Well, thank you so much. That's, that's very nice of you to say too. So I want to say well done to you, what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. I'll keep doing what I'm doing. And, and uh, hopefully we can gradually move humanity forward because um, in America it's having a tough time at the moment. But uh, Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, yeah, I just think, um, well, anyway, it's almost, it's, it's almost too difficult to talk about Trump because it, it's just gone to such, it was started in a ridiculous place and it's gone even further. So, huh, but that's, yeah. that should be open. They're talking about the 25th Amendment, being able to take him out of the, the situation just for two weeks because of the nightmare of him. Yeah, yeah anyway. I, I think there will definitely be some celebrations on the, on the 20th. Um, yeah, yeah I, I know that uh, there are lots of folks looking forward to that day. Yeah. All righty. Thank you, Alison. Good to talk to you. You take care. You. Yeah, you too. Have Bye. a good day. All right. Cheers. Oh, right. Now I'm going to go for a pee. I'm going to have a break. Uh, Having a quick break, full stop. Eddie, it's a message. Eddie message. Um, I think should we stop this?
It started with a box, and 2.8 million more just like it. Rations meant for war would now help those victimized by it. Passed from hand to hand, they moved together across land and sea, to a place where everything was broken, where everything had been lost. The box revealed its gift, food, survival, hope. The knowledge that someone somewhere far away wanted to help. Goodwill put into action, a world embraced, and yet only the beginning of the story. The need was bigger, deeper, more fundamental. It still is. A chronic absence of food and clean water. Hunger, starvation, desperation, sickness that racks young and old, mounting pressure on communities already in distress. The ones who can change the world for the better, stripped of their gifts, every path blocked, and seemingly no way out. But as understanding of the problems grew, our simple box changed. It now turned to the roots of suffering, to empower those at the brink, life flowing back into communities, nourishment sustained, the seeds of hope planted. Communities freed from sickness, the good building on the good, powering the engines of change. The future we will all share, built on a simple truth. That when you give of yourself, you can be the difference in people's lives. You can help deliver lasting change. Its colors are different. Its mission has grown, but it's the same care package. The simple box that gives us all the power to change the world for good.
Okay. Back running. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk to Hugh Abrasha at 3.30. He's the event uh, director of the London Marathon. His father was co-founder of the, the co-founder of the London Marathon, right? Helped Roger Bannister become first man to run sub four minute mile. He was the pacer, wow. That was his dad. Yeah, the pace is great. That's quite a piece of footage. Go, go on YouTube and you should be able to see that. Roger Bannison breaking the four minute mile. Um, he's worked at every London Marathon since 1981. And he worked on the very first one in 81. Uh, except in 20, 2005 when he was riding his motorbike from London to Cape Town. Wow, there you go. So we're going to talk to him at half past the hour. Half past the hour, then at four o'clock, talk to a comedian from, from Greece, I think from Athens. We'll ask George about that. George Zakharopoulos. George Zakharopoulos. Oh. Oh. So, broken. 21k, but now we have to, we have to uh, get it down, get it up to breaking 30k, so we're over halfway, but uh, be good, once you get to 32, that's the last 10k, and all that stuff. Uh, So Clive Finnemore is back with me, and Clive, Emily, Clive Finnemore, Chris, Chris is running for autism, it's old Todd, Adam Koffler, who has uh, been up many days as, as, as Clive, John Mastin, Emily Bolshaw, uh, Andrew Cutmore, Andrew Van Hook, from Netherlands, I do believe that is your flag. And I've just been out a number of days. Michelle Young and Chris Sussex skis are also, but in Canada, you can know your Sussex skis. You like kind of a Sussex skis. So Tens Rift is nearby, middle of the road. More people tend to come later in the day. If you download the Zwift app, if you have a treadmill, you can ping, zinc it up, zinc it up, zinc it up even. And, uh, and you can come run with me if you wish. I'd like to interact with people more, but it's a little tricky when running. Oh. So guys, Dave, I'm at Ian, will, will I be talking to Hugh at 3.30? Keep me posted. Yep, that's the plan. Just get my knowledge. Okay. Oh. Hi, Eddie. Hi. Uh, we're just getting uh, Hugh onto Zoom. Once Hugh's there, we'll uh, get through. I realised Dave told you the exact same thing and I wasn't listening, so my apologies. So again. Oh. <laughs> 
asked about questions? Have a little look, Kevin. See if I had any still lined up that we didn't do earlier. Yeah. Oh, here's, here's an interesting one. Angela Lamb said, um, Would you ever do celebrity portrait artists and be on the other side of the canvas? I.e., would you be the artist drawing? I wouldn't because you've got to be really good. They, they it's a competition, so you couldn't choose to be on. You'd have to go through a, a, a heat to get through and get chosen. So mine wouldn't be good enough, I'm afraid. Uh, I think, I do believe if you know the center of your creativity, which is the stomach, but if you know, which is, it sounds a weird line, but you've got to understand where that comes from. If you do more than one creative thing, you can sort of work out where it is, but then you can apply it to other things. So I could get better at drawing and painting. Uh, Churchill. You know, he did painting, and he was obviously an amateur, amateur all his life, but I believe his work did get better. I said, you know, it would if you keep working on things. But no, so I wouldn't uh, put myself forward for that. Two thousand and four, where Paula Radcliffe sadly didn't have a great um, experience. Um, with the Olympics, but um, other than that, you're on, um, now. Um, you're on now. Oh, you're on. Hi, hi, Eddie. Hi, Hugh. We've come in, in mid thing. You sounded like a, a TV broadcaster. What, what were you talking about just then? Just talking about Paula Radcliffe's run in Athens in 2004. And right, and remind, right, because we only heard half of the, all the last bit of what you said. What was. So. Yeah, I mean, Paula was obviously, I mean, you know, one of the greatest marathon runners in the world. Um, and she uh, went to the Athens uh, Olympics in 2004 as, as the favourite. I mean, she'd smashed the world record in the London Marathon in 2003, run that unbelievable two hours and 15 minutes. But sadly, she was very ill and didn't realise how ill she was. And in the heat of Athens, um, she still finished, but uh, I think she still finished. But uh, her performance was so far down on uh, on what she wanted. So, so um, I've never run it in Athens, but I just know that the heat. I was there at the time, and uh, um, yeah, just a, a, a big disappointment for her. But her career obviously was quite incredible. Yes, yes. So, is she still the world the women's record holder? No, that got beaten in Chicago. Um, by Bridget Koskai the day after um, Iliad Kipchoge ran under two hours for the marathon. All oh, right. Um, so Bridget has taken her um, uh, her um, uh, her overall record. I think she's still the world record holder for the women's only event. However, okay. um, so yeah. Um, Just want to say, by the way, I'm a massive fan of yours. Thank um, you. And I've seen your comedy back about even I think. 30, 35 years ago. Oh, um, wow. Uh, so, Hang on, one of, well, I think one of your early, early gigs. It could have been 30 years ago. I started in 88. So if anyone saw from 8, and I came out as trans, transgender in 85, so, uh, so it'll be 32 years. Yeah, if any, you could have seen the very early gigs in a club in London. It, you... it was a club in London. It was a, well, this was a, I can't remember the name of the club. I was trying to look it up. It was a big club that had, um, they were trying to um, renovate and had lots of comedy there as a result of trying to renovate it. And I just remember you coming on and talking about your upbringing with wolves. Ah, and it, it, it just was one of the most joyous, um, whimsical, uh, amazing comedy. You know, it was, it was enlightening. I, I mean, no one, no one was doing comedy like that then sure they are now so it's just well, fantastic and it's, you know been at various other one of your gigs over time this is an interesting point here we're going to talk a little bit about me now and then we'll just talk about you because uh the uh i thought i was doing stand-up like uh, uh, quite a lot of people were doing 
or you know half no, it's not half maybe a third of the because some people were political and some people were purely observational and you know I was very inspired by Monty Python so I thought what I was doing was uh, kind of standard and there are a number of number of very good surreal comedians so they are out there but there's probably less of it than I actually thought and in mm. other countries they hardly do it at all interestingly yeah. um because yeah. I've, I've hooked up and uh champion or want try to encourage slash champion slash, uh, whatever the word is uh with other comedians in different countries in france and and what in other countries around europe to uh, uh, where there are scenes where surreal c comedians are not even sort of allowed not allowed but they just no one's ever hit big as surreal. they didn't have a monty python so if you start saying i've got a cat and he has a gun and he forces me every night to give him cat food and we argue about it and, and he goes wah, wah, wah. i go well it's not good for you but you, you have no personal stuff you know i do whatever that and if they do that in french i think then the for a long time, the French audience is going, what are you doing? Monty Python is, it happens in England, but not here. But uh, it, uh, it's now growing this, this star, but it's, you know, I just, I've said this to the Monty Python troupe. I've essentially totally influenced slash stolen what they did, or the, their style of what they did. But they didn't stand up, but they, they weren't sketch and I am stand up. So the narrator part of me talking to the audience is not part of them, but I do love it. So thank yeah. you, that was my first breakout piece, as they call it. That's uh, Hysteria 3 Benefit, where I did at uh, the Palladium, London Palladium. Yeah, that was where and, the... and, and also, I, I mean, just talking about um, language there, and, and um, always, always remember uh, the songe et dans l'arbre. Yeah. And um, how, in, I think it was fairly early in your journey into... Um, sort of French and, and the French comedy scene and, and going to a gig, I think you did in the National Theatre, where it was probably, it was for a British audience, but probably 80% of it was in French. Um, 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 uh, you, you, saw that, uh, you saw a film of that or you were at that gig? I was at that gig. Was it in London or in, in France? In, it was in London. That was the amazing thing. You did most of it in French in London. I, pre I you, thought it was the National Theatre. Well, you're, you're, you're uh, not the Olympics. It wasn't the Coubertin lecture. No, it wasn't that. No, no, no. no. It was, it, we're, we're talking probably now 20, 20 years ago. Oh, well, that's... Hmm. So you hadn't gone into France at that stage. Yeah. But you were on the journey of... of doing more and more French stuff. And, I, and it was just incredible to go to a gig in Britain. Right. And I don't speak French, but I, you know, I did O-level French, but being able to understand um, just again, the whimsical nature of it and, and just coming out of it, being amazed and educated and um, having had an amazing evening, even though probably I hadn't understood 25% oh, of it. it. It could be that the Serge it don't love or the Sage sur la branche bit because I did that twice. I did a remix of it. My French teacher caught up with me and said, "It's not le Sage don't love because it's from a French exercise book because that means the monkey is inside the tree. It was the le Sage sur la branche on the branch, and so I changed that and I changed some other bits in it, and uh, and it was part of an English gig." But the, the bit in French was about 10 to 15 minutes long. But I, right. but I, I explained, I said, you have to go, because I had, the, these are the first lines I learned. The, uh, le, le sour, la souris est au-dessus de la table, it's on top of the table. Uh, le chien est près de la chaise, the dog is near the chair. And it was all this stuff. And the monkey yeah. is on the branch. And I said, how do you get that in a conversation? And in the end, I had to go to France with a cat, a dog, a monkey, a table, a chair, and we stood in a forest waiting for someone to come up. And that was the beautiful bit. So I was sitting there just, you know, sort of drumming my fingers and then a guy comes up and goes, ah, bonjour, bonjour, ah, bonjour, bonjour. Uh, comme ça, le temps fait beau, the weather is good. I will, so, mais, la souris. And that was the thing, and that one it took, kind of, you know, it became quite a big piece. But yeah. since, since then, I've done entire gigs, of course, in France, but in London, 
and all around the country. I do, I do these 333 gigs in French, German, and English, and uh, three shows in three hours in three languages. And, uh, wow. and I've done them in major cities all around the UK and in America and in Caen as a uh, commemoration of the fallen in the Second World War and a celebration of the peace that we have got since then. So um, I keep trying to do that, to make connections. At the time of some people want to break connections, I want to make even stronger connections than before. So that's what I do. Yeah. But now let's tell us about you. So your, your dad, your dad was the, the guy with your dad was a pacemaker with Roger Ballister. Tell me about that, because I've seen that footage. It's so exciting. Yeah, he was the pacemaker along with Chris Chataway when Sir Roger Ballister broke four minutes for the mile back in 1954. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's one of those stories that uh, people thought at that stage it was physiologically impossible yeah. to run under, under four minutes for a mile. Um, and... Uh, uh, Roger was this most amazingly talented uh, athlete and um, uh, my, my dad sort of um, uh, was great mates with Roger and did, did the pacemaking they had an amazing running coach a guy called Frank, Frank Stamfel who was an Austrian who had been um, uh, torpedoed and ended up in the North Sea, I think, in, 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 in the Second World War and made his in character. He was their coach and um, as a triumvirate, they, they each were in, incredible individuals. My father, Chris Chataway, and, and, and Roger, and you, you look at what they achieved in their lives, um, uh, was, was quite incredible outside sport. Um, and, and yet they were world record holders, or in the case of my old man, Later on, he became an Olympic gold medalist. Um, Beautiful. And yeah, it was um, yeah a day at Italy Road, and and the wind was blowing terribly, and sort of almost the gods smiled on them. The wind suddenly dropped at the time of um, uh, of, of of the race being run, and my old man did the first two laps, and um, uh, basically Roger was shouting at him, telling him to go faster. Um, my old man was very very stubborn. Um, was ignoring Roger um, totally, but actually said he couldn't have gone any faster anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, Roger just did this incredible feat and, and did something that, that people thought was physiologically impossible. Uh, but that probably drove my father to his Olympic gold medal success because he didn't want to be known really on the back of what someone else had achieved, which yeah. Roger, you know, was, was the man that did that. And um, uh, two years later, he, he um, even though he was only the third Brits Britain in the Olympic final, he um, he he won the, the Olympic Games in in Melbourne in 1956 and got gold medal. Was that the 100 meters? No, it was steeplechase, 3,000 meter steeplechase. Wow, that's a um, toughie. Well, they're all tough, but yeah, that sounds like a toughie to me. Huh. Yeah. Brilliant. And um, well, well done to your dad. Well done to the gold medal. Uh, he used to, is, your, is your dad still with us? No, sadly, he um, he died in 2003, pancreatic cancer, so uh, one of those terrible diseases in terms of people raising money. Um, you know, if you get pancreatic cancer, sadly, the, your life prognosis is is very short, and and um, uh, the the research at the moment is is ongoing into to trying to find a find a um, to to help that and find find a cure as as there is in so many. Um, uh, cases of cancer, but uh, no, he was, you know, full of life. Um, he was 74 at the time and only six months beforehand. He was planning to go ice climbing uh, in the Indian Kush on some mountains that hadn't been climbed since 1928 or something. Wow. And he was age, he was age 74. So he, he, he knew how to um, uh, sort of have fun and push himself. Yes, indeed. Well, salute to him. Salute to him. A, a strong life. Now, tell us about the London Marathon. So, how did you come to get linked to that? You were there right at the beginning, yeah? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, the story of the marathon, I think few people know it. It's, it's my father and John Disley um, went to the New York Marathon in 1979, and um, they'd been in a pub in, um, uh, in Richmond called the Dysart Arms, and they're 
fellow club runners had come back from from New York and saying, you know, they, they had to go and they'd been and seen this amazing, they'd been in this amazing race and uh, run and, and humanity, people coming together in this mad quest that you're on at the moment. I mean, you're doing a slightly madder one, but 26.2 miles and the support of the crowds and, and that this, you know, what then was the gun crime capital city of the world um, was coming together on this amazing day and supporting people on this journey of 26.2 miles. And it, it, my father hated running on the streets. He loved it in the mountains. Um, he loved getting out into the, the fresh air, but he sort of, he wrote a famous piece in The Observer and uh, sort of said he'd had an epiphany like Saul on the road to, to Damascus. And, um, uh, and he, he, he said at the end of the piece, he knows that London had the course because John Disley knew the course, um, but did London have the heart and the soul to welcome the world? And I think that, you know, 18 months later of, after um, that, that article written in October um, 79, the first London Marathon that happened in, in March 1981. Um, and uh, here we are 40 years uh, later in 2021, and um, now over a million everyday normal people have, have taken that incredible journey, raised over a billion pounds um, for good causes, and. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm now the event director, and it is uh, an incredibly, uh, you know, lucky position to be in, and um, to, to be doing a job that you love because you're inspiring people to to take up activity and do something that's so good for their physical and mental health is just a lovely, lovely thing to be to, to be able to do, and it really isn't a job; it's a passion, and, and I love it. Now tell everyone in the world who is listening to us. Well, the millions and millions of people, oh, maybe not right now, but they can listen to it on back. But what what did you do last in, in the COVID 2020 for the London Marathon? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been an unbelievable time for the world. And, um, you know, I think your message of unity is, is the message that we need now more than ever, because we're being forced apart from our loved ones, um, from our friends, from, from our work colleagues. Um, in, you know, uh, we, we can't really travel. Um, and um, so, you know, what, what the marathon is, is doing is, is, is bringing people together. And what we did in, in 2020 was we still um, held uh, an elite race for the best athletes in the world in a COVID secure environment. So they ran 19 and a half laps of St. James's Park. Um, and while that was going on, even more incredibly, 39,000 people ran the London Marathon their way from their home. Some people doing it on treadmills, um, but we sent their running number out and um, it was an incredible day. The BBC were covering it for eight hours and 20 minutes um, where, where people did the, the 40th race. This was then the 40th London Marathon. They did it their way. Um, in a, in a way that was appropriate for the world that we were in at that time. And um, it was a world record number of people doing it. Still, we think over probably 45 million pounds was raised for good causes. We don't know at the moment, we're still doing, looking at, at the data, but um, for people to take that challenge and do it differently um, was again, just so inspiring. It's those stories of everyday people who like you of, of um, Sort of taken taken this to their heart and is is just um, uh, yeah it, it, it's great to 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 be able to have said that's what we did in in 2020. We really hope in October the third, 2021, we can get back together, um, running from Greenwich to Westminster, and people can experience that unity and that community spirit, um, and get cheered every step of the way. And we really hope on the third of October, uh, 2021, that's what will happen. Do you, that, that's great, it's great that you got that done and, and, and well done to you, because it's, uh, this is what we're doing. We just, we were planning this when everything was opening up and, and then uh, campaign manager, Kevin Carhill, used to be uh, sports, uh, sport relief, had sport relief and comic relief, and he, he said, look, this is gonna go backwards. We've got a plan for being inside. 
And I suddenly thought, yes, that, that will happen. We might as assume it's going to happen, and so we better get this going. So this has been, we planned to do this in the minimal way that we could. And then we could link up to people like your good self and anyone around the world. And we're going to talk to George uh, Zakharopoulos, who's a comedian from Athens, from, uh, from Greece. I believe he's from Athens, but he's definitely from Greece. Greek uh, uh, stand up next. And we can talk to people every half hour, we can talk to different people. Uh, and, I sh and then do a gig afterwards, which is the weird thing. The gig afterwards is, ah, oh, that's a bit bonkers. But <laughs> I. Uh, but yeah, I had, it's it's, gr it's great to see you to see you doing it, um, and 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 it must be. I mean, it, it looks very dark. Yeah. It, it, where, where you are, is it very dark? Well, it is. I don't know if we can. Can you catch the other camera? There, you can see. A ca um, that's what it is like outside. The sun yeah. is going down. What we have sunset in a, in about full 15, 20 minutes. Um, we have the windows open so that the air can circulate. Uh, COVID safe way. There's barriers outside so no one can get in. Uh, people wave through the window and they can donate. Uh, so we know what temperature, what, what time it is out there. Well, I know what yeah. time it is here, but I'm trying to get finished by six o'clock. But this, talking to people like yourself, is, is the lifeline. Because do, you, do you run marathons? I take it you've done yeah. some, if not all. Yeah, I've, I've, I've done a few, and I, I have to say, the thought of doing 31 consecutively, I mean, I, I would struggle to do two consecutively, just what it takes out of me, and, and that's why I think it's in, incredible the, the, you know, the mental challenge, let alone, I mean, the physical one's huge, but again, the mental one to, to have the fortitude to, to do what you're doing. Well, um, there's that, but imagine it really? on the same treadmill. Uh, it's, you know, outdoors, at least you've got this, and ah, there's a cat, there's a dog, there's a sunset, there's a this. And I've just got a machine wrapped around me. So I find that very tough. If yeah. I don't have this, I did find when I was training for this, that if I talk to all the, the MHG, the Make You Man's Great team together on uh, Zoom conference call thing, uh, and I, I, the kilometers went by. But if I do it, if you just try and, if you imagine doing it with no stimulus, it would be too hard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, do, do you use music at times as well? No, music's not good. Music yeah. It doesn't work. I thought it would. Before I planned my, did my first 43 marathons in 2009, I thought I had all these, these, uh, powering songs boom, that were going to drive me along and uh, born to run and yeah. no it's it's not that's not good it just doesn't work for me uh, podcast yeah. if I'm outdoors I, I will listen to podcast or I will phone someone up if I need to get my mind out of where I am but if you're running around uh, a, a roads and B roads you need to hear everything you need to hear that traffic it's too dangerous uh, so I always had I listened to absolutely nothing, and I became mm. one with the street. The road was my road, as it is everyone's road, everyone's mm. country, everyone's highway to run on. It's people's highway, so you can uh, run down, and I always had a little flag with me, and I was running into traffic, which is the way the highway code said. So you could see them, I could wave the flag, and they pull out. 98% of cars at lorries pulled out, 2% decided to try and hit me. Uh, wow. Well, I, mean, I don't know if they tried to hit me, but they just didn't seem to move. But, uh, but they could have been adjusting things. They could have been putting something into the microwave in their car. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, yeah. And I think I'm right in saying you've never yet run the London Marathon, have you? No, I have run absolutely zero organized marathons. I have not Ooh. run one. And I, I did. I have done a couple of triathlons. Um, but if it was anything in this country, people would know me, or where I was known, be somewhat known in American cities as well. And uh, I would find it hard because they, people would go, you're the running guy, go on, go on, 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 on. But I don't have great speed, I have great endurance. So my speed, you know, six hour marathon, and you all know that's not fast, the world record is, now is that a world record? The gentleman's run the two, Hour one or not? Not yet. It's not real. Official. No, it's 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 not official. But he's still the fastest. I think his the record is two hours one minute and thirty nine seconds. It's Eliot Kipchoge. Right. 
he will beat it soon, I would assume, or someone will. You know, it can't, yeah. it's like the four minute mile. It will go. But, yeah. um, but I can't, you know, I'm three times as long. But, and then I'm doing a gig afterwards. So that's the way, because I need to do stuff that, I think what I have is an ordinary person uh, look about me. Some mm. people look amazing and you think, ah, they're doing amazing things. Well, they look pretty amazing. Ah, that's, that goes together. I kind of mm. look ordinary. And then I do, if I do something that's punching out of my comfort zone, then people go, really? You know, that's what they, that's what it's since, since when I ran around the UK, South Africa, the beauty of 27 marathons in South Africa, which I failed the first time and succeeded the second time. Uh, double marathon on the last day. If you, yeah, well, you put, you know, there's ultra marathons, people have run very long distances. So people have run longer than me, more marathons than me, but uh, I try and link the social media up so that we can raise some money, do some good. And, uh, and, I, and I'm doing this sort of six hour podcast every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I have to say, it is the, it is the fact that, that you are like exactly, I mean, you're not the everyday person, but you look like the everyday person. And that's the bit that, that's where the London Marathon has inspired so many people because yeah. people, on, people go, well, I'm gone. I, I look like that, yes. so they're doing this. Why can't I do it? Exactly. And that's that's the brilliant um, that's that's the brilliant thing about about seeing 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 what you're doing at, at the moment. And I have to say, I mean, you know, I, I travelled to South Africa a few times, and I think it is one of the most beautiful um, look, you know, countries. I'm, I'm not, not their politics, but um, uh, their their country is just the people. Um, are incredible, and um, yeah, that must have been an, a, a, an amazing experience going through that countryside and um, seeing 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 it in that way. Well, it absolutely was because of, uh, and especially failing once and then succeeding the next time was beautiful. And it was tracking the life of Nelson Mandela, which was a great. I never thought I did enough for him uh, when I could have. I didn't eat South African fruit. That was it. I thought that I, I really didn't do enough. I wasn't right. activated enough. I wasn't, uh, but I did have the. I did stuff for his charity, four double six, uh, four triple six four charity, and I and I, I met him after Neil Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong was walking out, and I was walking in. If you can believe that as a cue, <laughs> brilliant. And I, I didn't know. Otherwise, I'd have said Neil. Uh, oh, you don't know me? No, forget it. No, you. I mean, I was there. I was a kid. I was seven. I was in Bishop Stortford, and you, and you took. Uh, oh, excellent. Well done, mate. Um, <laughs> what's he like? What's Nelson like? Ch chatty, not chatty. I could have had a conversation. I have this imaginary conversation with Neil also, <laughs> which, uh, which I do. Which, which, I which year was this? What then, year was that? Sarah, do you remember that? With that? Which year? Well, I saw Nelson Mandela. I think that 2010. was 2010. Yeah, it was 2010. 2010. Was, was it? Wow. Because that was the year South Africa then also won the World Cup in rugby, I think. Was that 2010? No, I think they'd won that before. Yes. Or was it? He was retired from being president. He was president okay. when he won. So the they, first time, yeah. it, was, it would have been earlier. But he'd stopped meeting people. He had stopped it. Right. And then he restarted it. And I was yeah. in the queue after Neil Armstrong to say hi. And, and he was... He was just great. Who are you? And so tell me about this. And who is this thing? And you have a relationship? Who is this person? They're outside. I want to meet them. Bring them in here. My partner, she was outside and doing the filming. And she hadn't come in. And then the me I never asked her this. The message came out. Nelson Mandela was, wants to see you. But, uh, yeah, so it was, uh, it was great because his energy, you know, Running marathons for, in his name. We got to stay. We got to. I got to lie down in his cell. And it it in, in on Riker Island. Uh, it was on um, Riker Island, New York. It's uh, it's uh, Robin Island. Robin Island. Oh, that's the one. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. It's, yeah. I've been there as well. It's unbelievable, yeah. isn't it? So it's amazing. So imagine lying, they they let me lie down in there, and I wow. ran. I ran about two and a half circuits of Robin <laughs> Island to to do a marathon on Robin Island. Um, Did you? Yes. Wow. Yeah. So, I've done. I've I had amazing. They, 
they gave me amazing uh, uh, opportunities. When uh, the, the prison that he was released from, I think it's possible, I, don't know, I think maybe that's wrong, but the one he was released from, and he, and he came out and he had his hand in the air, 1990. I watched it live on television. We were, I finished at that prison on one marathon, and uh, then they said, would you like to see the house in which he was imprisoned in? Now, in the last few years, he was, you know, he's in prison for 27 years, but the last, I think, couple of years, year, maybe a couple of years, they put him under house arrest. So they put him into this prison, had been a farm with a lot of area, and they built, they bought the farm, and they, they built the prison, and the farmhouse just sat there. And then they said, okay, so he's a very important person who we didn't like, what we hated, and now we just, and now we're probably going to release him, so let's give him the freedom of that. They bugged the entire place, but uh, the apartheid regime, but he was in there on his own, but it was obviously a better situation, so we, we were shown that. No one's really seen that. That's yeah. us. They, they, they need to turn into a tourist attraction, because it was quite a thing to sit in the seats where he sat. And, uh, and I tried to do the, the marathon in 2012, and failed, got rhabdomyolysis and uh, had to stop, and he was alive then. And by the time we uh, restarted in 2016, he unfortunately passed away, but we got it done. Yeah. And, uh, and that was a double marathon on the last day. It was tough as all hell. Yeah. And, uh, and when, when you met him, I mean, he, he seems to exude this amazing positive energy. Is, is that what came from him? Yeah, as someone I have a lot of, I hopefully have a lot of positive energy. And I reckon that he was just, hello, come in, let's uh, sit down and let us talk. So, I, now I met the Queen of England. The Queen of England, he'd always call the Queen of England, call Elizabeth. And of course, if you call any member of royalty by their first name, you're supposed to explode and shoot yourself in the head. But he had the temerity to call it, you know, I think, why not? Yeah. Yeah. This is the thing, royals have got to get beyond all this stuff with hats and, and capes and shit and just say, yes, it's Elizabeth, and it's, it's Charles, and it's William. It's, it's, and I think the younger generation is so much more a favor with that. But, yeah. uh, so, and the Queen of the Netherlands as well, he talked to, and, and uh, we just had a good chat, and he didn't really know where I'd come from, but he knew that I'd been selected by his assistant, who was an Afri young Afrikaans woman who'd worked with him since, she, since he became president, and she's written a book about that, uh, yeah. a time with him. Uh, I think it's Good Morning, Mr. President, and it's, it's a great book, but it's, he wanted to work with Afrikaans. He learned Afrikaans when he was in uh, prison in order to talk the language to the people who were oppressing him in the language, in their language, so that he could get through to their hearts as opposed to their minds. So he was a great soul. It's incredible to think that that's then he, he learned that lang language to do that. I mean, yeah. to, when, when you think about that, that yes, someone that's oppressing you, yet you have the humanity to yeah. be able to do that is unbelievable. It's a, it's a very wise thing to do, and uh, he was a great soul, a great soul and a great, great heart, a wise person. Down the years, there have been wise men and wise women. In the olden days, we said they were religious gods. Um, I think that's it. The people, because I'm not, I'm not a religious person. I believe in humanity. And that is my, what I will fight for. And I'm spiritual, I try to be spiritual with connection with all of us, but I'm not sure about the guy upstairs. But I think down the ages we've had wise men and women who have done great things, but the women have all been written out of history and more of the men have survived. Uh, but now the women are being written into history, which is good. So, yeah. so yeah. <laughs> And do you mind, in, in terms of other, I mean, Nelson Mandela is just is one of those, um, just such an iconic figure. Are, are there other incredible people that really have left a, a sort of lasting mark on you that you've met? I think politically, he's probably up there and out there. Um, that's such an icon. I, I feel, because I want to be in politics, I want to be a member of parliament. And, and, and in one hand, I, th I think of... Nelson Mandela, on the other hand, I think of Abraham Lincoln, but of course I could never meet him. But uh, I've met some amazing creative people in my work as an actor and a comedian, so that's, that's beautiful. Doing the oceans, 
12 and 13 movies and hanging out with those guys in George and Brad, that's, that's quite out there. Yeah. And, uh, but George Clooney, very, it's very positive soul and a very nice guy. And so I like his style. I remember watching George behave to everyone. And I thought, I, I want to do what George is doing. Yeah. So he was just so <laughs> welcoming and inclusive as opposed to, you know, he does not push away. Judy Dench, you know, fantastic Judy Dench. And now Judy Well, and she's, she's like that as well. She wants to uh, interact and say hi. And, have a yeah. ch chocolate hot knob. Uh, the, the only time I've um, interaction I've had with them is via the Graham Norton show, but I, they both come across as incredibly um, engaging. Yeah. Um, uh, and and uh, George Clooney seems to uh, have this brilliant sense of humour and loving playing pranks and stuff like that. And he was on it recently talking about his kids and how he's um. Uh, his what his wife is is the one that's turning them into these model kids, and he's the one that's trying to slightly mess with their heads and make sure that they uh, they they, uh, they have the right sense of humour and all of those things. It just seems an incredible. Uh, I mean, that, that they as a partnership, um, Amal and, and and him just seem uh, a, a, an amazing couple, and yeah, he seems an incredible soul as well. Yes, yes, there are some good positive people who are making humanity great again out there. So. But now, George, uh, I've got to say goodbye to you uh, because I can talk to George in, in, in Greece. Thank you so much for being here and talking to us. Keep doing what you're doing because it's beautiful London Marathon. One day, I probably have to do the London Marathon, but I'll scare everyone. Everyone's going to say, go faster, Eddie. And I'll go, I haven't got faster. But you have to come and do it, Eddie. And uh, thank you for everything that you're doing. And it's been lovely chatting with you. Great chatting with you. Take care. Take Right, I am five minutes late for George, but I'm ready to talk to him if he's ready. So George, a Greek comedian born in Greece, uh, recently moved to the UK. George is a UK, Europe and uh, Australia comedy club favourite, appearing on BBC One, Sky, also supported uh, Louisa on, oh, sorry, my eyes. Here you go. Um, that's Louisa Omelan. Louisa Omelan. Louisa Omelan. Sorry, Louisa. It's it's my I've got one lens in this, and it's it's for reading up close. Uh, live at the Apollo, Larry Dean Edinburgh Festival Award nominee, uh, and live at the Apollo performer Sophie Willen, uh, Edinburgh Festival Award nominee on tour. Okay, so been out on tour. Well, that's great because I do encourage people from all around the world, so he's obviously performing in English um, and, and can perform in Greek. We have mentioned at 4.30 we have YouTube questions as well. Yes, just YouTube that. questions. Get ready for 4.30 YouTube questions. Um, go on YouTube, get on my site, Eddie Izzard, on YouTube, and, and you can ask me questions from YouTube at 4.30 until 5. <sighs> Eddie, here's George. Hi, George. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm all right. How are you? I am very good, thank you. Now, I've, I've been saying you're from Athens, but you may not be from Athens. Which city are you from? I am from a place called Kalamata, which is... Um, have you had olives? I have had I have difficult time with olives, but I know they're good for me and I should eat more. But yes, I have eaten yes. olives. Well, we make the best olives in the world, really. Ah. Uh, I'm, not bragging, I'm not bragging, but that's one thing we can do. Okay, now I've basically got your jug over here. I've got Athens here. Yeah. I've got Crete down here, I've got Sparta over here, I've got Macedonia, and it's sort of an ancient Greece map with modern stuff. So where are you in that map? What are you closer to? So, hang on, you put, you put Crete next to Athens, did you? No, Crete's at the bottom, Athens, yeah. in, the, uh, Athens yeah. in the center, I'm just doing that. Yeah. Sparta out to the left. Sparta, Sparta is south, it's between Athens and Crete. Oh, is it? It's further down south, okay. Yeah, to the mainland, and I am maybe on the west of Sparta by maybe an hour. Okay, okay, because I've done a film down in Kiparisi, a place called Kiparisi. I filmed in Kiparisi. But, oh, I'm like 45 minutes away from there. Well, there's a film, oh, called, there's a film yeah. called um, all, uh, uh, The Cat's Meow. The Cat's That's Meow. Me. And it's a film and I play, I play Charlie Chaplin. If you, if you Google it, you can probably download it. It's a good film. It's an under, I say it to anyone out there. You don't have to, but it's a, but it's shot mainly in Kiparisi, doubling for um, 
for LA, for the for the for the coast of LA, um, yeah. down there because uh, that kind of the topography on LA, mm -hmm. and it's all these rich Hollywood people hanging out on a boat, and and the countryside there in, in LA and just south of LA looks kind of similar to what it does in in Cape Breezy. So that's we were there for two or three weeks. That is very amazing because um, that town that you went to is like a tiny, tiny, tiny place. Yes. It's like a, practically a village. And then Eddie Isaac was walking around, shooting a film, pretending it's Los Angeles. And it's so surreal. It's like, if I ever told you that um, uh, I went to like a sale outside Manchester and pretended it was like Melbourne. Like that is as weird as it sounds. Like, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny place. I, I noticed it because some people went by boat to get there from Athens because we were based in yeah. Athens and we decided to go by car but we had a slightly better time of it but uh, but the car road the car track was like this it was it yes. was way out of the way yeah dodgy roads <laughs> yes yes indeed so we, now we are not we're not known for our infrastructure <laughs> okie dokie now tell me um, yes I'm very I, I you know I you probably know I do stand up in French and Spanish and, and German, uh -huh. so I'm, I'm very encouraging people to do it in other languages. There's more of yeah. an incentive to do it in English, I feel, because you'll probably know that because you do stand up in English, mm -hmm. you can do it in America, Canada, Australia, and you mm -hmm. can probably tour around the world. When did you realize this? Did you choose to learn English because of that? When did you start coming over and doing stuff in the UK? Well, actually, it's a bit of a different story for me because I came to Newcastle to study biochemistry ah. in. Uh, 2001, right. and then I stayed, and then I stayed. So I didn't have any idea about stand-up comedy at all until maybe 09 when I heard about George Carlin passing away, right. and um, and I went on YouTube to see who George Carlin is, and there was a man talking to 3,000 people being hilarious, and I was like, I want to do this in my life. This is amazing. So I was already here. So all the comedy I've written was written in English, not never in Greek. Oh. So for me, it was. A, for me, it was a challenge to do it in Greek for the first time because I went back, and as you know, you have to adjust for the language and the changes. And it, even though it, the joke is the same, it has to be reworked so the the poetry works, right? It's the poetry. It's also the references. If you happen yes. to be talking about people on British television, British uh, goods in the shops. British yes. politicians, that all doesn't uh -huh. work. So you probably, I don't know whether you're already doing this. I, for 20, 25 years now, I've tried to block out any comedy that won't work everywhere. So mm -hmm. human sacrifice, you talk about human sacrifice, everyone gets it. Talk about sex, everyone gets it. A cheerful subject. I know, human sacrifice, haircuts, uh, <laughs> run, running, going for a run, swimming, playing the banjo. Religion, yes. everyone gets all of that. You get very specific mm -hmm. and they can, they can go, well, I don't know what you're talking about there. Yeah. And it is, it is uh, the, one of the great follies of um, English comedians when they come to Europe and they gig and they start talking about Croydon to a, an audience in Brussels yeah. and they're not laughing and they're like, I don't get it, it works every time. You're like, no one knows about Croydon, mate, you're in Brussels. <laughs> yes, that is the problem. And you, but you've done your stand up in Greek back in Greece? Yeah, I, I have gone back a few times now, and I've done it in Greek. Um, it is it's very it's very scary because yeah. um, I never realized that doing it in English was like a like there was a sort of a, a defense for me because it wasn't my language. Right. And then suddenly that that uh, excuse of the accent and whatever goes away. Yeah. And it's just you. If you feel more naked than ever. Yes. Plus, yes. Um, your parents are the audience, and they can understand you now. Um, and where, <laughs> extra scary. Where did you do the gigs? I did them in Athens. Uh, yeah. I did a couple in my hometown, and they were absolutely horrific in their setup. I did it in a cafe, and it was a uh, free entry, so oh. people were coming and going. Oh. You know what it's like, right? Yeah, not good. It was, it was like a very bad uh, fringe show, and uh, my parents were there, and bless them, they were very supportive, even though I know it had been an absolute horror. And. Uh, is, can you tell me, this is something I've been wanting to know particularly about uh, Greece for a long time. Is there a growing stand-up scene? Is there a small scene? Is it getting bigger? What, is it a good scene? How, how, other people doing it? Or what's, what's happening out there? Or can you not tell because you're not plugged into it so much? No, no, like uh, because of the uh, uh, coronavirus, 
I went back to uh, Kalamata in June, and I only returned in November. So I've been there for six months now. Right. The, the, the longest I've ever been in Greece since uh, 2001. And um, I went to Athens, I kicked the lot, and uh, people are uh, really, it's, it's very weird. I think it's like comedy was here in the late 70s in the sense that it's underground, but it's happening. Right. But I think it's going to explode in the next decade. One. And um, Eddie, you'd be very welcome to come down because when I'm, uh, when I'm down there, there's uh, English comedians coming down and performing. So in September, Jimmy Carr was down. Um, also, uh, Jim Jeffries and John Cleese. And uh, I was meant to be opening for Russell Brand in October. Uh, so there's English speaking audience who want to watch English speaking comedian, comedians. And your name came up a lot when people were discussing comedy with me. Well, I would love to do it, but one thing is, do any, um, are the young kids in Greece, are they, are they more bilingual? I take it they're more bilingual than their parents. And are they they're more, incredibly, yeah. And so they, are, are they coming along? Would they come along to my gig? Because if I just played to British people in, in Athens, I wouldn't be so wild about yeah. it. But. I, I, I mean, look, uh, my people can talk to your people, and then you can arrange it between you guys. Uh, but, yeah. uh, uh, yeah, they will definitely come to you. The young people will come to you. Uh, they, 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 you know, because I live in England, people ask me questions like, do you know this person? Do you know this person? Uh, they're like, have you seen Eddie Izzard live? I'm like, man, I'd love to see Eddie Izzard, but it, it, has, it has been possible. Because, you know, we work at the same time quite often, right? So yeah. it's very hard to see comedians, um, except for Edinburgh. Um, um, uh, but I was like, I would love to see these, and, and they were all saying how much they love your routines. Genuinely, your name came up a lot. Um, they would come. They would. Uh, they would sell out. I, like in a big theatre. I can guarantee you this. Well, my my, I have a sort of ambition, which is a bit, a bit forward of myself, a bit too ambitious maybe. There is an amphitheatre, below, the Parthenon. Yeah, Acropolis. Yes. yes. I, 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 I saw a concert in uh, September, yeah. it was the most idyllic place I've ever been to for a concert. And very much like you, I looked at that stage and I thought, I should be on it. Why yeah. am I on the other side? Yes. Um, so I it want... was incredible. And Sarah, what's it called? Uh, Herodim Theatre. Herodim Theatre. Her Her Herodim Theatre? Herodaticus, yeah. Herodaticus Theatre, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I want to be there. So, But I can also play other places and play other cities. But I uh, will... John John Cleese did that very venue. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Yes, so it's, it's very feasible. Yes, it's a very nice, it's just a, well, the, one thing I say about the Greeks, apart from inventing democracy, thank you to the Greek people for inventing democracy, but also those amphitheaters, they really work. They just Absolutely work. wonderful. They are wonderful. And I've been in football stadiums, yeah. um, and then they change it, and then they do it into a more of arena shape, and suddenly mm -hmm. it's fantastic. I've played Hollywood Bowl, which is a big, Greek amphitheater. I've seen, I've seen that show, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's just, it's just a, a great space, so well done. You know. So, um, it's very funny, I have a, not a hilarious story, but a funny, a funny anecdote. On my way to the theatre in September, I was in a, in a taxi going there, and the taxi driver said, oh, where are you off to? And I said, I'm going to a Herodaticus to see this singer. And the taxi driver went, you know what, it's a beautiful theatre. You can feel the aura of the ancient Greece permeating the whole venue. It transports you back in time, back in a different time. It's like you're there, but you're also, throughout the ages, the magnetism uh, that you can feel within that venue is beautiful. And I was like, wow. And then he said, I mean, I've never been, but I've heard. <laughs> That's a, that's a very taxi driver thing to say. It was, I, but you know, he said it in a way that he didn't realize it was funny. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it was just very, very matter of fact. Um, but it genuinely it did transport you. You're going to be like, I'll come watch you. I'll open for you. It is an amazing yeah. place. Um, okay. Love it. Do you think, do you think you'll be, uh, you'll be learning some Greek for it? Because I know you're kind of mad like this. Well, this is the interesting thing. I have, people have said, why don't you, you know, do your shows in every language of every country you play and I said, well, I can't, I just, I'm, I'm not superhuman, I'm just human, determined human. Um, I can't learn every language, but I should really say at least an introduction in Greek, that's, uh, in Greek, that's what I, 
I should do, um, learn a little paragraph that's is succinct and positive and, and say at least that. Um, People will really appreciate it, but um, honestly, your comedy will just transfer very easily. And like even a walk around the town will uh, inspire you to say something topical as well. Because I know you won't be doing bits about um, the trans uh, translating every language, whatever yeah. you are. But there is something, I don't know if you feel it, there is something um, very accomplishing when you are going through a city and you find a great reference and then you drop it at that night's gig and it kills. Yeah. And you're like, I am, I am good at this. I can do this. No, that is good, but I'm also lazy. And if it won't work at the next gig, I, uh, I don't look for it so much. I work, I like something uh, that just keeps trying, an, an idea that I could use at, at that night's gig and any gig. But yes, if it's, if it's very much like uh, if, you're, if I was talking about the Acropolis or the, or the you know, backstage at, at the theatre, if I played that theatre, the uh, Heratica's theatre, so... You know, if you make some comment that just links into people's lives, they do love it. I do, they do love it. Can I just say, I am absolutely uh, in awe of the fact that you are talking and running. Like, you're, you were telling um, uh, uh, in the previous conversation, you were saying that you're just a normal person doing a marathon. And there is nothing normal about your levels of fitness. It's insane. Like, well, I'm really amazed. I'm determined. That's the thing. I mean, I think it's, it's partly genetic, but uh, it's also motivation. I've worked out that if I take my, a certain natural gift for determination, maybe that's slightly higher than what other people have, and then I worked out that if you're motivated, if I'm motivated, and I think this works for anyone, motivated, yeah. and you put your determination into that, you can go on and on and on. And if I'm not motivated, I won't get out of bed and I won't do the washing up. So, com com comedians, comedians, we do have that uh, ability to be both massively determined and hugely unmotivated. Yes, it's lazy but determined. This is the yes. thing. And I say, uh, well, we're like oil tankers. If you get us going, you can't stop no, us. Sorry. If you stop us, I, you can't get us going. Yeah. I saw uh, your documentary about uh, how you cracked comedy. You know, you know the one when you were in Edinburgh and you're playing to no one in the rain? Yeah, what, the Believe one? The Believe documentary? The Believe one, the Believe yeah. one, yeah. Like, the, the, like I saw it uh, years ago. That, and I watched, I watched the game with someone, like an ex-girlfriend, and she was like, oh my God, I can't believe she can play like that. Like, in the, you know, in, in Edinburgh, on the streets, uh, in the rain. How, how is it possible? And I was like, I completely understand it. I know you don't get it. I know you think it's weird, but I 100% get it. Yeah. Even though I can't, even though I'm too lazy for so many things, I there's something that drives me to perform to three people. And if the show is working, then the if rain can okay. come, the snow oh. can come. It's fine. If the show is yeah. not going very well, it's much harder. And then you yeah. think, ah, oh, stuff. This is raining. And yeah, go. and and, and this, I've been telling you this, like this, you know, you are one of these people who get it. That you no, know, I mean, if it's raining, it is going well. The bucket is better because you're wet. Yes. Uh, but if it's not raining, if it's raining and it's bad, then you have your flyers and have gone so giddy and you're in the middle of Edinburgh yeah. and you know, and nothing's happened and you reevaluate in your life and an hour later you just do a spot for someone else and you do it all over again as though it never happened. Yes. If you, we're talking about the Edinburgh Festival here, so anyone listening around the world, if you are a performer, you can get yourself to the Edinburgh Festival, obviously not in COVID times, but normal times. You can invite yourself, you just go. And that's what I did in 1981, that was my first one. Were, wow. you, bo were you born in 81? 83, I was two years late to your debut. Yeah, all right, so I did, I did quite a good show. I did Sherlock Holmes Sings Country with a group of other people in 1983. So when you were just being born, that was happening, yeah. if you can imagine that. And uh, the first one was two years before. But I cut my, I did 12 out of, thir in 13 years, I did 12 of them. And I did them sketch comedy in a group then street before me, and then I went solo street before me, and then in 89 I started the stand-up, and in 91 I was nominated for the Perry, and last yeah. one was in 93, and then I, poof, and I never went back until two years ago, and I did, uh, uh, Charles Dickens did my drama show, uh, Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Oh, I heard about that, it was yeah. great. Yeah, it, it was very experimental at that point, 
uh, two years ago, but uh, now it's it's on its legs. I'm off book, and I just recite like 21 characters, and it's a it's it's a beautiful thing to do. Yeah, that's that, that's very you to recite 21 characters in the show. Well, it is. I I don't know if you do it this way, but it is. I feel it's the mother load of comedy. If anyone doesn't do this, they should try doing this, because. Billy Connolly and Richard Pryor, two great examples of this, where you put forward a comedy idea and people can get laughs from the comedy idea, but then if you then act it out and yeah. say, I'm talking about dung beetles recently, and dung beetles seem to, they, they roll dung, some of them bury dung, they eat dung, they live in dung. And I just want the conversations of a young dung beetle going, so, so what am I right? It's dung. This is poo, isn't it? Yeah, is it our poo? Where does our poo go? Our poo we give to someone else and they roll that away. And it's just the conversations that could happen amongst dung families. And people call us dung beetles, you know? And you, you get into the conversations and suddenly that you've got a, um, that's the mother load of comedy. Honestly, to anyone out there listening, I don't know how you do yours, George, but it, it, if you can ever say ideas and then act them out, and it's just a, yes. qu it's a quarter head of the turn of the head, and, and it, it, the audience yeah. will paint in the details, and that's the technique I use on the Dickens and all the dramas. I'm going to do more drama shows uh, so that I can do dramas in the afternoon and then do evening stand-up gigs, and that's quite I, a I, double bill. I mean, you are uh, uh, amazing at it, you know, like creating these dialogues on stage, and um, I hadn't seen much of the comedy, but I've been watching recently, and he did that like wonderful bit about... Um, uh, the um, the wildebeest. Oh yeah. When they've been stalked by the lions. Right. Who, who's this? Is this Billy or me? Uh, Billy Connolly. Yes, Billy. Yeah. And he was doing the been stalked by the lions. I don't know if you've seen it. It's wonderful. I I, I can't remember how quite it goes, but I do remember him talking about wildebeest. And, and he was basically he, the whole thing was like there's a wildebeest going. Is that a lion? Like no no, it's not a lion. Keep eating. Stop saying it's a lion. <laughs> just having the conversation. It's just a wonderful. And you do you do it very well also, you know. Um, well, that's it. I'm that, influenced that by his style. Thing. Everyone should just watch other people's styles, and then and then uh, they can be influenced by that. But but I realised when when Billy was doing it, that is the that is the biggest uh, gold mine of of comedy because once you get a conversation in, like my Dung Beetle yes. family, they can go, come on, we're going on holiday, where are we going? <laughs> we're going to go over there. Come on, bring your dung. We have to bring the dung? We're Dung Beetles. Can't we just bring pajamas and a hat? <laughs> no, I got your hat, it's made out of dung. Oh, for fuck's sake. And, uh, and then you bring, you, you bring some dung home from whatever you went on holiday. Yeah. Is there a toilet near here? <laughs> Where are the toilets? I gotta go, Dad, I gotta go. You're a dung beetle, just poo on my head and I, I don't know. Just yeah. this we are a disgusting family. And and it, it writes that, itself. Yeah. It, it is, and th the thing is, it, it, you know, it's a very comedic thing to say, but dung is a funny word in itself. Yes, in English it's very like, funny. You know, it's a, and I think that's a difference sometimes when you that's, that's a perfect example. So when you change um, languages and you have to say it in French, you have to find a word that is as funny in French as dung is in English. Yep, and, and it'll be caca, and it will be, I don't know what dung beetle will be. Actually, it doesn't matter because dung is quite funny, but if it's not, there's still the conversations are the mother load. Yeah, that, that, exactly, but like, it's, when people ask me if I have to adapt it, it's like having to make these little changes because dung it sounds funny. And right. sometimes when you say when you say a joke, it goes pam 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 dunk. And yeah. It, it hits hard for a punchline. Yes, if it's a punchline, that, that is important. But my dung beetle, I'm just going to repeat it endlessly. I had a it's thing. It's very funny. I had a thing on on dogs going woof, and I was running along after one marathon, and a dog went woof 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 woof. And for the first time, I thought, what if that dog could talk? What is the dog saying when he's going woof? And in the end, I realised he was going, a sad, you know, thief, thief, or a bird. it's a thief, or a, I'm not sure, I can't see him, but it's the assassins. And I got onto this word assass assassin, assassins are here. And so assassins in English is pretty good, but in, yes. and in German it's attentator, attentator. That's quite good too. But in yes, French, in French it's assassin, 
Ah, it's, it's the That's best. That's hilarious. That's a good it's, it's, yeah. It sounds beautiful in French. Ah, si, les assassins sont sur ici. Tu es sûr? Oui, oui, je suis un chien. Assassin, juste, juste ici. And uh, you can just scream assassin. Assassin is pretty funny. Yeah, but it's, uh, yeah. it's the funniest in French. And it's quite good in, in German and English. But uh, now, George, I'm going to have to say goodbye, I'm afraid, because I have to talk to people on YouTube who are doing things. So, wow. Yeah, they're going to ask me questions. And uh, I'm going to do questions and answers for YouTube and people. But uh, thank you for coming on. And talk very nice to talking to you. And I'd say Afghanistan, I should say. You're very welcome. Afghanistan is my one j Greek word. I just should learn more of it. Uh, well, you, you, you learn more next time you come down. Yes, exactly so. But I will be back. I will play Athens. And uh, I've just been slow. Then, yes. Yeah, so that's a promise. We'll do it. Okay. Alrighty, take care. You too. Have a nice day. Cheers. Thanks, George. So, that was George um, Zakaropoulos. And the Greek names are quite long and so I'm just like, so sorry, George, if I, I think I've got that right in the pronunciation of your last name. And uh, all the stand up he's done has, has been, or it started from being in the UK. So, uh, so he's just coming on talking because we are celebrating Athens, as you can see behind me, and Greece. And I ran a marathon in Athens on the 7th of February last year, 7th of January. I am running a virtual marathon for Athens today. Ah, if you'd like to donate, we're at, um, we are at ediza.com. Uh, ediza.com and you can donate in uh, euros or US dollars or pounds. And that, that is uh, great, so you can get on there and do that. And you can also text uh, from this country, your phones have got to be UK phones and then you can text to uh, 70810 writing 10 or 20 pounds um, Mark and Ian we're going to change it aren't we the two donate 10 pounds that we're going to put in the UK to donate yes we're going to change yeah. it to, to donate in the UK text 20 to 70810 yeah. just put the UK in there because it's that's yep. coming in soon or, or is it a bugger to get uh, every tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow will be live. I've got to, I've got to go home tonight and edit it. At home. I understand. Okay, good to know that. Otherwise, I just keep saying it's about to come, people, and they go, no, it's not. Well, it's about. It will be here before the thirty-first. It'll be here tomorrow. So that's, that's about if we're talking about that time. No, all you, you got to do is tell me, and then I'll, I'll tell, <laughs> I'll tell the world. Otherwise, I say it's still not there. And I said, and oh, oh, you have to go back and rebuild the bloody thing. Fine, just, just blame me. Yeah, no, <laughs> I'm not allowed to do that. Otherwise, you'll stop talking to me. Um, then I'll be lost. So now, questions from YouTube. Go, jump to YouTube. Okay, get YouTube, on. YouTube questions. And uh, I'll just say to everyone, go to YouTube now. Uh, get on, is it my site, my YouTube? Uh, yes, easiest YouTube. way, go to YouTube and then search Eddie Izzard. Go to the Eddie Izzard channel. You'll see the live stream. It's in the chat on the live stream that we're picking up questions. Okay. There we go, fire away. Uh, okay, so uh, first question. Um, Carl Duggan, and I'm also going to add Liz Blue because I think Liz Blue has said she asked almost the same question yesterday, but didn't we didn't pick up on it? So this is for both of them. Um, why did you start comedy, and how hard did you find it at the start? And uh, this is from Carl saying, "I'm wanting to get into it, but don't know where or how to start." Okay. Um, if you're in the UK. Uh, I would say, and you're going in for stand-up, you need to be in London. It's the comedy clubs in London, which are obviously all closed due to COVID at the moment, so you need to wait till that opens, of course. Um, but I got into comedy because I wanted to be an actor. First of all, at seven, I saw a play. I don't think I wanted to be a professional actor, but if they told me that that existed, I would have happily signed up for it, I think. Uh, difficult to reimagine in your mind. But I did. Uh, see a play, a boy, the boy with the cart, I think it's called, and and uh, then I tried to get the school plays and I didn't, and then at puberty, uh, right on the Tuesday of puberty, no, it was around about 13, 14, I decided I didn't think drama was for me, and uh, in fact, 
um, it would be better for me to do uh, to do comedy because I like comedy but I didn't realize you could do it by itself but I began to discover Python and the Goons uh, Goon show, radio show from Britain from the 50s Spike Miller and Peter Sellers and uh, that's when I started pushing, actively pushing comedy, writing my own comedy stuff when I was 16. Uh, planned to go to the Cambridge Footlights, which had led to half of Python. And then I wasn't working hard enough, so I thought, no, don't need to go there, just need to go to the Edinburgh Festival. So I did 12 Edinburgh Festivals over 13 years, as I just mentioned. Uh, three doing sketch shows, about four doing street, four or five doing street about another four or five doing stand-up. So I changed three mediums of comedy. Um, but it was in London. That's how I got into it. The London comedy clubs was the way in. And uh, so, so I did that. And uh, they, they have open slots there. They have open nights. It's quite... It, a lot of people want to get into stand-up comedy because it's seen now as a career into nighttime television and touring the world and um, so it's very competitive you have to be very determined determination is more important than raw talent um, and yeah so but London I'm not sure how the system is but it used to be in time out they had the listings of all the comedy clubs and you could uh, go along or phone them up and ask for an open spot. It's very difficult to get through to anyone. Um, and, that, and that was back in 88, 89, 90. So the system must have changed by now. So I can't, can't quite advise you, but I do know, go to a London or a main city. You've got to find the comedy club and you've got to get in, in with them and be able to get bookings, particularly London, I think, because there's so many clubs. There were so many, I think there still are so many clubs, even though they're all, Close at the moment, so that is the way in. But uh, when I felt my stand-up comedy was taking off, I decided to, to add the drama on, which I'd initially planned to do. Um, so I did. So I did that, uh, and uh, got a separate agent, Nikki Van Gelder, and started driving dramatic roles and comedy roles at the same time. But yeah, there's a long answer, but that's, it's, a, it's determination and knocking on doors, ringing phones, uh, and probably in London if you're in the UK. Okay. Great. Next question. Uh, so this is from Ali Sparkle, uh, who says, uh, what do you do when you feel you've hit a wall? Not just in running, but in any area of life. And they say, with everything going on, my mental health is taking a hit, and, and I need tips. It's, it's, it's tricky to know how to advise you. If you're in lockdown, if you... My lucky thing is I already had things developed up and running. And uh, so I could do charity gigs outdoors when, when that happened. It was allowed in the summer. I could do things online. People knew me enough to the, 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 that could work, even though I wasn't earning money off that. They were all charity things. Um, but you, I think you've got to, if you're in COVID, like everyone else is, uh, the only way I can think of being positive is to actually try and plan what you want to do if it's different. If your job is a salaried job, and then that's hopefully going to be there when you come out, and you're happy to go back into that, then. Yeah, you, you could well be working from home at the moment, but if, you, if you're not, then you need to work, plan what you're going to do, what the, the different thing is, what you're going to do. You've got to, you've got to have a hope, you've got to have a drive and motivation, and you've got to find that. And some people find it difficult to find that. My dad said in his 80s, he still didn't know what he wanted to do with his life. That was his thing, and I knew when I was seven, so I was lucky. So I haven't got a great magic wand answer, I'm afraid, but I th think, Try and find something that you want to do. Make a plan of something you want to do once COVID goes away. That's what I'd say. Yes. Okay, next question. Uh, so this question is in French. 
This is from JL Wing. So they say, Bonjour et bravo pour tous tes efforts. Est-ce que tu as couru tous tes marathons en solo? Qu'est-ce que j'ai quoi? What was the last line? Qu'est-ce que tu as couru tous tes marathons en solo? I'm probably murdering this, but I think. This is a cool, like, like to run. I think cool it's here. if yes, if you run, do you run all your marathons on your own? Sure. I think, but I'm, uh, I'm murdering uh, French. Is it, it Esker or Pourquoi? Esker, all yeah, right. Esker. Esker, je, uh, esker, je cours tous mes marathons en solo, oui. Uh, uh, oui, normalement, tous tous mes marathons, je cours uh, tout seul. Um, uh, ça c'est pas. Basque, uh, because I'm always sort of running solo because one, I'm quite happy with that, and two, I can do it when I want rather than saying, I need to go training now. Well, who are you? you know, the next door neighbor. Oh, fuck off. Um, uh, I don't need to bother anyone. It, like if you're playing football, you need to get everyone together for the game of football, any te team sport. Uh, I, running. Off you go, any time, day or night. Just off you go, and uh, and that's that's what I do. So that's we oui, je, je suis très content de de courir tous mes marathons totalement solo, totalement tout seul, parce que je peux les faire uh, sans 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 problème. Je n'ai je n'ai pas de it's not necessary to telephone a friend and say, Hey, can we do something with a team game? Yeah, yeah, you have to phone people up. So. Yeah, I'm totally solo. Sometimes people run with me. At the moment on Swift, people are running with me. And I have... Uh, I'm running with me. At the moment on Swift, people are running with me. And I have 12 of the Swifters nearby. Okay, quick quick question. Amy Barrett asks, Hi Eddie, my dad would love to know where he can buy your baseball cap. Yes, I should say. Um, and so if you can make a note of this, I need to talk to Neil about this. Neil's getting it on the front page, but oh, great. go okay. to .com and the Making Manti Great Again caps and masks and t-shirts are all at the eddieizard.com site. Uh, go to the menu and find the shop and you'll see them there. All profits go to the charities. So, and, and I think Neil's going to put that into, into that stream so when you scroll down you can see a picture of a hat. But, uh, yeah, so thank you. Merci for that. And a quick uh, Zwift based question actually from RA McGee92 asks Is there any way we can cycle alongside you on Zwift? Oh, I think you can. I've been on certain things. I'm not sure. I think you have to go online and ask about that. Uh, you have to, uh, uh, but I think you can. There have been cyclists cycling along with us at times. Um, I don't know quite how that works. Yes, I think I, I think I was. Yes, I think we might have talked to Jim at Zwift about that. I, yeah. I have a feeling you can on the roads. I think was what Jim said. Although I suppose your speed's going to be different if you're on a bicycle. So. I'm, I'm always on roads, so. I think in theory, yes. We'll check it out. We'll check it out. Um, so Carol Casey asks, would you ever do sketch comedy again? I, I don't think I would do it as a big project. I could do it as a benefit show, yes, I'd be very happy to do that. I'd be very happy to do it in a benefit, but I do sort of sort of sketch comedy in if I do group improv, and the group improv, one word improv, I do it with, with Stephen Frost and El Malarkey, and Suki Webster, that's, that's, uh, that's fun, and that's, that's great fun, and sketches, and yes, I do like to do that. I think Mick was talking earlier, I think, about there was one word improv that you did. That was, I mean, that's not sketch, is it? That's more improv. Yeah, well, I'm saying one word improv, that is the oh, sketch. Oh, you did. Essentially, you are doing sketches. So, that's the kind of sketch comedy that I would do and will do. Uh, so, a question from Suleka Stieber says, if you didn't become a comedian act slash actor, what other profession would you have chosen? Uh, 
Um, I would have gone into politics. That was what I was thinking I should do, kind of one or the other, but I hadn't chosen, I hadn't made up my mind what my world view was. And uh, so I didn't join a political party until I was 35. And I'm quite pleased about that because I really had, just wanted to study the world and work it out for myself um, before I joined the Labour Party. But uh, so yeah, that could have been, that would have been, oh, I'd have been a business person. Uh, setting up businesses, making businesses, I like that. But uh, politics was always there. And that's what I'm going to try and do as soon as I can win a seat. Didn't you say you, you studied coding? This was when computer stuff was just kind of coming through. I began studying coding and yeah. had a plan to set up a software business for making games. I like games and I could see the future in them. Uh, this was in 1845, this was the year I came out actually. And this, I had this idea I could do this, I could try and set this up, but uh, that didn't happen. It's still there though, I'm still happy to be involved in that side of business. I think I've got an instinct for that. I was an asteroid, I don't know what the word is, I played asteroids. I, my high score is a million, and uh, a normal score on asteroids, a starting score was about 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, and I got a million. Played it for an hour and a half to get a million, so I became a real expert in it. I was basically an addict, but I understood how they worked. Defender is also pretty good. I can almost play it like an instrument. It's quite weird. Yeah. Okay. Um, actually, before the next question, there's just a lovely comment here, which uh, I think this is uh, RA McGee92 again, who says, You're an inst inspiration, Eddie, and part of the reason I completed 500 miles of running in 2018 and completed my first marathon. It's a nice comment. Oh, thank you very much. Well done, you. And oh, and actually, same person saying, What is your recovery routine each night? Well, I have a protein drink immediately, and then I sit down. I think that's it. <laughs> Then I have to get myself together for the gig. Then afterwards, I sit down again. And I don't have much of an organized thing. I should stop doing this, which is, which is nice. I like stopping. I find running sometimes tough right now. Yeah, always the last few hours are tough yeah, at the beginning. Oh. So uh, another question from uh, Nicholas Jones uh, says, I think you are one of the world's most amazing people. Who do you think are? As in, who do you think are well, the world's most amazing people? Mine, they both passed away now. One was Nelson Mandela, one was Abraham Lincoln. They were my talisman. Um, if you study closely what they did, they were great souls. And uh, so, Emmeline Pankhurst, we could put it in there. What a, amazing woman fighting for what she knew to be right. Because at the time, the people say, well, vote for women, but surely not because of, I don't even remember what the arguments were. Um, they used to not allow votes for all people because they said, you've got to have a stake in society. They always had some way of coming up with a line <coughs> that sounded vaguely plausible. Oh, we're landowners, so we have a stake in the country. We bought a bit of it. So you couldn't, if you went to land only, you couldn't vote. But uh, why they blocked women for so long, I do not know. It's weak character men, like Donald Trump, weak character men that have caused all the damage to humanity over the years. Weak character men, there you go. There are some weak character women too, and if they had some more prominence, maybe there'd be more weak character women. I need to realize that there, that does exist. There were women who worked in the concentration camps and uh, have done, the women have the ability to do good things and horrible things is pretty equally handed out. But generally the history is it's been male dominated of humanity. It's weak character men who have blocked all the progress of humanity. So uh, another question from uh, Elise asks, 
What is the best and the worst slash most challenging gig you had or acting bit? And what would you change about either of them? Say best or worst or both? Uh, both. Slash most challenging. Well, best. Any good. Well, let's say comedy if you're doing stand up in. Improvise yourself in French and German, that's the key thing. I was improvising in Paris and improvising in Berlin. They were so challenging, but so rewarding. I couldn't believe I was getting away with it or getting better at it. Um, for like the early days in the UK, so that's wonderful. Uh, tough things are performing to next to no one at the moment. I have no audience confronting me when I perform at 7 p.m. Tickets available, but I am hopefully doing an interesting and intriguing gig. All profits to charity. And uh, so those tickets are available at eddieizzo.com, 7 p.m. tonight. Uh, you can see me do things. Uh, but uh, yeah, so it's very tough if there's very few people there. Uh, drama. All the films, nearly all the films I've done, have been wonderful. As someone who broke into Home Studios when I was 15, as uh, still Steven Spielberg broke into Universal when he was, I'd have to say, maybe 16, 17. And uh, his career took off like a rock. And mine went nowhere. It took off 14 years later. But I think I was, the fates held me back learn more things. I had to learn a lot of things. Uh, so it's probably good for me to have my wilderness years where I couldn't get anything going. Uh, yeah, they've all been good. Tough drama gigs. Oh, well, here's, here's the thing about a tough feel like When you're filming, you get told sometimes, oh, you're going to do this scene in the rain. Now, they have to have rain machines for, for rain. You can't, one, you can't wait for it, and two, light rain doesn't show up. So they have heavy duty rain. Whenever it rains, if you look at all films, whenever it's raining, it's really raining, it's really downpour. It's never, it's never a light rain. And uh, so it look, you think, okay, um, I mean, the scene stuff's going on, it's kind of actiony. The rain, it'll look pretty good, and it'll be light and stuff, and, Things dripping and hey, let's get it on. But after your first absolute dowsling, and you know, if it's a minute scene, a minute and a half, and you're completely drenched after the end, I mean, completely drenched, just like you've just got into the stood in the water, and then it's sort of mocked off again, and then do it again, and it's freezing. And if it's at night, and you're going to do lots of different takes in different angles, it's it's tough as all hell, so water, water seeds are nuts. They seem like it's going to be fantastic and maybe look pretty good, but God, they're tough. Tough old things. Yeah. Okay, okay, next question is uh, from Alex Taylor. It says, uh, I've loved your comedy sketches and routines from a very young age. You're such an inspiration. Who would you say are your comedy inspirations, both from the beginning of your career and now? Um, I am less inspired by comedy people now because you take it in at the beginning of your career, but it, it was essentially Monty Python. That's the big central Olympian gods of the six guys of Monty Python and all their shows, the tapes, and their films. Uh, and then around that we've got Billy Connolly and Richard Pryor in uh, stand-up comedy. Um, and we got The Goon Show, which was written by and performed by Spike Milligan, also Peter Sellers and Harry Seekerman. Now, the, the Goon Show inspired, as a 50s radio show, inspired the Pythons, who did their show from 69 to 74. And the weird thing about me, uh, I was born in 62, so I was getting into comedy and saying I should do this, for, I want to do this for a living about, right at the end of Python's TV career, 
So the tapes, I was at boarding school, so I was getting tapes of Python and tapes of goons. My dad was recording the goons for me of, of Radio Dubai. So he was working in Abu Dhabi. Uh, so they started that. So I was getting the goons in one ear and the Python in the other ear. Stereoscopic surrealism. And maybe that really affected me. Uh, but I love both of them. And I hear, you know, John Cleese used to, the, 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 the goons are repeated. It was Sunday and Thursday. And John Cleese would listen to the repeat show of the goons with a big radio. This is a big plug in wireless radio up against one ear and a, and a pillow on the other ear to be able to pick up a particular joke that he couldn't hear because there was too much laughter or something. And I would do this. I, I would do the same thing, but we had tapes that we could listen to it over and over. Uh, yeah. And uh, we should uh, do a quick pit stop in a minute, I think. Yes, but just pit, to finish, I think, um, might be a good one. Um, this is from someone called Following Europe the Band, which is a great name, um, asking, is there a tour list for this January tour? I'll donate on payday, but if Oslo is on the list, I'd like to buy the show for that day. I have the list. Shall I do a little run through yeah, of the list? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is a run through for the. Uh, oh, uh, yes. Well, I'll go right, right through. Let's go right through till uh, the twenty eighth at least. So here we go. So today we are. And these are our, our virtual uh, uh, cities. Um, today is uh, Athens, Greece. Tomorrow, Sofia, Bulgaria. Bucharest, Romania, Budapest, Hungary, Bratislava in Slovakia, Vienna in Austria, Zagreb in Croatia, Ljubljana in Slovenia, Prague in the Czech Republic, Warsaw in Poland, Vilnius in Lithuania, Riga in Latvia, Tallinn in Estonia, Helsinki in Finland, Stockholm in Sweden, Copenhagen in Denmark, uh, or I should say that properly, shouldn't I? Co Copenhagen? Copenhagen. Yep. Uh, Berlin, Germany, Brussels, Belgium, Luxembourg, uh, Amsterdam in the Netherlands, Dublin, Ireland, Paris, France. That takes us up to the 28th for anyone uh, <sighs> wanting to know. Oh, thank you, everyone. <coughs> Just going to have a break. Oh. <sighs> Shockingly, over 2 million tonnes of food a year is wasted within the UK supply chain. Fair Share is tackling this problem in a strikingly simple way. We work with farmers, producers, distributors and retailers to save good quality fresh food from being wasted, so we can get it onto people's plates instead. In practice, it's a huge logistical feat, involving hundreds of volunteers working tirelessly to unload the produce, unpack and sort it at any one of our network of food warehouses across the UK. The food might be surplus, but it looks and tastes just like the food you'd eat at home. Most of it arrives well before it would have hit the supermarket shelves. Food becomes surplus for all sorts of reasons, a glut of courgettes from overproduction or a lack of demand as unpredictable weather plays its part incorrect packaging and labelling, wonky fruits and veg, and cancelled orders. Wherever it comes from, with the support of our team of volunteers, we prioritise the incoming food, itemising it for traceability and breaking it down into smaller quantities for redistribution. Fair Share gives nearly 11,000 charities access to food, all of whom are onboarded safely and meet all food safety regulations. These charities and groups range from food banks, children's breakfast clubs and homeless centres to small local community groups. Not only does this food save charities thousands of pounds on their food bills, it means they can offer the people they support more fresh, healthy fruit and veg and a wider range of food in general. New innovations like the Fair Share Go app have seen direct pickups from the supermarkets meaning perishable goods like fresh bread and fruit can quickly be redistributed. Fair Share is more than meals though. Food brings people together. It helps local organisations tackle loneliness and isolation within their communities or help connect struggling families with the services that can support them. It's such a simple concept. 
Food that could have been wasted is instead used for good. Exactly where we will end up. <laughs> it can be tough. It can be hard. Sometimes it takes a I will. Other times a simple I do. We take each step with our focus ahead. We have plans and strategies, but they do not always work out. There are times when we get knocked down and doors close behind us. Our hopes can often be replaced by fears. We can lose our direction and struggle with change, become passengers in a life that is spinning too fast. At times like this, we need someone beside us, someone to listen, to advise and support us, see what is really possible, someone to give hope and to get us over that line, and someone to say bye when the job is done. Walking with the Wounded supports ex-servicemen and women with physical, mental or social injuries to gain the skills and qualifications to develop new careers outside the military, reintegrate into society and provide long-term security for themselves and their families. Our programs give vital support to the most vulnerable and hard to reach veterans, those who are wounded, homeless or within the criminal justice system. Support more of our wounded to regain their independence.
This is Paul. He and his wife are both blind. Paul is a member of one of the five talent savings groups that we have worked with for the past four years in Nakuru. Like many of the people we work with, Paul had a lot of ideas for starting a business, but didn't know where to start. I would manage to ask for my brothers for my, to assist me, but now I'm able to assist myself. When I get loan, I can get 20,000, adding with mine, I can do something which is bigger. I have bought Nini, three, four turkeys to start, and I have bought that Nini oven for 25,000. And then I want to, pick, to cook the cake and the motorbike will supply. I am totally blind with a lot of difficulty, but when I have this loan, it has helped me to, because my, my wife is in college, Kise, Kenya, Kenya Institute for Special Education is learning certificate and he will learn even diploma. I am the one who is providing for, him for the fee and feeding my family. Okay. Happy to talk to you. Jeremy Clare. Hello. Hi, Eddie. We're going to pass you to the Thank you. Hi, Eddie. How are you doing? All right? Okay. Good. How's today, B? Sorry? How's today, B? Yeah. Okay. It's at a certain time, going really well, and then, then it slows down again. And, uh, um, okay. I got is up. Is this just, but this is all general fatigue. Can I just check how the foot's doing? Foot's fine. Good. Excellent. Yeah, uh, I certainly thought we should probably pull up that when I was asking you to ice your feet. We should get that clip. So <laughs> Chris can find clip on the South Africa trip when you're talking about what the effect of icing your feet does. Yeah, we're not allowed to watch clips, I'm afraid. Are we not? Oh, no. okay. Oh, shame. Uh, oh, well. Oh, it's weird permissions you don't go through such a lot of paperwork. Oh, uh, okay. Right. Yeah, that we played that one bit and it all went a bit pear shaped. Yeah. <coughs> Even though it's all for charity. And have you been uh, have you been reminiscing today about the run around Athens in February? Yes, we yeah, we could talk more about that because you were there, weren't you? See, I was um, mainly on my own that day, wasn't I? But <coughs> I joined up with you. Well, you you headed off early in the morning and I did the most magnificent run up to the top of the viewpoint and watched the sunrise. Oh wow. Over. It was absolutely amazing. And then I met you and me and Gary came and met you in the Parthenon. And then that woman who no flags and no, no, no it, food. It, it was running, it was no running. No running. I don't and know. Then you went, you, I'm not you sure. We had to put our food away, we went out to drink. Yeah, there's no food. Flat. And they blew a whistle. But I was saying it wasn't you know, they, they I know the Parthenon has been treated badly over the years. So I can understand they got rules, but they would blow the whistle but not say anything, so you just didn't know what they were talking about. Yeah, it's like, like a foul in football. Yeah. 
Exactly. Good. Okay. Well, the, uh, the person we got to chat to today is, uh, is a very nice young lady called Claire Hudson Cooper. And uh, I've known her for a while, obviously, through uh, sort of the athletic world and, and looking after injuries. But she's a magnificent lady who works for a charity uh, called Julius House, which I believe she can probably tell you more about this, but I believe it was set up in 2003 by a guy called Mike Wise. Um, and looks after children with, with terminal illness. A magnificent organization. Um, but I will let her explain the details to you. So Claire, welcome. Thank you, thanks Tim. Hi Eddie, nice to, Hi, Claire. Nice to meet you. Oh, we're not seeing you on the screen for some reason. But, uh, uh, just keep talking in. Dave, yeah, keep talk Dave and Ian, it. can we get Claire on the screen as well? That'd be wonderful. She so, can't when she talks. Say again, sorry? It should come through when she talks. I know she has, but it hasn't been coming on. Keep talking, Claire. Just tell us about things and hopefully it will come through. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so I work for Julius House Children's Hospice, which is in Dorset and Wiltshire. Um, and we look after uh, children um, for who have life-limiting and life-threatening conditions. Um, and we offer respite care and end-of-life care to to them in the community and, and in our hospice buildings. Um, we have one in Dorset um, and one in Wiltshire. Um, and we have a, a big team of, of nurses and carers and um, uh, family support workers and sibling workers who um, look after the children and, and their families um, uh, and provide really essential respite to to these children who have incredibly complex needs um, and are very very poorly, um, and it's it just gives the families a little bit of um, a break, really. So we we go into the children's homes, um, or they come into our hospice if it wasn't COVID times, um, and we look after the children. So we might send in uh, qualified nurses or carers, whatever we need to for for that child's needs, um, and allow the family a bit of time to either spend time with their siblings or um, just get some rest um, and we kind of do that the sort of between four and six hours generally um, and we also provide end of life care um, in, uh, to, to the children as well should they need it so yeah right. so it's an amazing organization well well done for doing that and this is how long have you been uh, working with the organization um, I have been working there for uh, the 11 years uh, next month um, and I'm a children's nurse um, and have been for maybe 20 odd years now, um, a long time um, and I've um, spent most of my career um, working with children um, with life limiting conditions. Um, I absolutely love it, it's an incredible job, I'm really lucky, really lucky. Uh, I, would have th I would have thought I could understand you must bring a lot of help to these family situations, but isn't it very tough as well? It's really tough, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's the, the good times outweigh the bad by far. You know, we have a lot of fun. Um, everybody thinks of children's hospices as really dark and gloomy places where everybody comes and dies, and that absolutely isn't the point. Uh, isn't the isn't what happens really? Um, it's we have a lot of fun. We um, the children are incredible, you know, um, some of the things that they have to put up with and um, that you and I would just take to our beds and probably never get up again. Um, they don't, they just get on with it and they they smile and laugh and, and have so much fun with us and with our carers and nurses and, and with the families. Um, we, we get to know the families really well, you know, some of them have come to us for years and years. Um, so yeah, it's, it's we work we work very closely with families and have really good relationships with them too. So right, Tim. Um, Claire, can you just what was your what was your journey through international? Yeah, where did you train and, and where did you get your experience before this? So I am um, I'm lucky. I I kind of always wanted to be a nurse. I think from when I was about five, my mum's a nurse, um, and I think she always inspired me to. To go into that field, um, and um, so I trained at Great Ormond Street in London, and I worked on a neurosurgical ward, which I absolutely loved. I loved the London life. I loved. I had a great time up there as a student, and um, 
made, made, you know, made the most of it. Um, but I wanted to come back to the, for the, you know, the forest and, and the beach. And so I went into, um, I specialised in, in palliative care nursing um, quite a long time ago and have worked in that field since. So, um, yeah, I, I, it's a really, you know, an, an unusual speciality, I guess, to, to choose because so many people think it is so miserable, but it, it just isn't. It's, you know, I can't change the outcome of these children. I can't make them better um, as much as I would love to, but I can make it, you know, as a nurse, we can make it better for them. We can um, make, you know, their time here as special as possible and make it easier for families. You know, our families are under incredible pressure um, you know, they can't just pop out and get a pint of milk if they if they run out like we can, or, or take for granted of taking the other children to swimming lessons or brownies. You know, they, they're not able. Some of our families aren't able to do that. Um, and for us to, to make that difference is is it's really rewarding. So I get a lot from it. You know, I get a lot back myself. So I'm lucky. And I guess I guess there with being an outcome as well, not necessarily an outcome that anybody would want, but it, it, it at least focuses your mind, doesn't it, to make the most of the time that those children have left, which in some respects can be a very positive thing. Because you think, well, okay, let's go for it. Let's really, let's kind of really make this a special time for those kids. Yeah. So what, what did your mum do? Where was she a nurse? Uh, she was she trained in Christchurch actually. She um, trained locally and she was a community nurse um, uh, locally to here, district nurse. She retired. Um, oh, I don't know, maybe five, ten, no, ten years ago probably now. Um, and she still she's just a very caring, loving person and still does a lot of care out in the community with um, helping other people even now. So um, yeah, I guess it's it's in the blood maybe. Um, being in the, in the care and profession, so. Okay. Now tell, tell us a little bit about Mike White, because I have to confess I don't know masses about who he was as an individual, but I know that he was the founder of the Julius House Foundation, so. Yeah, so he, Mike was actually a friend of Julia, um, who was, as in Julia's house, um, who was a community nurse who um, had a vision of setting up a children's hospice in Dorset um, and um, was able to do that through Mike backing her and, and helping her. Um, sadly, Mike, Mike passed away just before Christmas. Um, an incredible man um, has achieved so much. I'm so proud of, of Julia's house. Um, very uh, well thought of man in the local community. Um, so it's really him and Julia who um, sort of worked together. Um, but then when Julia died before the hospice opened, Mike sort of promised that he would um, take that forward, take that vision forward, which he, he did. Um, and then obviously we opened our Wiltshire Hospice as well, which he was very much um, a part of and passionate about. Um, so he's been an incredible inspiration to, um, I, I personally didn't know him very well, um, but um, Martin, our CEO, um, was, was very close to him and a lot of our, our staff. So he was um, a, a very inspirational man um, and very, and you know, drove the charity forward. For sure. So, but, but he, he had so he had no medical training. It, it, that wasn't his background at all. He was was he a businessman or? Yeah, he was a, a he was a, a businessman and um, yeah, he was, he was um, an, an incredible man. But as I said, sadly he passed away before Christmas, um, which was a real shame. But, but at least he lives on in an amazing organisation. So you say you were talking about the Wiltshire Hospital. What what's that? So the Wiltshire Hospice. Um, opened in 2017. Um, we started to look at um, the, the lack of services in, in Wiltshire in general um, it, for, for respite and um, end of life care um, just because there aren't very many children's hospices um, across the UK because they're all they're not funded by the NHS. I mean um, we're 95% we, of our funding comes from public funding from, from fundraising. Um, so you know, the, the hospices kind of overlap across the whole of the UK um, and there was a bit of a gap in Wiltshire so we kind of started to edge our way across um, to the Wiltshire border um, and in 2013 um, myself and another nurse Hannah um, started to look into um, community care and set up um, some 
community respite um, out there. So we didn't have a building, so we were kind of working from home and working in the children's homes. Um, we then um, were able to um, uh, fundraise and open a Wiltshire Hospice, which opened in 2017, which we're really proud of. And that's up and running, and um, we're, we have um, families in, across the whole of the Wiltshire County that we're supporting as well. So the, ma the majority of our care is actually, I think it's like 65% of our care is, is in the community. So we're able to go out to the trip to the family's home. So it, it enables the families to, um, we kind of turn up at the door and, and they can then, they don't have to take equipment and they don't have to travel, make the, the children don't have to travel um, and we can provide the care at home. Like I said, if they want to come into the hospice, they can. Um, not in COVID times, obviously we've had to close the hospices, um, both of them at the moment because of COVID, so um, because we can't have the children mixing together. Um, so yeah, it's, it's we're just for counties now. So the, the, the not being able to open the two centres, that presume, does that mean that you know, that has spread you quite thin? Is that more difficult? Yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, COVID has just been an absolute nightmare for us, really, and well, and all the children's hospices. But um, you know, our, our funding basically stopped overnight um, when they shut when we went into the first lockdown. Obviously, all our shops, our charity shops, is a is a, a huge part of our our income. Um, all of the events, you know, marathons and sporting events and balls, sort of all just stopped. Um, I mean, some of our supporters have tried their absolute best to to change things to virtual as, as Eddie's doing, you know. Um, so we've had some support, but it's not, it's not, the races aren't going on, you know, the triathlons aren't happening, the marathons aren't happening, as you well know. Um, so it, it's had a huge impact on us financially. So we we had to furlough a lot of our staff to try and, you know, look after the, the longevity of the organisation. Um, and that's impacted us. Um, the families obviously had to shield. So, um, yeah, we've had to be incredibly, I think the polite way of putting it is to be adaptable and flexible and, you know, we could spend hours working on something for over a morning and then we come out and the government guidance has changed and so we need to change it again. So we've had to be really flexible and try and look after our families in whatever way that might be, um, you know, and that has been changeable by the minute. <laughs> Do you run or cycle or, or swim? Or part of these things that are happening for the charity? Or is that your thing or not your thing? Yeah, yeah I do. Um, I have I've done a couple of marathons. Um, and Come on, don't be, don't be modest, Claire. Come on. I, I have. I've done a few. And I've, I've done, um, for my 40th birthday, I did 40 challenges for my 40th birthday because I didn't want to have a party or a surprise party sprung on me. So I thought, I'll, I'll get ahead of the game and I'll, um, I'll arrange my own thing. So I asked all my family and friends to pick a, a challenge for me. Um, so I had 40 friends and family pick something and in that I hoped that they wouldn't be all too awful because I was asking them to do the challenge with me. Um, so over the year, for my 40th, um, one of those challenges was an Ironman, um, which was my brother who um, challenged me to that. So he, he did the Ironman with me and we did that together. Um, Wait, did you do that? Where? Wales, yeah. Tempe. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. People, people who don't know, uh, okay, what, what does an Ironman involve? So it's two and a half miles swimming. Well, Will's going to tell me off now if I get this wrong. Two and a half miles of the swim. Um, 112 miles on the bike and 26 and a full marathon. So um, Which? yeah, it was it was incredible. I loved it. I mean, I, I stood on the beach with my brother at the start line, and then I didn't see him again until unless he was passing me. He left me for dust. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's a lot of kilometres. I, I've never. I've done a half Iron Man, roughly. Just about. Have you? Yeah, it was. Uh, what did we do? We swam. We swam for two and ran for ten. Uh, uh, we ran for ten, not not thirteen. So it was under a half an hour. Uh, an hour, an hour. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was okay. Yeah, it was, everything was just under half. 
Um, so that would have, that probably would have been a triathlon, wouldn't it? A bit of triathlon rather than a half Ironman. Yeah, it uh, wasn't an official half Ironman, but it was just under half of what an Ironman would do. Would be. Not, not tempted to do a full? Um, maybe. But uh, not right at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, at this time in the day, Claire, asking Eddie whether he'd like to do any other challenges is probably going to be a no. The, um, but was one of the challenges set to, was that to, to live with Will Newbury? Was that one of the challenges that someone set you? <laughs> yeah, and I just looked up there, seems that I'm having to get away from that one. Okay. So you better explain to Eddie a little bit who Will is, because otherwise that doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. So Will, Will's my Will's my partner, and he is um, good friends with Tim as well. So, um, and he's a, actually a triathlon coach. So, um, hence, I guess our common interest as well is is the sport, um, which which I love, all of it. So, I, I, well, I just like being outside, to be honest, Eddie. I just like to be outside. Whether that's, you know, I might not want to run as much as I did and as, as I used to, but I still like to be out walking and running. Actually, Liz, Liz Yelling is one of our patrons for our hospice, and she, Martin Yelling, is, um, hasn't he done training programs for, with you and things before? Yeah, Martin is my, as I said, we're, we're like, uh, what are we, birthday twins kind of thing. And uh, Tim has ended up being as physio, but also channeling, channels all of any instructions from Martin. Is that fair to say, Tim? Yeah, that's for that, absolutely. We, uh, we, we try and keep you on the straight and narrow. Yeah. Which is much easier when you're on a treadmill, I have to say. Yeah. Oh, this is getting this, a bit tough. Usually, usually the Claire marathons normally take a very meandering course. They, uh, so when it's outside, it includes going to visit like wildlife and, and various shops or ice cream vans. So yeah, this is doesn't nearly have the same variety to it the we used to. So. I can imagine. I, I, and and you're just are you running at the same pace the whole time, Eddie? Are you, no, you vary. Try to vary it, but you know I keep trying to get ahead of the game, going a little bit faster so I can have a break, and it's. You know, I don't get too. I, I got to finish at six, but today I won't finish until six thirty, and then I'm on stage at seven. So, and I'm getting dangerously towards the back of the, the running, the running treadmill. So, yeah, I bet. so I'm just struggling, and if I take no break, uh, I will still only have half an hour, and I'll be on stage. And that's uh, it's really tough. It just get, I can't work out. I, I try and get ahead, and I'm always, I'm getting further and further behind. I'm getting slower and slower as the marathon's gone. So uh, it's incredible. I mean, to do one marathon is 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 a challenge to do. And I, when I did my first one, I thought, God, I'm gonna sleep so well tonight. It'd be amazing, and I can't wait to. Have a, have a drink afterwards and then go to bed and I felt so sick and then didn't sleep at all. So how are you doing that? I, I, how are you sleeping at all? Yeah. Um, I'm not quite sure. I mean, it gets to this point and it just gets miserable. And I'm trying to vary a slight tilt, a slight change of speed. But you know, I look at the clock and I think, that's uh, another hour of this. Oh, God. So. Let's think at the end. Think at the end, Eddie. So, Claire, have you got any other, have you got any other things planned in terms of the runs? Or are you just ticking over like everybody else? I'm ticking over, yeah. I'm, I'm, I haven't planned any more um, sporting events now um, for next, for, for this year now, sorry. Um, um, I'm, I'm supposed to be going to match Pitchu with with Julia's house in, in May, but I, you know, again, I don't know if that will be on. I, I'm I'm hoping I've got everything crossed that it is, but um, uh, but no running. Um, just just try and tick tick over and get through each well, whatever happens next. You know, when we get out of this lockdown, I guess, and just staying positive and fit and safe and healthy is my goal for. Okay. 
Because we had a, we had the Rachel Lindley on last night, who's from the Five Talents Charity, which is a microfinancing group that, that go into uh, places, particularly in East Africa. But Martin and I have done some work with them by doing uh, marathons in Kenya in Kericho with Impact Marathon series. So does that have, is that what your Machu Picchu trip is like? Is do you organise trips for people to go away, and then part of their money goes towards the, the house? Yeah. So we have. Um... A, a, an incredible fundraising team who are constantly um, trying to think of different events. So we, they've done the Great Wall of China, um, it's Machu Picchu next year. They try and do a different event somewhere um, interesting. And some of our families, grandparents, we've got grandparents of some of our families who come and try and support. Um, it's their way of trying to help their their grandchildren and, and supporting us and supporting um, raising awareness of the charity as well. Um, actually, I'm telling a lie, I am doing some running at the moment, I forget what I'm doing. I, I have just signed up for a virtual Julia's House Challenge, um, which is, they're doing the seven wonders of the world. Um, so you can just pay and do a virtual challenge and you can map it. It's, it's a bit like the, um, you know, the uh, virtually where so you can plot it on the map. And you just pay a certain amount for which wonder of the world you want to do and, and raise money if you want to. So you can do, um, so at the moment it's um, uh, Rio uh, and the Great Wall of China, so you have to accumulate the miles to get to the next place and you can kind of plot your way along there. So I, I, I am doing that at the moment. So you can walk or run. What, 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 what platform is that on? What, I'm not like, sure. Like I, Swift or I think something like that? I don't know what the actual platform is. I've just done it from our from our website, and they've just told that you know we were just asked if we wanted to do it, and I was yeah, I'll do that. It just keeps me keeps me busy and get my children doing it, get them out of the house, you know, get the teenagers out, get them on there as well. So yeah, yeah. There was a great piece on the news today. Did you see where the guy tried to take his children out for a walk and they refused? So he took the Wi-Fi router with him so that they <laughs> couldn't get the Wi-Fi. And when he got back, they cleared up the house and were playing Monopoly. Oh, so good. So there's a bit of a message for everyone. Yeah. But the, so in terms of the Machu Picchu trip, how many people do you take? I think on this one, I think there's um, I think there's about 20 people of us on there. And actually, like, one of the parents of, of a little girl I used to look after, that I looked after, um, who sadly died, um, the, the father's coming on that. So that will be lovely that I'll get to see them as well. Um, so there's... Um, it's a mixture of anybody really that wants to do, wants to have a bit of a challenge um, and to go. And again, like you say, you just pay and then fundraise and raise awareness. Um, but that's kind of like, that you pay for the trip and then you do some fundraising around the back of it. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's the same sort of model as in that uh, Excellent. Right. Of course, at the end of last year, I remember very well Eddie Howe, who was obviously the former football manager at the time, and you did like a, a I don't know, was it a 12-week boot camp with him? And in fact, you had two of my very close friends, Jen Warren and Hugh, uh, from Rocks and Rascals. They were both doing it as well, so I know those two really well. Uh, um, uh, that, looked, that looked brutal. Well, that was actually um, Martin, our CEO, who did that. And oh my goodness, yeah, he was training every day up into it for months before it. And yeah, it was pretty grim. Um, they, they found it really tough, but it was a, a small group of a core group, like you say, of, of um, local businessmen as well that did it. And I think, um, yeah, it, it was incredibly tough. Um, yeah. Yeah. They, luckily, they didn't break me into that. But I started work too early, so I wasn't able to, to get broke into that. Well, don't speak too soon, Tim, because we're just about. I think we're playing another one, so I think I think I just heard you commit to helping us with that one. And, and I think. Uh, I, I think I'm busy. I think I'm busy, but when is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, as soon as they're in the process of planning something at the moment, so as soon as I know, then um, we should be tapping on your door. Well, I'm, I'm probably going to be very, very busy. I'm absolutely certain. The one thing I wanted, when Eddie was talking to you earlier on, um, one thing that kind of went past me, and I wasn't really sure whether I heard it properly. Were you saying that children's hospices in the UK, that there is no public funding? No, we um, ninety five percent of our of our funding is, is from public funding. Yes. But the, that's Julie's house, but is that all hospices? Yeah. Hospices? Yes. Wow. Yeah. 
Some hospices get a little bit of funding depending on what they're they're doing, but it's all on on, in, on an individual basis. But it's not if they do, it's it's usually very small. So wow. five for us. So um, yeah. And we, okay. what we see is Eddie, Eddie and I have this conversation all the time. So often these things come from single individuals. So, you know, Julia Perks, you know, who's obviously the nurse that had the vision and brought that forward. And you kind of, you know, we saw it in South Africa with Mandela and stuff. So often just really committed individuals make such amazing strides. And, uh, and if we didn't have people like Julia um, and Mike Wise who have had that vision and, and have kind of ploughed their way through to do that, you know, we would have children now without any respite, we'd have marriages breaking up, we'd have uh, siblings with, that are left at home because the parents often have to go with sick children, we would have um, children dying without a choice of where they want to be, you know, the, the whole um, guidance around if a child is, if, it's, if, if the inevitable is going to happen and they are going to die, they should have the choice if they want to be in a hospital, if they want to be in a hospice, they want to be in their own home. And we wouldn't have any of that if it wasn't for people like that. So, you know, it, it kind of, it, it's inspiring, isn't it? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, Oh, sorry, carry on, Tim. No, I was going to say, because you have all sorts of things in terms of like, what makes these people inspirational, what gives them their drive, you know, you often talk about that. Uh, wait, uh, is that a question to me, or? Yeah, that was for you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, yeah. I'm trying to work out what gives me my drive, and I think there, I think there is a determination, genetic, but it might not be. It might be that I just worked out the motivation. Motivation. If you can get motivated, then you can do good things. If you can motivate other people to do stuff, you can do good things. And in America, we can see you can motivate people to do bad things. Uh, so, unfortunately, motivation is a powerful tool, hopefully used in the correct way. Um, and we do see a lot of good in the world and some really stupid things happening, like yesterday in Washington, D.C. Uh, but I'm really struggling here, guys. So, so Claire, it's, it's uh, great. Uh, but now you've got to ask me questions, and Tim, you've got to ask me questions, because the only way I can get out of myself is if I'm answering questions. Sorry. But I no, this, is your, this, is, this is your opportunity okay, to ask any, absolutely anything. But yeah, Tim, you've got to help because it can't be all on Claire. Would, but just, yeah, yeah, but we can, uh, we can talk about anything. It doesn't have to be questions, actually. We just have to talk about things. And it'll help me get out of it because I'm struggling. I've got three quarters of an hour to go. And I'm struggling. Sorry, and then Claire, if you need to get away, you get away. But, but um, no, this is the... No, not waste this opportunity to, to be asking you um, well, because and, I'd love... I'd love to understand your, you know, do you, do you think of these challenges to to challenge yourself, or and to, do you think that every time, you know, how am I going to beat thirty-one marathons? What what am I going to do? Obviously not at the moment, no. not today. It's but. not. It's not really that. I'm not trying to top myself. Yeah, top myself. Top. The, I'm not trying to increase that, raise the bar on every challenge, because I'm trying to challenge myself. It's more that if you are going to do a challenge. If you are going to pull interest in and, you know, Make Humanity Great Again comes from a, a slogan that someone else had. I can't remember who that was, but uh, this seems to be a good slogan to go with and it includes 7.8 billion people. Everyone is included in that. And so if I'm going to bring attention to it, I better do something that's, that's kind of out there. And uh, if I've already done certain things, I'm making it a little, a rather harder myself every time, and I have to I have to just increase it. Uh, we weren't planning to do it on a treadmill, but bizarrely it has given this extra. I think the treadmill is really it's tough because it just goes on and on and you don't see anything. But the chatting to people around the world, running people on the Zwift app around the world, that is intriguing, and people could donate and I can keep this weird six hour podcast, six and a half hour podcast going, uh, then I do a gig afterwards. So that's, that's why I'm doing it. But I do get something back on that. I get a personal uh, fitness. But by the end of it, I will be stronger. This bit is hell though. This bit is just hell. It's, uh, and, yeah. And if, if you're not doing a challenge, do you, do you run anyway for pleasure? Do you run for fun? Well, I was, 
I was involved with the volunteers <coughs> at the Olympics in 2012, and uh, the sort of ambassador for the uh, the uh, volunteers at uh, the Olympics, and I was lucky enough to be to visit the uh, marathon run uh, sites, the sites and the feeding stations, <coughs> and I met some people, and they were all they seemed to be senior citizens in their 60s, 70s maybe. And I said, how come you people are all running the feeding stations? How do you get chosen? And they said, we're all part of the 100 plus club. They'd all run over 100 marathons, often 200, 300, maybe 400 in their lives. And, uh, and they look good. And I said, what, how do you, what's your training you do? He said, well, we just run one a week. And that's all we do, nothing else, a marathon a week. And I thought, that's where I want to go. So that happened in 2012. And, Due to work and stuff, I found it difficult to get into that habit. But since last February, when I ran 29 marathons around Europe, I've tried to do a marathon every other week and a half marathon every other every other week. You know, in between those two weeks. So, so that's what I'm doing: marathon, then half marathon, then more marathon, then half marathon. That's what I do. That's amazing. I think when you've done a marathon, you then kind of well, maybe it's just me, you kind of then think, well, I'm not, I'm not going to do anything for a while. Or, and then you kind of get back to that point of, oh, four miles, well, I can't be bothered, you know, that's a real slob. And then building it back up to 10 miles. And then you kind of get to 10, 12 miles and you think, well, a three mile run's not really worth doing, is it? So, whereas it's just that choice, you're keeping that level of fitness all the time. I'm trying to keep match fit for life, if you think about it. It's that building back up I don't like. Um, yeah. But the truth is, if you're doing multiple marathons, you can't really train for it. I don't think. I don't know. Two may disagree with me. But uh, I, I, I always say the first 10 are the training for the next 21. And uh, if you can see me clearly now, this is not a, a great advert for, you know, athletic running. But if you saw me towards the end of South Africa, uh, not the double marathon, but certain other days I looked sprite I looked like you know I was weather weather beaten and uh, I even did sprint finishes occasionally one one, one marathon I did a sprint finish but uh, it's kind of good when you get to your power because we were designed to do stuff like this so it's good to if you go to I, Tim tell us about this the body does switch on healing processes doesn't it if you do these multiples yeah, well, I mean, it does in any form of exercise. So whenever you exercise, there's an element of, uh, of of damage to the tissues, and it's the repair to that damage to the tissue, which effectively they can become stronger. So if you work out, I think we I think we had this conversation the other day, but it, it doesn't matter if we complete it. In terms of if you're doing muscle training, the adaptation, uh, the strength comes from the fact that you break down muscle tissue, and then that gets rebuilt, but you have to give it time. And that's the difficulty with these multiple marathon challenges is that you're always playing catch up and there's this cumulative sort of deficit that, that, that you're always working on. So cumulative deficit in terms of calories and energy, but also cumulative deficit in terms of tissues, you know, trying to repair. And then you say, no, but we're just gonna do one more. And then so the tissues are like, no, no, hang on, we need to just rest. We need to take it easy, we need to repair. And then you say, well, okay, can you do that while I'm running another marathon? So it's it's tricky, and I, and I, say, I think we said the other day that in the 80s, uh, when people were just first getting into proper strength training in the gyms, some people were strength, strength training the same muscle group seven days a week and actually ended up getting weaker because there wasn't time for the muscle tissue to adapt. So they kept breaking it down, kept breaking it down, kept breaking it down, and, and eventually the muscle would just become weaker because it, it didn't have the time to repair. So. You know, and what you're doing is, you know, there's not many people in the world that will do it, <laughs> luckily, thank God. But the, the, the reality is, is that you, you know, for you personally, there is always this 10 marathon point. And, you know, we're on seven marathons today, we've got three marathons to go to get to that 10 point. I think probably it, it may be a bit, I think it might even happen a bit earlier because you are so much fitter this time than you were you know, when we started the last two projects. So I'm hoping that things might pick up even quicker than normal. So, but yeah, and we can see it, you, know, you can see it in the shape of your legs, you can see it in the shape of your torso, you know, and particularly in marathon runners, you can, they were endurance runners, you can see it in their face. 
you, know, you can tell when someone's getting towards their A race or when they're getting to the point where they're going to compete because literally they look drawn where they just basically burn off every kind of ounce of fat that they've got available. We had Steve Way on here, Claire, on um, Saturday, I think it was, who obviously you probably know, local legend in terms of coming third comrades. And he does it, when he was running at his peak, he would do this crazy carbohydrate starvation thing. So he would actually starve himself with carbohydrates for a few days before the event. And then three days before the event, would then start carbo loading. And the reason he did that so that he would know exactly how many carbohydrates he had in his system. Um, but I used to see him when he was actually in the carbohydrate starvation phase, and it literally, he just looked like a, you know, somebody who, yeah, had just come out of a concentration camp or something like that. There's literally nothing to it at all. So, but did that work? Yeah. Did that did that three-day thing work? Well, it worked. It worked for. Uh, it worked for. See, we should get. We're not sure to talk about this, but the, it worked for Steve. That was the way that he could, he could kind of make it work. Um, and I think there is good evidence to, to show that that can work because the key thing there is you're dropping weight as well. So of course, the lighter you are, the easier it is for you to run faster for longer, or you know, faster for shorter in his case. But yes. So, but it's. That's for the elites. I wouldn't recommend that for a kind of normal, average individual. It's uh, pretty insane. No, I'm not doing that. Eddie, where was your first marathon? Um, the first one I ran for was in central London to Windsor. It was just a road that ended up at Windsor by a park, by the park in Windsor. And, uh, <laughs> It was a test on the Friday before I was going to do what ended up 43 marathons on the Monday. So I ran my first one on Friday to see if it was possible. And then I started running them seriously on the Monday. And uh, that was in July, I think, 2009. And I just ran six days, took a day off, ran six days, took a day off. That's how I did it. How old were you then, Eddie? I was a million. Um, a million? Uh, of course so. Well, I'm 50 and I, I don't know, I don't know, I was born in 62, you've got to work it out, someone can work it out. 62, and then when did you do it? What year? 2009. Oh yeah, you were a million. Um, well, how old is it? Someone do the mathematics, I have no brain power. Eddie, hey, I'm just jumping in for a minute. Just, uh, you'll know better than me, but my angle from the side here, I just think you're going a little further I back know. on the treadmill. That's my trouble. That's what's going what's on. What's he doing? What are you doing? I'm getting dangerously close to the back. Hey, Tim. Yeah, Eddie's just heading a little uh, further back on the old treadmill. Um, Dave and, uh, Dave and uh, Ian, can we bring Sarah into the screen? So, yeah, can you work it out? So what, how old, about 62? 72, 2, 100, 2, uh, 2 plus, so that's uh, 47, 47 Okay, 47. How old were you when you did your first marathon, Dad? Um, maybe 30? No, oh, okay. Early 30? Yeah. It's funny, yeah, because Eddie and I, like, started, I didn't do my first one until I was 42. I kind of did load of other stuff, um, short distance stuff. So. I don't like the short distance stuff. It's too sh too much feeling sick for a short period of time. I'd rather, I mean, not. I, I don't think I could do what Eddie's doing on the treadmill. I do think that this is another level of pain being on there. I, I, it is totally different than running outside, especially if you like being outside. So I, well, I just take my hat off to you. I think it's incredible. Well, it's interesting. I, I wouldn't say it's pain. It's fatigue and and, mm. uh, and drudgery and grind I'm not nothing's actually going crying and, and I have no blisters and so I'm okay on that because my feet used to get blisters tons of blisters when I first ran and then I think the orthotics probably tell you can correct me orthotics yeah. helped on get rid of I remember we used to have one blister in South Africa that yeah were, bizarrely you were very interested in nursing and keeping like some sort of weird animal until I said, can we get rid of it? So we had a, I had a blister that was filled with fluid 
for about 20 marathons. And then I said, can we just, you know, put a pin in this and drain the fluid out? Do you remember that? Yeah, I do remember that. Good, good extra yeah. story to it. You've got to add stories to it. This is well, being yeah, the well, story. Yeah, well, I was laughing because it was that they ended up, the film crew ended up having blister watch. Do you remember? They think, can we do blister watch this morning? And you were like, no, not this morning. <laughs> well, it was. And, but, and everyone wanted to stick it in England. Everyone wanted to drain. I was like, no, 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 we're going to leave it because it keeps it healthy, keeps it sterile. Put a needle in it, and next thing we know is we'll get an infection. So, but we, but yeah. we did put a needle in it, and we didn't get an infection, yeah? Eventually, eventually. Well, yeah. that was about I, you, you beat me down. The crew and you beat me down. Well, it's just weird. Well, as soon as you finish the day, you have to walk around with this ball of, it's not pus, but it's fluid. It's, and you, you don't want to break it, so you've got to walk around funny. And then, oh. see, I think that leads well, to falling over and dying. That leads to death. <laughs> <laughs> so, Claire, I mean, Claire, you're a nurse. What's your take on blister management? Do you pop blisters or do you leave blisters? No, you're right. You're not supposed to, but I 100% would pop it if it was on my foot. <laughs> well, can you okay. imagine having one for 20 bloody days? No but... way. I wouldn't have been able to do it. I would have popped it while he wasn't looking and, and taken the, co you know, placed the consequences for sure. I, I That's so horrible. The word pop. We lanced it with a, with a heated uh, X-ray machine. Okay. No, with probably the needle, I can't remember. Yeah. But, uh, and the other thing, the other thing I failed on on that trip was the sunburn. Do you remember the sunburn? Bloody nightmare. Oh yeah, so, well, that was only particularly the first day I went out with socks on. No, without the socks on, and then we yeah. took, and I'd already put all the sun cream on. Then we took the socks off for some reason, and. Uh, it got burnt between the top of the shoes and the bottom, uh, top of the socks. So there was a tiny strip of sunburn around there. But there was certain days, I do remember in hogs back trying to just get, I was trying to get on the flat level and not do a, a crazy marathon up and down places. So yeah, that was the day I was, I mean, I was, Nils was helping, but I was, I was saying, just spray me, spray me, get this going. Do you remember that, Sarah? I remember that. When I remember like, that. The day of snakes. Yeah. Yes, the day of snakes. And yeah. they spray me, spray me, everybody. Spray okay, me. we're talking about yourself. So you need to explain I, I to the world the story. Explain it, Eddie. Do you want to do the story? No, you do it. Okay. Uh, well, so um, yes. Yeah, so where were we? We were hogs back, weren't we? Hogs back in South Africa. No, actually, I'll do it. You do it. Go on. You're, you're uh, better. No, because it gets me out of my head. Now, Hogsback is a beautiful area. Apparently, Tolkien, there's a rumor that Tolkien based uh, the entire Lord of the Rings on Hogsback, but he, he left when he was three from beautiful time. So, uh, but apparently as an aunt or something, um, uh, his nanny told him about Hogsback, which is a mountain range that looks like the back of a hog. And it's got very, it does have waterfalls. It does have sort of rainforesty interiors it does look like a whole slice of lord of the rings wrapped into one and we went there and I, what i can't work out is we had one we were there for two days weren't we because we had something where we were i remember walking through through creepers and stuff and seeing spiders and monkeys <laughs> but we weren't running and i remember doing that but thinking well what was that part of was that Anyway, we got up the next morning and run a very early marathon. Am I doing the same story? Yes, I am. So basically, yes, here's my story again. I had run four marathons in four days. Fifth marathon, I had to take a day off and go to, in Queenstown, go to the same hospital that I'd gone to four, four years before, have blood tests. Day six, I started my fifth marathon. I was allowed to start it, but only walking. Two thirds of it day six. Tim and Sarah and Tony extracted me from my run and uh, was kicking and screaming and took me to East London Hospital where I was tested for kidneys blowing up and found out I was just uh, under, f uh, f my fluids were down. They gave me three litres of fluids <coughs> and <coughs> I didn't pee 
all night, so that was quite interesting. So the next, was it the next morning? Maybe it's the next morning. I just thought I'd run, I'd, I'd run four and two thirds marathons in six days. And then the next day I did a marathon, so I'd run five and two thirds marathons in seven days. And it was just an odd and crappy number, five and two thirds, six and two thirds. So I thought, let's do another third separately, and then we can just be one marathon behind. And that was the thing. Hogsback, dawn. I remember starting off and people weren't ready. They said, come on, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. Set the watch. Off we went at first light. <coughs> it wasn't even sunrise, it was first light. And then I had to run. I needed to run on a flat marathon. <coughs> now this is the point. You could say, well, if you measure a marathon, it, it could be very mountainous. That's still a marathon. But all the biggest marathons in the world are flat. So I thought I'd prefer to do flat because it's a bloody nightmare. And also, you don't gain anything. It's just, you could have a, you know, a one in two marathon that's all uphill. That's still a marathon. But, uh, so I try to avoid doing ridiculous hills and stuff and just keep it on the roads, which tend to be flat. But in Hogsback, we got laid into, Nils had chosen a nice road, but route, but it was, it was curvy and twisty and not, it was on tracks. Well, we were going along a road and suddenly he had it down a track. <coughs> and I remember going up and over and I said, we can't do this, Nils. We've got to just find, if that road back there is the road, we've just got to go round and round it because I've got to get this done by lunch now. Because I had to do an extra third of a marathon in the afternoon. So that was the problem. And there were snakes. And the snake problem was, Nils said there were snakes and they will bite you, but they won't bite you, they'll bite the second guy in the, who comes by. And I thought, well, that's going to be me, isn't it? If someone's leading the way. And I questioned him a lot about the snakes. So what do I do? And he says, well, we got no anti-venom. And uh, <coughs> I think, but I didn't know if there was one snake taking out every other person or whether, well, you know, one snake bike, you know, t 10 snake bikes a day, 20 snake bikes a day, one a week, one a year. I had no idea what the numbers were. He knew and he was relaxed. I didn't know. And I didn't know what not to do with snakes. So he did say in the interview, he's very worried about the snakes. I don't know what's happened. He also said he was, that I was very positive and he said very nice thing. He's a nice guy, but he couldn't understand my snake problem because I just didn't know how fast they were coming. So that was the day of the snakes of getting sprayed when I was, uh, the sun was coming up and I just turned up at the van and said, spray me quickly, because I'm going to get burnt again. And I think that was the thing, wasn't it? Is it is because we needed to do it quick. Yeah. So that we then get on to Somerset East to then do the extra bit. And, and I think that, that, that was why it was so frantic, because you were like, spray me, spray me. You know, yeah. You've got to get, get, you've got to get going. It was also, you know, we've got to do it before the, the very, uh, this was the point we'd realised Nobody in South Africa at all does stuff in the heat of the day. The wild animals do not do anything in the heat of the day. Special forces don't do anything in the heat of the day. And the scouts don't do anything. They all take time off because they're intelligent. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a logical thing to do. In the very high sun, get under the shade, go indoors. That all makes sense. And I was running through that hot heat, so that was the day we also worked out, let's get it done early. Uh, or split it in two. That's just not running, it, you know, the 35 degree heat that were happening. So that's why we try to get it done early for, from then on. I know, because Sarah, you might remember better than me, did, did, Bond, did she measure 42 degrees at one point? 41 was top one. 41, yeah. Yeah, Vaughn had a uh, thermometer in the in the uh, van. He sort of carried it around and she put it out and measured it outside. And yeah, 41, wasn't it? But yes, Niels and the snakes, because from, from our point of view, it was me and Yvonne in the van. So we were waiting at, a, you know, essentially a checkpoint, not knowing the whole snake uh, hell that was going on. Um, yeah. <laughs> and yes, and then any you not knowing if it was one snake, a million snakes, twice a day, four every second, <coughs> quite how that works. So as far as we were concerned, we were just waiting, you know, checkpoint for you to 
come along and uh, you know we would uh, do our thing. And then we sort of heard you shouting in the distance, and I thought, oh, that doesn't sound good. And then I remember you sort of came over a hill and were just shouting, spray me. And I think Yvonne just said, what's happening? I said, I don't know, but let's just let's just get on with it because something's up. Um, so, I, yeah, we, we I think we, we were a bit like a Formula One pit crew. That's what like, we felt like with, uh, well, with Sunblock. The problem was at that point that I got up at dawn and I'd now run for two hours and I was going into all these ups and down roads and all this kind of stuff. And I was getting way behind schedule to get the bloody thing finished before the height of the sun. And I had to do a marathon and a third on that day. So that was, was going to be not 42K, but 56K that day. Or that's, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 80 to about eight miles on top of the 26, about 32 miles that day so I knew we just got to get it done and we got to not you know as I say we, you could do a one in two mountain you could run up Everest and if you measure it from the bottom of Everest to the top you can there's a marathon oh you've taken eight years to get up here what a slow time you have if, it, if everyone's going for the flat ones they just thought I'm not gonna make it ridiculous because I'm only human I'm a determined human and I am not superhuman and uh, so see, and I thought that that word had gone through. I wanted a, a you know, a, basically the main track, the main road. So we went back to the main road, and then it was okay. I just didn't want any side routes going through forests, and down waterfalls, and abseiling. It wasn't that extreme, but it was just, you know, the smaller the track, the more windy and hilly it is. And. Uh, I'm trying to remember, Eddie, was it that day where you walked the, Tim, you might remember this, that like a, it was like a maze, which is kind of like a mindfulness. And it's called a labyrinth. There you go, the you know this. Yeah. It's a labyrinth, and, a, and the labyrinth is always a kilometre long. There you run, right. we, we, did a, we did one kilometre of the path around the labyrinth. Yeah. Well, does anyone remember walking through in a very relaxed way and seeing monkeys and and seeing a waterfall, and it was called, it was called uh, Madonna's Falls or something. And anyone yeah, remember so it? Yes, it's the one pretty, it's the, I think Hogsback was the first marathon we did after we went to the hospital in East London, wasn't it? I'm, I don't think it was. That, I don't think it was. Up, that's how we ended up that third behind, no. because of East London. Uh, yeah, East London was the third behind, but the next one I don't think was Hogsback. I think that was two later. Oh, was it? Oh, okay. You could work okay. it out online, Sarah. You could yeah, I'll it. figure out. I'm trying to think because we didn't have any days off, but we were having to do some travelling, some go, like distance travelling. If you go to ediesot.com and hit the marathons and go to the South African ones, oh, yeah. have a look. The, the top one is a day by day list. And uh, yeah, and I remember the Madonna Falls because do you remember the guy with the drone? He crashed his drone into the waterfall, didn't he? Yeah, I think oh, so. God, I remember that. Yeah, he had to go retrieve it. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, so that's a place, Claire, that you could take your individual. So Hogsback is a place which is the most amazing place in the world, which I've never heard of before we went there. It was absolutely stunning place in this huge valley, uh, and we had this amazing combination, which was basically just looking over a, a valley of beautifulness. And as Eddie says, there, there's a there's a range of mountains on one side, and they have like it's almost like the nipples of, on the on a hog. So that's why they call it the whole back, but it, yeah, stunning place. I've never been to South Africa. I'd love to go, but I'm petrified of snakes. So now Eddie's making me even more nervous of, of snakes, but um, I'm going. But it's on the list. I'd love to go there. If you get well, petrified. Yeah, maybe, maybe you could do it. Maybe you could do the uh, comrades. There you go, 90K. 90K, which is whatever it is in Mars. 90 kilometers of rough. Oh. That's what we did on the last day after the 25 marathons. We well, did 90 kilometers on the last day. And it's the heat, Eddie. How do you do it in the heat? I couldn't, I, I would, Well, you get I used know. to the heat. You get used to the heat. I couldn't do it to start off with. I just really couldn't do it. But two weeks in, I do remember standing. I had a white hat on. And in the high heat, I, was, I had a thing down the back as well, down my neck, like a legionnaire. But, uh, I found I was running through, you know, mid-30s temperatures and not having 
Yeah, I'm not loving it, but I uh, found it quite reasonable. And I thought, well, something has changed because two weeks ago I just couldn't do it. But uh, as I say, all the wild animals and the human beings take the time off in the heat yeah. of the day. And he met dogs and English people. <laughs> All right, and then we did some. But yeah, comrades, 90k. There you go, 12 hours you got to run it. I did it cool. in 11 hours and 50 minutes. That was my thing. That is incredible. <laughs> if you did split, when you split marathons because of the heat, how on earth do you get yourself going again if you go again in the afternoon? That's well, you just, it's, it's just horrible to start, and then you push through, and then it gets going again. It's a bit like if you stop and go to the loo. Um, after a certain time, after a few hours of running, whenever you stop, even for five minutes, it's rotten to get going. Uh, mm -hmm. In the early ones in the UK, I would have blisters. I have to get going with blisters. And when you're moving with blisters, the pain is just generally all in all. As soon as you stop, it's like, oh. And, uh, but South Africa was something special because, I don't know, because we failed in 2012. I tried in 2012, I got rhabdomyolysis. Had to stop after four, and uh, and oh, Tim, you'll be pleased to know we did a pee test today. A pee okay. test, yes. My pee is fantastic. Is what Gary said, Doctor Gary. Um, we had this situation, Claire, that uh, that I was going to do double marathon on the last day, having run the 25 before, and. Uh, uh, the authorities, you know, involved in making the program, weren't sure that this was a good thing. And they wondered, am I being pushed into doing this? Wasn't that the case? I don't want to put anyone in it, but there was an idea that I was being, you know, put. Sarah, you, you said they were asking if Eddie was being, yeah? Say that again. The double marathon. Mm -hmm. People involved in putting the program together. Yeah. They were slightly worried that, is Eddie being pushed to do this? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and they said, well, no. Yeah, no, I think I laughed. You can't when that push was me suggested. to do anything. I won't, if I don't, don't want to do the washing up, I will not do the washing up. But if I want to run a double marathon, I will run a double marathon. That's, I don't tend to do. No, no you're, I just you are don't, very self propelled. Yes, I don't have much. No one pushes me into anything, really. So the idea you could be pushed into, cajoled into doing a double marathon, go on, just run forever. You know, it was a... Uh, you, you can just imagine, you can imagine the bureaucrats back in the UK going, well, have they done a proper risk assessment? Yeah. Have they done the safety? <laughs> well, there's, the, there's the, the safety of getting the thing on, and then there was what's inside my body. And there is a wonderful video, which is out on the uh, South African videos. Um, one of the special ones, which was after the Robin Island one. And Tim and me and Dr. Gary, the sports, my sports doctor, we sat talking about the, the, yes, the, uh, what's the word for it? The, the, is it? Is it good idea to do the double marathon? The possibility. The possibility and also will, will I succeed? Will I fail? And I really... Feasibility. Feasibility. I really didn't know. I really didn't know. But I wasn't going to run until I died. But Gary said, you know, do be careful with your heart palpitations. Don't obviously push it. And I wouldn't push on that. I always stop if anything feels a bit weird. But uh, um, I just really didn't know. And the speed I'm doing now, this speed that I'm finding so murderous, uh, with 15, only, only 15 minutes to go. Yeah, thank God for that. Uh, but this 7.5 kph that I did on and on and on for this distance, 42k, and one marathon, 26 miles, I then had to just continue on and do another bloody one. And that was so surreal to go through an imaginary finish line. You said, oh, there it was. I looked at my watch, that was a marathon. And I just kept running. And I, I had to count down from 90k, Claire. I just had uh -oh. to. I think I would have to do that. I couldn't do 26 and then and then start again. No. I think that would too 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 many mind games there. Exactly the psychological. I always count down. I once got caught um, not getting the mathematics right. I thought I'd almost finished the marathon. I found I had about 10k to go, and I said, well, you know, just doing naught and 10k is huge, and I, I I sort of lost it, and I realised I've got to monitor it, count it down. 
So it's actually it's less than 2k to, less than 2k for me to go. Less than 2k. So that's beautiful. I've done 40 kilometers, only 2k to go. And I've done seven, is it seven? Yeah, seven in seven days. Which is no not too shabby. Oh, you shabby. It's absolutely ins you're inspiring me, you really are. I'm not sure I could do the comrades, but um, it's inspiring. But you say you've done a couple, but and Tim was going, oh really? You've done more than a couple then, have you? Or is um, it really two? Uh, I've done um, London, New York, and Berlin, um, and then the Ironman, the marathon at the end of the Ironman. Well, you've, um, well, you've and, done you've done three then. Yeah. 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 No. So and uh, London, New York, and Berlin. Now I've never done an organised one. What, can you tell me which one you preferred? Were the, the, the likes and the best bits or the tougher bits? Of it? Either one of they all they're all pretty flat, I take it. Yeah, uh, New York isn't that flat, but I, I quite liked it. I and mean, the Americans really get you going and lots of cheering and, and whatnot. I loved London because it was, you know, UK. Um, but I hated it a bit, how you're feeling now, that I remember running. Um, Sort of along the embankment and saying to my friend, yeah, but how far is 5k? Like from my house to Tesco Express or from, you know, but how far is that? I couldn't get it in my head. Yeah. And, um, even when we kind of turned and were, I could see Buckingham Palace and finish was there, I still couldn't get my head around it. So at that point, I hated it. You know, I was ready to climb over the, even then when I'm that close, I was ready to just throw in the towel and said I was never doing one again and all the usual and then, um, I just wanted to try and, you know, I'm not a particularly fast runner, um, but I just wanted to, to then try again and do another, do it, have another go. Um, so I thought, well, I'll try and do the big five, which is now the big six. But you have to have qualified times for some of the others, and I'm not particularly quick, so I'm going to wait till I'm an older lady to um, to get those times, I think, and then then try again. Oh, which, which which are the big six? Which other are there? Um, which? Uh, so, and Chicago, and now they've added on Tokyo. So Boston, Chicago, New York, London, London. Tokyo. Berlin. Sorry, Berlin. And Ber Berlin. Oh great, yeah. I know Berlin pretty well. I've, having played there, and that my show Alice auf Deutsch. And when I was there, when we ran it there with, with Tim and Dr. Gary, I gave them a tour, of, the many slices of history. Well, the, well, some. The 1900 slices of history. Didn't I do that, Tim? You, you yeah, enjoyed? Yeah, no, yeah, I have to say it was a nice way. It's like it was doing a marathon tour. Yeah. Uh, amazing tour guide. And uh, I'd actually done, obviously, not the, the, I've done the Big Five as well, um, Claire. So I've, I've done all of them. And then before I finished the five, they then added Tokyo. So I'm in that same situation of having done the five majors, and now it's the six majors. And I did try to get into Tokyo two years ago and didn't get in. But when we ran around Berlin, because of when I went there with the kids and Kat, and we had a look, there, there were so many things that I missed. And then when, when I went there with Eddie, it was like, wow, this is amazing. In fact, showed me bullet holes in some of the walls and took me to the whole set where they did Valkyrie with Tom Cruise. Well, th well that one, in, in particular, that was, that was the uh, Valkyrie, the film Valkyrie, which is about the... Uh, attempt to take Hitler out um, to execute him for being a mass murdering fuckhead, I think is the official term, uh, uh, in 44. And von Stauffenberg was in charge of that. And, uh, and they, sh they, they unfortunately stopped that attempt, unfortunately, and, uh, but he was, he was killed. So it wasn't, it wasn't the set, it was actually the Bender block where they were actually uh, killed. So um, he was lined up there and three of his close colleagues were shot there. Probably an easier, better way than go than they get the SS on them. But uh, we actually shot that in Valkyrie where Tom Cruise as von Stauffenberg was shot. Um, that all happened right in the same place and we had to really, had to really push to get permission. Um, so that was a place and we saw the museum about the wall, didn't we? The Berlin Wall. Do you remember that place we went? Yeah, and, and we went up that amazing view, the yeah. viewing platform. Viewing platform there to look over the wall so you could get the sense of being in the east Berlin, looking through the west Berlin. And uh, and we went 
not sure if I showed you the Jewish uh, monument, which is which is uh, concrete blocks. It's, it's, it's huge blocks. Yes, yeah, the, kind of, I've got some video footage of us running through that. Oh, right, so we did go there. And yeah. then uh, other places, there's anything I could think of, I showed you. Uh, you went to Hitler's bunker. Well, yeah, Hitler. Where, where is God? Where is yeah, it's just a car park, which is good. You don't want any Nazi memorial kind of thing. But, uh. I wonder it, where it is. You started off by running up to the Hitler Youth building. Oh, I showed you that. Uh, yeah, so it's now the um, Soho House, and it was an apartment, uh, the department store for, owned by a Jewish gentleman who was obviously the, the Nazis uh, stole his his uh, company and his building and um, he was exiled I think he got out I think he got out of Germany and then it became the Hitler youth headquarters then it became head it was in East Germany so it became head in East Berlin head of the uh, something to do with the East German uh, you know organization and then and now it's Soho house one of their, their Berlin branch so so yes. Yeah, all of these bits of Berlin keep changing over. Kind of amazing. But a wonderful spirit there. And Berlin was never a Nazi city. It never was. They never wanted to be with, with uh, Hitler, the evil criminal. Um, but they yeah. were forced to, and they were forced to go with it. So if you go to Berlin, do go to Berlin. It is wonderful. I feel it's like what maybe London was in the 70s or 80s. So it just has quite a cool feel about it. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think it's it's such a lovely place to run as well. So it's really beautiful around yeah. some of the suburb. Well, really enjoyed it. Well, not all of it, some of it. How fast did you do Berlin? Four oh one. Oh. Oh wow. Do you know? I? And what um and um, what's your fastest? Three fifty six. Wow. So hang on. So what's a, a, a lady of your young age? What do you have to do faster than it? Um. I think it's three, three thirty something, three forty. It's, it's fast. That's that. My, my three fifty six was my all out, absolutely got nothing else left. Done. I'm not, you know that was me in in good good nick. Um, I just I like to run now just and enjoy and enjoy the scenery and, and I I did enjoy New York, but you know. I think when I did, even when I did the Ironman, I enjoyed the run at the end because I, I felt like, well, I don't, I, there's no pressure in this in this marathon because I've already done a bike and swim, so it's okay. So I can just do what I want to do, and I enjoyed it. And I, if I wanted to walk, I walked, and if I wanted to eat, I did. But yeah. yeah. And it's funny what you say about it, because most major marathons they do try and keep them flat so that you can get record-breaking times, you know, and that's, that attracts a lot of the big names. But New York is funny because people think it's flat, but because it goes across the seven bridges, there is a significant amount of up and down on it. But the piece of advice that I was given by a seasoned marathon runner when I did New York was when you go across the, uh, not Sacramento, what's the first bridge you go across? Yeah, I uh, can't remember it's... Daniel's in Michigan, that's not the right name for it, but it'll come to me in a minute. But it's a double layered bridge and a piece of advice was run on the top, don't run on the bottom because a load of people stop on the bridge and go for a week. And of course that all then drips down to the lower level. So I took that advice and ran over the top level rather than the bottom level. So. You, you told me that when I did that, you told me to do that. Oh, yeah. You also told me not to take all my jumpers off when they told me to, because they tell you at the beginning that you your clothes won't be donated to charity if you take them all off at the start, because it's so cold waiting. And I didn't, you know, I, I, lots of people would feel I would have done if you hadn't said. But there is another dropping point after that bridge that you can take up, and it does go to charity. So I didn't, but, but it was freezing blowing through the bridge when you went over it. So, um, yeah, it was good advice. Okay. I've just remembered it's Staten Island Bridge, and that's the name of the bridge that we go. Yeah, right. we, actually, we stayed in Staten Island in, a, in an old lawyer's house, which was like a bed and breakfast place, which was pretty stunning. But it was funny, they, Eddie, they leave all the clothes, they, they encourage you to leave all the clothes at the beginning so that you can, um, they can get picked up and taken for charity. And I went back the day after the marathon just to have a look and see you know, what it was like. 
and as you said, Claire, there was like thousands of pieces of clothing just left on the ground. And when I went back the following day, they had cleared it all up and taken off the charities. And there was only one thing there, which was this tangerine puffer jacket that was obviously so undesirable that they didn't even feel they could take it to the charity shops. <laughs> That's brilliant. Now, I, I see, uh, I worked in New York quite a lot. I thought there was only a Staten Island ferry. Are you sure it's a Staten Island bridge? Yeah, it's definitely the Staten Island bridge. Oh, yeah. right. So it joins Staten Island to the main, the main land. I just uh, I knew it was an S. I just couldn't remember what it was. But yeah, it's a huge bridge, huge spanning bridge. So oh, okay. and double pay, double lay. Oh. Yeah. Because uh, uh, Staten Island wasn't Staten Island a rubbish dump? I think initially. I think. I think the uh, New York, main New York nightlights who are kind of used to use Staten Island as a rubbish dump in the early days and then it kind of eventually got filled in and then has now since been covered over and, and housed. But I'm pretty certain I read somewhere that Staten Island was actually the rubbish dump. But there you go, useless facts, useless tin facts that our marathons were quite often full of. Full of lots of chit chat. Yes. You must have had some long heart to hearts over the years on, on these days, you know, months of running together. I don't know, I think it was probably more lunacy than heart to hearts, I think. But, but lots of theories, Eddie has lots of theories. In fact, he's, he hasn't shared his theories. He has theories on, on the Earth, the universe, space, you know, the shape of things, and how things were formed. So, yeah, we, it just, it's, a, it's a free form conversation that flows all the time. So. Yeah. All right. I'm just, I'm just looking up Staten Island Bridge. Um, well, I've got three and a half minutes to go. Oh, so by, by the way, Eddie, just to jump in, just for a moment, I was just looking at those videos. Uh, day uh, day seven, we got to Hogs Back, and, and there was also a day eight, so we must have, I think that's right. I remember we split it between two yeah. days. Maybe we travelled on day seven. Might have done that. But yeah, you definitely no, I know the, the more leisurely day was I know what seven. we did. I know what we did. We split seven. And we did the morning somewhere and the afternoon part in 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 uh oh, yes, yes, that would we be We did it. a split marathon and then I thought I'll do yeah. a very early marathon. Yes, that would make sense. Yeah. So you're right, there was a which I can't remember. Definitely a travel thing I can't remember about why. So we left East London and we had to head towards wherever the next one was going to be, but it obviously started late, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but we, uh, I remember just sort of what, going through trails on uh, without much pressure. I didn't feel I was, I was running, I was loping, I, did, I didn't feel any pressure, so I don't, mm, yeah. Not sure I have to watch it tonight or at some point. <sighs> Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Forty-one point eight nine. Yeah, so where where are we running tomorrow, Eddie? Tomorrow? Yes, please send in uh, Sofia, Bulgaria. Sofia, if you've got photos of Sofia, uh, selfies, videos, put the name Sofia on the thing, put it online, and we will and put the hashtag make humanity great again and we'll get it up. And we've had this wonderful photographs, including one of you, I think, Tim. Tim's looking up there. Is there a selfie you took up there on the path, Tim? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yes. That's, that's uh, I've been sending in the ones that I took. I can't tell. I've sent in the ones for Sophia tomorrow as well. Oh, great. The, uh, yeah. So they'll be that coming up. So anyone who's got pictures of photos, videos, selfies of Sophia, put, put them online. Add the hashtag make you to great again and say that it is the city of Sofia so we'll know. And we'll put them up streaming behind me. So I do my eighth marathon. Everyone who's been running with me on Swift, there's 25 Swifters nearby. Thank you for coming along again, keeping me company. Uh, my thing blew up a little bit earlier, but it's been okay since then. And uh, 52 seconds to go. It's just like on those TV programs, isn't it? Thank you to everyone up in the gantry in the roof. Thank you to, to Jesus, because I think he was a real guy. Not the magical one, but Yeshua, that guy. I think he was very good. And Mohammed, thank you to both of them. Real decent people who did decent things in real life, then afterwards pretended to something else. And thank you, Tim. 
And Claire, are you still with us? Tim and Claire, have you gone away? Yeah, we're still yeah. there. Oh, we're still there. Still there. Look, there's Great. someone's feet are screaming behind me. Uh, and uh, yeah, we've been talking to everyone today. So thanks to everyone who's just playing. Yeah, Eddieism.com for donations. Eight more seconds to go. And uh, you can make donations from anywhere in the world at Eddieism.com. And you can buy tickets for my show tonight. It's going to be in 20, 35 minutes at 7 p.m. UK time, London time. All right, Nothing guys. Nothing like giving yourself a rest, is there? Yeah. Nothing like what? Giving yourself a rest. No, nothing like having 35 minutes. Oh, you get <laughs> Okay, we're done. All right, thank you. Thanks, guys. Don't forget these. Thank you. Thank you.